It's the Mixed Martial Arts Hour with... Mixed Martial Arts Hour is back in your life on this Wednesday, April 27, 2022. Hello again, everyone. I hope you're doing well on this beautiful Wednesday afternoon here in New York City. There is a buzz in the air in New York City. When a big fight comes to New York City, there's a buzz in the air. And yes, I know it's not an MMA fight, but if you can't appreciate what is going on in New York City this week, my friends, I don't know if you can appreciate combat sports, period, because this is actually very reminiscent of Liz Carmouche versus Ronda Rousey back in 2013. When history is being made, it feels that much bigger. Obviously, right? Doesn't need to be said, but maybe for some of the... uh, you know, the MMA people, it needs to be said what is happening on Saturday at Madison Square Garden a mere blocks from where we are sitting right now is a very big deal, not only for boxing, but for combat sports, because not only is it the first time in the 143 year history of Madison Square Garden, the world's most famous arena, the Mecca, the home of your New York Knicks. First time that two women headline a boxing event, by the way, no women have ever headlined an MMA event as well. And I know it hasn't been around as long, but it's one versus two. And that's incredibly rare in combat sports. It's incredibly rare in MMA. The last time it happened, in my opinion, was when John Jones and Daniel Cormier fought one versus two in their rematch back in 2014. It's incredibly rare in boxing. Last time it happened was 2008. Marquez Pacquiao too. It's incredibly rare. And on Saturday it's happening. So forget, if you don't want to care about the, the gender thing, care about, the competition aspect of it. It's one versus two. I am pumped. We're going to talk about that. We're going to be talking about the big MMA weekend coming up as well. You got Cheeto Vera versus Rob Font. 135 pounds in combat sport is the best weight right now. And it's on fire. Every weekend, there's a big 135 pound fight in either MMA or boxing. It's fantastic. Vera versus Font is another one of those. Not to mention what we saw last weekend, Bellator, in Hawaii, what we saw in the UFC as well. So we've got a lot to discuss. We got on the nose. We'll get the picks from GC for this weekend. Perhaps my underdog pick of the week on the nose in the last hour. GC will be right before that. I have an underdog pick. I shall share it with all of you. And at around 3.30, we'll also be joined by Yancey Medeiros, who had that big win in Bellator, and it was announced today that he has signed a multi-fight deal with Bellator. This guy bet on himself. He was on the outs. He was released from the UFC. He signed a one-year deal with Bellator, excuse me, a one-fight deal with Bellator just to fight on this Hawaii card last weekend. Has a fantastic performance, a fantastic win over Emmanuel Sanchez, and now they ink him to a multi-fight deal. Very smart move, I think, by Bellator. They had a great weekend. You got Stotts doing his thing, Sabatello doing his thing, Cyborg with a big win. They had a big weekend. So we'll talk to him at around 2.45. We're going to talk to a very, very impressive young man, and I stress the word young, 33, maybe 34, definitely under 35, EVP, Executive Vice President of DAZN, Joe Markowski. It's a big week for DAZN, obviously with Taylor Serrano. It's a big upcoming week for them, obviously with the Bivol Canelo fight. I want to talk to him about the state of OTTs, the state of streaming services, the state of DAZN, and also, by the way, what happened to DAZN in the world of MMA? Remember, they had the big deal with Bellator. They had the deal with KSW and other promotions. They don't show any MMA now. What's up with that? Are they back in the MMA business? Will they go back into the MMA business? Are they just in the boxing business? A lot of interesting sort of businessy type things to talk about with Joe Markowski, who will be in studio. So stay tuned for that, 2.45, 2 o'clock. Arguably the best promoter in combat sports today. Arguably the best promoter in boxing, Eddie Hearn. Edward Hearn, head man over at Matchroom Boxing, will stop by. Massive week for him, of course, with Taylor Serrano. Massive upcoming week with the Canelo fight as well. They're on fire. He's all over the place. Back in studio. The first time he stopped by a couple of months ago, you loved it. He's back in studio at 2 o'clock. 1.30, Arjun Buller, the one championship, heavyweight champion of the world, will stop by. He's got some news to share. And one championship, breaking some massive news this morning as well. They have signed a five-year deal with Amazon Prime in Canada and in the United States. 12 events in prime time here in the United States. Massive, massive news for one championship. So the business of combat sports is booming, my friends, and I'm so excited to be here to talk about it all with all of you. As always, we are brought to you by our good friends over at DraftKings. DraftKings Sportsbook is the official sports betting partner of the MMA Hour and the UFC. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook 
app today. Use code DMAR for a special offer when you sign up. That's code DMAR only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Please support them because they support us. You know I have a soft spot for the Canadians, and that's where we are starting this week's show. Last Wednesday's show, two weeks ago before the break, we had Michael Malott on, and I said it feels like slowly but surely Canadian MMA is on the come up. Had a couple of years there where it felt a little dry, stagnant, stuck in neutral. But all of a sudden, it seems like almost every week there's a Canadian prospect coming up, doing big things in some promotion in MMA. We had Michael Mallott a couple of weeks ago. We had Marc-André Barillon. We had Charles Air Jourdain this past weekend with two fantastic submissions. I've never had Charles on the program. Of course, a fellow Quebecois. And I thought, you know what? Two in a row. Great guillotine win over Lando Venata. It's time we have Charles Air Jordan on the program. So let's kick things off today with the aforementioned Charles Jordan, who joins us via the magic of Scoop. Charles, ça va, mon ami? Comment ça va? Ça va très bien. <laughs> Thank you for having me, man. It took it took a while, but uh, yeah, now it's my first two win in a row, and it was a very good win against Banata. So thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Oh, c'est avec uh, grand plaisir, as they say, and yes. <laughs> Uh, we, we were talking and I was a little slow, uh, you know, it was a little complicated time in my life, but here I am and very happy to have you and thank you for coming on and congratulations on the win. We have a lot to talk to you about, but could I ask you first two fight winning streak in the UFC and you've been in the UFC for several years. What's been the difference now? Why are you looking so good as of late? Uh, just, uh, g getting finished by Erosa, like, uh, like uh, Erosa stepped in last minute. I was supposed to fight Lerone Murphy, which is, a uh, a uh, very different guy than Erosa. And then Erosa steps in and uh, finishing me. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, it, it just changed something in my head. Like, uh, like uh, being finished is something I never experienced. Like, I got out-wrestled all of my losses, if you like. So, uh, no, that was uh, something that hit me very hard uh, in the heart and mind. And then I just doubled up my, my, my uh, work ethic. Everything just, just starting to feel more... Uh, better at the gym, better everything. Like I was just pushing myself to limits I'd never been into. So this defeat really lit a fire under my ass. You know, like if you want to be in the UFC, you cannot get finished like that uh, by 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 people. You know, so yeah, it lit a fire under my ass getting finished by Rosa. You were embarrassed. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But what 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 I liked though about Erosa, which I, I think it, a lot of people sleep on him is uh, he's a very good finisher. He's a very tall guy for 145 and he's a guy who has tons of experience. I think he has like 36 pro fights. So this is something to take into consideration. So uh, adds off to him. And, uh, but yeah, I was, uh, I felt humiliated, but hey, it, it made uh, me a better athlete, better man. And uh, here I am today. For sure. And and did you change things? Like, other than obviously working harder, pushing yourself more, did you do any other drastic changes or that was it? And I'm not saying that was it by diminishing it, but just, you know, sometimes people make massive drastic changes. They change the people around them when they feel this way. Did you do that as well? It was mostly are we, are we sparred? Like, let's say we, we would do sparring. It would be, uh, okay, three rounds of five with three different guys, but it's not mimicking properly like a fight. The guy will get tired eventually or... If like, like I say, for, for the first round, I've been chopping the guy's leg and then I get a new guy, this guy's leg is working perfectly fine. So the damage that I introduced during that sparring is not uh, uh, accumulating enough. So yeah, we changed that to, towards sparring, uh, towards uh, uh, wrestling. I got David Zimmerman, former Olympian, teaching me. He's actually the one who helped George uh, get his wrestling uh, ability in the UFC. So George was a very good friend of my coach, Fabio. Met him. He actually was there with me for my uh, previous fight against uh, Andre Ewell. And uh, no, man, this guy has been changing my game a whole lot. So now I've been implementing a lot of wrestling. It's so intense, so good. Of course, my wrestling will never get to the point of these UFC guys, that are mostly American, who've been wrestling for like five-year-olds to, to, to 20 uh, or something. But I'm, I'm getting a, bit, a lot more understanding of these wrestling exchange. And that's what gave me the victory against Vanata. Just the knowledge of it. And uh, yeah, it helped me a lot. I'm always so interested, especially people from Montreal, like how you got into MMA, what made you fall in love <laughs> with the sport and, and gave you the idea to do this. How did you fall in love with the sport? So basically, I, I, I was just curious about it. Like uh, any, most of the young men I know, like they're just curious and they want to go into a gym. My, brother, my, my father brought me to a gym with me and my younger brother. 
And then uh, the guy was like, oh, you guys are pretty good. You guys want to do a fight? It was like after six months of training. So we went to a, a, a place called Pro Star uh, on the south shore of Montreal. And uh, we had a fight. And Brendan Tatch was there. I don't know if you remember yeah, Brendan Tatch. Very big guy, the big Mohawk, red hair. And uh, he came to me after I won. I won by triangle choke in the third round. And like, oh, you kids are good. Uh, keep it up. You might end up in the UFC. And just, it just, phew started like that and i was like wow and ever since i started like it was just for fun and still to this day i'm having a blast and uh the, i remember the first time i was in thailand i i fought a thai guy and i knocked him out and they they pay me 40 bucks for the fight and i was like you're kidding me i can get paid plus yeah. doing something because I, I was fighting as an amateur and amateur you don't make one cent so i got paid 40 bucks and that just that was the second spark that said, okay, I want to do that until, uh, until I can't no more. So yeah, that's, that's where it all started. And, and when you saw Brandon, what year is this? Oh my God. Uh, it was my, my first time at fight would, would be 2015, I think. Okay. So no, not too long ago. No, not that much. I'm, I'm not a big veteran, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been around, I have good experience and everything, but no, it's not that long ago, probably 2014, maybe maximum, but yeah, around those years. So those early days when the UFC would come to the Bell Center, did you ever go to any of those fights? No. I never did. GSP, never got Diaz, Condit, Koscheck, mm -hmm. none of that. No. I didn't have any money. All my money was put on the training because I was paying my gym membership and I had a little job at the Pita Saha place and I was cleaning the stuff. And every money I have, I would put it on shin pads, gear, stuff like that. And uh, no, I never got... Because when I was introduced, it's, oh, the first event I saw live that my, brought, my, my father brought me was uh, BJ Penn against uh, Nick Diaz. It was supposed to be George, but George blew up his ACL. I think it was UFC 137. Yeah. So, yeah. And after that, I just fell in love. And then it was UFC 142. I remember it. It was in my heart. It was uh, 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 Josie Aldo against uh, Chad Mendez. Yeah, the second one who got him with a knee run to the crowd, this and that. And the uh, I remember Josie Aldo entering on the Run This Town, the song from Rihanna and Jay-Z, and I, I had chills. I was shaking, and I was like, okay, one day I want to live that. So, yeah, that was a crazy moment for me. So I've been a big fan of UFC, like watching all the events from probably 137 to 200. Then after that, it became like more of a job, more and everything. So when I had my weekends, I wanted to step away from the sport, so I started listening less and less. I'm still listening to, to great events, but I'm not a – as crazy fan as I was from 137 to 200, that's where I started to slow down. That's interesting. So, the, the, so you're not going to watch every single one because you need a bit of a mental break on the weekend. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to spend time with my girl and like I've been to the gym all week. So yeah, in the weekend I like to, to stay, but there's a lot of fights that I want to watch. Of course, I would actually rewatch them like Sunday morning on the fight pass or uh, other platforms. And uh, yeah, so I'm not, I'm, not li I'm not staying up until midnight to watch right, every right. single part. Of I don't blame you. <laughs> Did, do you ever cross paths with George when you were coming up? Uh, never. I, really? And one, no, never. I, I saw him at the gym once. Uh, I was going to try start to practice Muay Thai with uh, one of my coaches. And uh, I was never like attracted to try start or whatever, but this coach was very good. His name was Phil, Muay Thai coach. And uh, I was taking a bus and a metro it would take me like an hour and 45 minutes to get to TriStar, pay the coach, pay the transportation, then come back. And it was very good. And one day I remember I was putting my hand wrap and I felt like a big aura behind me. And I was like, what is that? And then I turned around and it was George. And he was like, Hey, and then he got into the octagon. And I it was one of the few times I saw George and he entered the octagon and I was just mind blown by the, the athlete. He was his, his energy, his aura. Like he, he, like he's something else, man. It was a very great experience to, 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 to see him like that, but I never got any conversation or exchange with the man. And, uh, the reason behind that is if you, if you guys listen to George's interview, like he loved, he loved fighting, he loved all of it, but now he's somewhere else in his life. I think he said he never want to corner someone else again in the UFC after he, he cornered Nasrat or something like that. Maybe I'm wrong on the exact word that he said, but uh, I feel that, he is detaching himself from, uh, you know, he's not a coach. He, lo he loves teaching his class, but he's not someone who, who wants the burden of, of you becoming the next big thing or this and that. Like uh, people try to push that, that this, this thing on Olivier, Olivier Aubin Mercier, that, uh, oh, George is your mentor. George is your this. George is, he was mostly his training partner and they were helping each other. 
But I don't think George wants to be the mentor of anybody. And I respect that truly. Like I wouldn't send him a message. Hey, I'm the, I'm from Montreal as well. Please teach me. No, 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 I, I won't do that. I respect the fact that he did everything he did for the sport. And now he wants to, to step away and I'm, I'm not going to make it about myself. He's, he's the goal. He inspired so many of us and uh, he needs, he, he needs his time. I like that. I respect that very much. By the way, when you went to TriStar, did you stop at the julep on the way home? Did you go? The what? The orange julep, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you didn't go to no, it? I didn't. Come on. No, You've didn't. never been to the julep? Uh, yeah, but I, I I remember going there. I was too broke. I was paying transportation, this this and that, playing, paying the coach. So, yeah, I was too broke. But, yeah, of course, I already... It's, You've been, uh, right? It's fantastic. Of course. I love it. Of course. Every time I go back home... I have to go to the julep to get the poutine, get the drink. <laughs> George is the only person I know that gets the spaghetti with meatballs. I've never met anyone on this planet that gets spaghetti with meatballs from the julep. But, you know, I respect George for his opinions and 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 whatnot. Uh, and obviously you came up through TKO and uh, you had yes. a great run there. Could I ask you, yeah. I, I was talking a little bit about this with Olivier as well, and he actually opened my eyes. He was on the show a couple of weeks ago. The Quebec MMA scene used to be so hot and developed such great fighters. What the hell has happened to the Quebec MMA scene? Why does it seem like there's nothing going on right now? I would, I would it would be weird, but uh, it's going to be weird. But I would blame boxing because boxing has been uh, like back then when there was only newspaper, they would put all these great champions, all these great guys doing great things. And now with social media and phones, you can see that the guys they were fighting weren't that great. But when you see it on the newspaper, it feels great. Oh, oh this uh, Mexican guy is na 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 super dangerous. But now you can just with your phone go on YouTube, watch the guy fight, and you're like, man, like they were building paper champ a lot in in Quebec. And now the more and more with social media, we can see that people lost interest into the fighting scene because the lack of of proper fights. And Quebec is a small scene as well. Guy from Quebec don't want to fight each other. The reason I got to do the UFC as two years as a pro is because I fought all the guys from here, all the top guys. And I, I was like, people were like, oh, no, but he's Quebecois. I don't want to fight him. I'm like, what, what's this mentality? Right. With like, this is it's stupid to me. Like me, if there's another Canadian that wants to join the UFC, I'm going to fight him because we're fighting to be the, the top guys of Canada. It's not, oh, he's Canadian. I don't want to fight him. He's my friend. I already trained with him. I don't care. I could train with you last week and then next week we're going to fight. I really don't mind that because we're all competing to be in the UFC. So what I meant by boxing scene is boxing is bringing all those people from all around the world with like zero and three, zero and four to make your guy look great. But this is completely stupid. People lost interest into going out and actually seeing the fight because you're going out to see a perf uh, athletic performance more than a fight. A fight, there's resistance to it and there was no resistance into those shows. And then when TKO was brought back, Stefan Patry was amazing because he didn't want none of that shit. He was making guys fight each other. Like, I don't care if you already turned with him. I don't care if you're a SRAM. This is the fight. If you want to pull, go up the rankings, you need to fight this guy. So Stefan has this approach like uh, it was an all-out war in Quebec. And that brought animosity. And all the TKO shows were full of people. That was good because there was a lot of maybe he's going to lose, maybe he's going to win. And there was no, like, he was not a promoter that would get a Mexican who's zero and 17 uh, to, to fight the, the local guy. There was no stupidity like that. It was, it was the lion's den. And the only one that came out of this den was me, Cyril Gann, and Marc-André Barrio when we got to the UFC. But a lot of very great fighters didn't make it. But that's, that's the way it is, man. Like, the, that was a lion's den, and TKO was a very good promotion. But if you're, if you're a young guy in Quebec now, like, where do you fight? There is no TKO, right? Yes. No. So they need to go to uh, Niagara Falls, uh, BTC in uh, Vancouver. Like they, they need to move around. It's quite unfortunate. Like my little brother was close as well. Uh, Louis was, was getting uh, good fights, was getting better. And now he needed to wait the pandemic, this and that. He needed to fight in Abu Dhabi. And uh, so, yeah, you, you need to have plug right now. Quebec scene is, is very dead right now. It's And now... There's other promotions that are rising left and right, but they're going to get like boxing. They're going to go get this guy from this country who has nothing to do in this. Like one thing I don't understand is how can you pay your fighters so much, like uh, so less money, but you can pay a $2,000 tickets to this guy for him to come just to get beat up. Th right. This is super stupid to me. Like pay more your guys and make animosity, like make the guy from, uh, 
South Shore, Oregon, the guys from East Montreal, like this, that, that's where the animosity sure, was sure. built. Oh, they don't want to do it. They all train together or they all say, no, I train at Tri Stars one time a week. So he's my friend. I don't want to fight him. You hear that. I'm, I'm, I'm like, you guys are never going to make it to the big league. Yeah, like you're not willing to put sacrifice. I don't care if he's your friend. He's like, okay, you've been training with the guys for 10 years. I understand that would be, that would be dumb. But a guy you see at the gym sometime and you roll with in jujitsu, doesn't matter, dude. He wants to be where you want to be. So you, it's a competition. But hey, that's my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong. But uh, yeah, that's how I feel about it. It's funny. While we're talking, I just actually got a, uh, a press release from a new promotion in Bolsald called uh, Fight Night in Bolsald. So maybe it's starting to come up. I hope for everyone involved yeah. that there are more opportunities. Uh, you wanted to actually be a, a policeman before you got into MMA, right? Do you still want to do that oh, when no. you're done? No, no, no. That was a long time ago. That was a very long time ago. I did, uh, I did the, 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 the tests and I was accepted and everything. But uh, then after that, I, I had money compiled from, from working around. And uh, my coach told me, you want to go to Thailand? I was like, okay, go. And I, as soon as I got that spark of you give me 40 bucks, which is nothing to yeah. fight. But for me, it was just a gesture of, of doing the thing I love the most as a young man. Plus, I'm getting paid. That was just life-changing for me. So, yeah, I don't have uh, no plans about police stuff now. <laughs> the nickname is great because of your last name, Air Jordan, Air Jordan. <laughs> Who gave you that? Uh, I, I won my debut by, by flying knee, and I, I jumped and knocked the guy out uh, pretty badly. And uh, one guy said, oh, it's Air Jordan. I was like, okay, we'll follow with it. I know it's a ripoff, and I cannot make sure about it because... Nike's going to get on my ass, but yeah, yeah. it's my full name. And, uh, you know, it's like, I, I prefer a name that the crowd give you than the, the guy who like uh, the, the, the black pirate of the Red Sea or like right. guys who come up with their own nickname. I'm like, nah, I prefer the crowd. They give you something and you're like, okay, I'll roll with it. <laughs> what is up with the pirate stuff though? Because even like with me texting you, you always put the pirate emoji. What is up with that? <laughs> Uh, is because um, I the more I get experience as a fighter and after the loss and after the wins, I, I realize that I'm not attached to anything. I'm, I'm more of someone who takes his boat and live his life the way he wants to live it. I'm not again, never getting to other biz, people's business. I'm never like uh, putting my nose everywhere. I just take my boat, go to a place, fight a guy, get the gold and then come back. So that's why the old uh, piraterie thing came about this ah. is something I and I'm more uh, free minded with this uh, mindset yeah I, I feel very good now that I think like that I'm not into anybody's business drama this and that I take my boat I do my thing people are like oh are you Quebecois or are you Canadian I'm like I'm both man like just stop trying yeah. to divide us say stupidity like that and uh, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, getting into drama I don't like drama <laughs> uh, this this neck tattoo that you have is that an old man's face what is going on over there well, who is that yeah so basically it's odin and odin uh the the point of it is odin sacrifices his eye for uh for wisdom and i feel like us as fighters we're sacrificing our health uh and it's something that we're not going to do forever so if you're not uh placing your 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 check your checkers right uh, your after career can be very, very bad. So uh, I need to accumulate wisdom fast, but I'm sacrificing my health and I'm, I'm sacrificing time with a lot of people that I like. But yeah, it's just about, you know, sacrificing important things for the love of uh, my life, which is MMA right now. So yeah, sacrifice and uh, yeah, that, that's it, sacrifice. How many tattoos do you have? Uh, many, many. Do I regret some? No, I don't regret, but they're like scars to me. Like, I'm like, why did I thought about doing that? Like, I got a Thai tattoo that says uh, young man uh, ready to fight for his dream. Something so cheesy on my, on my abs. And I'm like, wow, man, why, why did I do that? But I was like 18 in Thailand. So yeah, they're more, my tattoos are, are less representative now they, because they meant something to me when I did them. But because of the fact that I'm always advancing as a human and advancing as an athlete, uh, they mean less and less because I'm to the next chapter or to the other island already. So I don't regret them, but I'm like, 
at one point they meant something to me and now they don't they're just decoration so after the win on saturday over venata very impressive victory you called out edson barbosa which made some headlines like the call out but actually i thought maybe you would call out Ilya Teporia because you guys were supposed to fight in January. You take the fight on short notice. You show up. You make weight. They didn't let you go on the scale, but you know, yes. you take your word for it. Uh, he could not make weight. He didn't show up to the yes. scale. How frustrating uh -huh. was that for you? I think you took it on nine days notice, right, against this undefeated prospect, and uh, yes. you made the weight and he didn't. Yeah, I, uh, so what happened is uh, I woke up and everybody, my phone was blowing up and everybody was telling me, oh, he passed out, and then I called my manager and he was like, okay, we don't know yet. I, like, it's only the UFC guys that told him uh, you're not going to make it. But the 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 the, the officials of uh, the, 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 sorry, the, the, Commission. what's it called? Commission, thank you very much. Uh, they said, uh, all, it, they haven't seen you, Leo, yet. So he was like, okay, start cutting your weight. So I got down to 146. I mean, I was so stressed because me, it's like, yes or no, just tell me like, yeah, yeah. yes, you're fighting, not fighting. I was like, you know what? I came here. I'm a professional. I'll do the weight. I got down to 146. And then uh, my manager told me, no, he passed out. He was shaking, convulsing. So the fight is off. After that, I was not that frustrated because it's something that's out of my control. And I understand that he has health issues and that was, you know, unfortunate. And uh, I cannot change anything, but I was compensated very well by the UFC. And I, you know, we, we went to California, did our thing, did the way he did, hasn't presented himself. The reason why I would prefer fighting at San Barbosa is I, I know that Ilio went to 155 and I know he had a thing with Paddy the Batty. And, you know, I, I don't have the leverage to call you out right now. And just like I don't have much leverage to call out Edson Barbosa as well, but uh, I think it would make more sense because I'm a striker. The, the reason why I finished Lendo with the guillotine is because I dropped him. People think uh, it was a takedown or whatever. No, I dropped him. Then I went for the finish. But uh, yeah, Edson with, and, and me would make a, a tremendous fight. There's Shane Burgos as well. Like I want those dangerous guys who hit hard and uh, uh, want, wants to go to war. That's why I was so uh, anxious about that fight with Lendo Vanada. I expected to go very differently than it did. But you know, I have I have great jujitsu ability, and I I proved that. So yeah, so that that was the point why I would prefer Shane Burgos, Setsun Barbosa over like Ilya. I think Ilya is going to do his thing. Probably stay at one fifty five to call out Paddy the Batty and everything. So yeah, I respect that he's on a mission, and uh, yeah, just like I was calling for Cub Swanson to a certain degree, and now he wants to fight to Ryan Faber. It's like like who am I to call these two? Uh, 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 in Cubs, sorry, the, the veteran who, who paid his dues and he wants to fight his retirement fight with Faber. Like, I, I'm not going to mess around with that. I respect that to an incredible degree. So that's why I just suggested that me and Edson would, would make a, a proper fight. You're very, you're very polite because I feel like most people would say, no, I want to, you know, kill off this veteran. I want to retire this guy. And it seems like you have enough respect for them or a lot of respect for them where you say, listen, you're, you're a legend, you're an OG do your thing and I'll, I'll have my time. I'll work my way up. You don't hear a lot of people saying that. So I give you a lot of credit. I appreciate it because I grew up watching these guys. I grew up watching Cub. I grew up watching, uh, um, uh, Edson as well. Like the 142 card that we were talking about, that's where he knocked out Terry Edson yes. with the spinning. So I had <gasps> like, it was a uh, first thing that we ever saw and we were like shaking when it happened. So knowing that I could test myself against these, these hard, battle-tested veteran who fought world champions over and over that that means the world to me but hey, hey uh it's it's in the the, the field now and uh, we'll see how my manager and uh, sean shelby and all the guys want to play that out you think you'll get it and do you feel confident now a few days later i i think so i think so because uh you know i think he had a little bit of problem with grapplers uh and it's good for like a win for me is tremendous and a win for him is tremendous as well i know i don't have a big name but like Edson can we we can do a proper battle or we can score one of these big knockouts or whatever. Like I, there's so much possibility that are so intriguing to so many people. As soon as the call out was done, like I was coming back to the airport and people were stopping me. You're a crazy man. Why would you do that? This and that. And taking picture and telling me that Edson is going to destroy me and this and that. And I'm like, I like that. This yeah. is what excites me. Knowing that there's so much dangerous, there's such a big dangerous aspect behind it that I, I love it. Like, uh, I haven't fought the guy and my leg already hurts, so I uh -huh. cannot wait to do And there's been some rumors of maybe a return to Canada this year. I know maybe not Quebec, but maybe Ontario. That would be great for you, yeah, right? 
Yeah, because right now Quebec, like we still have masks here. The 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 the, the pandemic is uh, like still going on. It's it's stupid to my opinion. Like uh, it's 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 crazy for me to go to Vegas like no mask. Everybody's like talking and everything. Then we come back here. Borders in Canada are completely insane. Uh, they take your scan face. They they like it's incredible. But hey, I don't mind. I, I came back to my country and I, now I'm I'm at home. I'm good. But so yeah, Toronto would make more sense, but from the dates that I've heard, the dates aren't probably probably the one that I'm interested in more than the, the one in France. Ah. And in France, it would be a, a great for me, great uh, uh, great uh, career stunt for me because I speak French. I can go over there, talk with the guys. I can train at MMA Factory because I know Cyril Gann uh, quite yeah. well, and I fought is a guy for this belt actually the 155 belt. I fought Damien Lapilus. So yeah, uh, and uh, their coach Fernando Lopez is a super nice guy. So yeah, it would be a good uh, Quebec France connection right there. So that would be something that would interest me. Well, congratulations on your success, my friend. Again, I'm sorry it has taken me a, a while to have you on the show, no, but uh and because my stock was down. I like you cannot invite someone to win, lose, win, lose, win, draw. Like you need you need you need guys who have names, you need guys who work hard. And uh now I'm I'm changing my career around and I'm very grateful that you wait. For, for me to become the man that I am today to have this conversation with you. So you don't have to apologize yeah. for anything. It was a pleasure. Thank you for your time, sir. Same here. We'll have you on very soon. Congrats. Enjoy the victory, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. All right, there he is. Charles Air Jordan. Remember that name? He's on uh, a winning streak now. He's won two in a row. Had the win over Andre Ewell back in December. Had the win over Lando Venata this past Saturday. Great uh, submission win had the back-to-back -back submissions there from the uh, the Canucks. Marc Andre Barrio, who he mentioned as well, uh, probably his most famous win since the Duhu Choi knockout. Remember that back in December of 2019, when he returned to featherweight. Incredible fight, second round, one of the knockouts of the year. It was on the final card of 2019. Had that amazing knockout of the Korean Superboy in South Korea. So they weren't too happy about that. But hey, I, I will never apologize for my interest in uh, the Quebec fighters. Obviously, it's where I'm from. My first favorite fighter was David Loazzo. He's the one who made me fall in love with the sport, seeing him do big things, fighting Rich Franklin, uh, fighting Charles McCarthy, the spinning uh, back kick to the stomach is when I really started to feel like, wow, this sport is special. And then, of course, watching George St. Pierre defeat Matt Hughes at Champ Sports Bar back at UFC 65, downtown Montreal, Saint Laurent, place explodes. I'm like, yo, I want to cover this sport. And that was 2006. Now I'm an old man, but I will always get excited about the, uh, the Canadian fighters, the Quebec fighters, and especially the ones doing big things on the big stage. Speaking of which, uh, our next guest isn't a Quebecois, but he is a fellow Canadian. He reps... Of course, British Columbia, and he's been in the news as of late. He is the current reigning, defending one championship heavyweight champion. In fact, it was a year ago tomorrow, April 28th, that he won the belt. Unfortunately, he defeated uh, Brandon Vera that night. Unfortunately, we haven't seen him since. Where the hell has Arjun Buller been? You'll recall the last time we spoke to Chatri Sichotong, we asked him about it. He gave us a bit of an update saying the negotiations were tough. Uh, but he was confident that they had rounded third, so to speak, and that good times were ahead. Well, without further ado, let us say hello to Arjun Buller, the reigning defending one championship heavyweight champion of the world. Give us an update on his situation. There he is, the man himself. Salut! Salut, I'm Arjun. Back. You're back. <laughs> A year ago tomorrow. Did you recognize that? I did, man. I did. I, every day that goes by, I'm in the gym and I'm just looking at that clock tick and the calendar, and I want to be out there, see all these events happening. Um, I, absolutely. Every day that goes by, it does not slip. Okay. Uh, and, and I do notice. Okay. So for, so for the casual fan who's watching right now, uh, why have you been out for so long? Can you explain? Yeah, it, it's not, it's not something that I wanted to do. Um, I, I want to fight multiple times a year. I had that in my contract. Um, when I signed and I came over, I wanted to make sure I had that in my new deal that we were trying to get done. And which we have done now. Um, I, I like to compete. I like to stay active. And so, you know, before it was okay, the pandemic hit and, and there were challenges. Um, but I wanted to make sure that something 
that I'm, I'm, I'm able to be busy moving forward. Um, and, you know, you've, I've seen you touch on it with the whole Nate Diaz situation and, and, and all, all through the years. Fighters have a certain amount of, of rights and um, leeway with this stuff. And it's quite unfortunate. And you're right in every aspect. Um, there isn't much that's really uh, that we can really leverage. Um, obviously, when you have gold, you have more leverage than you do in any other type of uh, situation. Um, so I was I was able to secure myself a, a new deal that I, I'm pretty pretty happy with moving forward. And 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 like I said, I just want to get busy, man. Frank. That's our breaking news music. Uh, breaking news to signify that you have officially re-signed with one championship. Yes. Absolutely. I have re-signed. I've got a new deal, a uh, multi-fight, multi-year deal that also allows me to pro wrestle. Oh. Um, it, it's a one-of-a-kind deal we haven't um, seen in the sport of MMA. Uh, I know we've seen people like Ronda and Kane and them get busy, but that was after. Um, but we, we've come to terms with one. Absolutely. Okay, so do you also have a pro wrestling deal to announce? So we we had interest um, from both WWE and AEW. We had conversations, but I couldn't. We couldn't engage in a formal deal because I, my contract wouldn't allow it. Oh. Um, so that that so step number one now would be to um, get my date and my opponent locked in. Obviously, there's there's an interim title that was introduced as we were sitting out. Uh, you know, uh, much like in the UFC with Francis and these guys, I, I was dealing with the same thing on my end, and, and we have the same management. Yeah. So it's crazy how that played out. Um, so he is uh, Anatoly Malikin. He is Russian. Currently, the Singapore government doesn't allow Russians to come into the country. So that is the next hurdle we have to overcome in terms of location. It has to be outside of Singapore. Once that thing gets booked, or I'll, I'll even go in Singapore against any other opponent. It doesn't matter. I want to get going. I want to get in there. Um, that's the next step. And then once that's secure, then then we then we engage for wrestling and, and, and we get a deal done with them. Do you have a preference, WWE, AEW? It's crazy, man. And it's been a year since I fought. And in the last year, pro wrestling has turned upside down as yeah. well. I mean, over 80, 80, um, 80 members of talent have been released from the WWE into the open market. They've signed the NIL deal uh, over on their end. Um, AEW has been, you know, Cody Rhodes has gone over, right. jumped over the other way. They got a thing happening in New Japan. Yeah. Um, so a lot of things are moving. But for me, um, I want the flexibility to be able to compete as well as pro wrestle. That's the main thing for me. I want to do both at the same time. It's never been done. I'd like to do that and, and stay as busy as possible in both industries. I don't have a preference. Um, you got... You know, obviously, Ginger over at WWE, you got Veer that's come through. Um, he's getting a big push over in AEW. They've introduced Satnam Singh. We've known each other for years. He's the uh, NBA baller, um, and, and we're very familiar on a personal level. So both 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 sides see the the Indian aspect and the, and the push that's wanted and needed. I love what Dan Lambert's doing over at AEW. He's the ultimate heel. I love his stuff. Um, I'm excited, man. I'm excited. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Like for me, like I said, um, I take care of myself first and that's going to be whoever allows me to, uh, to fight at the same time. But you know, I, what I've often heard from the MMA fighters who then try their hand at pro wrestling is damn, this, this is a lot harder than I thought. I remember King Mo said it, Tito said it, you're in your prime. You're the champ. You're not just some guy who's like showing up here and there. Can you conceivably do both and be successful at both? Well, a couple of things. I am in my prime. These are these are my best years. That's why I don't want to sit around. I, I've wanted to be busy. I want to be busy moving forward. Um, but uh, this is also something I want to do full time. And once I'm done competing, like a lot of fighters going to you know broadcasting and, and being in advance and this, that's not what I want to do. I want to be a pro wrestler. So I'm I'm, I'm putting my one foot in there and I'm going to do this. Um, and it's something I'm setting up for full time beyond once once I'm done competing. Uh, King Mo is actually one of the, he was probably the first guy I hit up. This was years ago um, when I was even making a decision to fight. And because um, he, he's been involved, you know, with pro wrestling and, and doing that thing for a while. And, and, and I had interest actually with even WWE back then. Um, they had a scout that came out and uh, we had conversations back then. And I asked him, I'm like, hey, how is this? And he told me exactly what you're saying, that it's actually harder on your body than MMA. That's what he had said for himself. Um, so, 
you know, I understand that. Um, AEW also doesn't do those those um, house shows that don't come on TV and all that. They're not going five, six, seven days a week. Like a lot of these WWE guys, the schedule is a lot more flexible in that regard. Um, although WWE is allowing more talent to have that flexibility. Um, so it's something I want to do before, when I was a kid, Ariel, there was no MMA. It was the belts were on Hogan, on Warrior, on Mach, on all these guys, The Rock, Stone Cold. So it's, it's something that's always been on my radar that I wanted to do when, whenever I had the chance. It was to get a pro wrestling belt and, and do that before it was even MMA. The MMA developed as an outlet for my competitive um, nature and, and to chase a world title in a competitive atmosphere um, as, I, as I wrestled, uh, as I came up through, through amateur wrestling. So competitively, that's something that I, I wanted to chase. But entertainment, fan, um, you know, legacy, it's, it's, it's just something I'm, I'm going to jump into, I want to do. And the only way to find out is to do it. So that, that's where it's at. Obviously, you have management, you have representation, you're represented by CA, as you mentioned, same uh, reps as Francis and Ganu. Crazy that you're both the heavyweight champions and you had your you know, contract issues. How contentious did things get? How difficult did things get? Because even when I spoke to Chatri, you know, they're not going to like open the curtain fully, but like it did <laughs> seem like he was a little frustrated with how things went. How were things with, uh, with you and from your perspective? Yeah, so um, shout out CAA Sports. First of all, um, they get beat up a lot, especially recently with, with Dana and Francis and, and, and the media attention that got. CAA does what their clients want. Um, they work on behalf of their clients. And look, Francis wants to box. But like he said it so many times. Before he ever found an avenue to, to box, he found MMA and he ended up going that way. But you can't knock the guy to, to, to want to chase what he wants and, and, and his hopes and dreams and um, – Boxing is his true passion. And it's not, a, from what I understand, he, he wants to pursue a multi-fight deal type of thing. Um, so, you know, CAA has taken their marching orders or their representation uh, on, on what Francis wants. And they get beat up for it. But the ones that get beat up are usually the ones doing what their clients want and pushing back to the status quo, let's be honest. Um, there aren't too many other managers that, 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 that push like these guys. Um, so these, they're making huge moves. Um, one of the things that's very interesting with Francis's thing, if I may, may touch on that a little please, bit. Please, please. Um, I'm a huge advocate for fighter, fighter rights and, and, and negotiations and fighter pay and all that stuff. The only reason he's been able to also do this is because of guys like Fitch and Kong Lee and Kyle Kingsbury and Brandon Vera and their case. You know, they've got a sunset clause in the contracts now because of that. It's a new thing. Tell us what sunset clause is for those that don't know, because this is you're going real inside here, and I love this stuff. I love this stuff, and not enough fans absolutely. understand this stuff. So you're talking about the the class action lawsuit led by the right. MMA FA guys, Fitch, Kung Lee, Kyle Kingsbury. There are a few oh, others. The AK guys, you just named. That's right. Hey, yeah, that's right. The AK guys. Uh, no DC. I mean, I'm just kidding. DC. I love you, DC. Hey, hey. I love you, dog. Oh, I love yeah. you. I love you, DC. Um, you know what? But what? I, I'll get to him too. Actually. Okay. Oh no. Oh no. Came to me. Yeah. My end of this. I, I leaned on him for some decisions here, and and I'll, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But yeah. What's the sunset clause? Like, What's the sunset clause that you're talking about? There's no end date for these contracts. Yeah. You can get you can get you can get extended in perpetuity. You've talked about it on your on your stuff. Same with Nate Diaz right now. He got extended. The guy wants to fight. Yeah. He's sitting at home. I, I can relate with that. Like any fighter that you want to compete, you want to get out there. So, uh, and Francis, he wanted to fight. He's getting benched. He's not getting the push. He does, he's the baddest man on the planet uh, in terms of uh, uh, UFC champ and, and, and all that. And he's not getting the push. He was sitting at home and he, and he wanted to get going. So I, I, I get that. And, and you also, one thing he touched on, which, which I found, you know, people don't know this stuff. We, the fighters are obligated contractually to follow through on their end, but the promotions aren't, aren't obligated on their end. We can't do nothing about that, to be quite honest. Um, and, but with this class action lawsuit now, Francis is in the, in the best position, in my opinion, because he, he's got a sunset clause, which, which, which is in every contract now, thanks to previous fighters, fighters helping fighters, right? Because of that lawsuit. And that helps every fighter that's on the roster. Now there's an end date to these contracts. Um, and so because of that, he's got uh, a fixed date where his contract's going to expire. 
Now, does the UFC fight that? And it proves the class action lawsuit, correct? Or do they let it go? Mm. And, and, and Francis is a free man. Like, if I'm Francis, this is a perfect position. He can call his own shots. He fought out his... That gun fight was very risky. And, but he did it on his terms. He wanted to fight one more time and get to that end um, that way. And, and, and they've been trying to re-sign him and all that. But I don't, I don't see how that's going to play out. Now, when it came to my end, sorry, going to my end now, similarly, um, you know, I wanted a new deal where I'm a champ. I wanted to be a pro wrestler, all that stuff. And, um, you know, it, 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 again, leverage right or how how can i how can i come to the table how can we get to this it got very contentious i'm gonna i'm gonna admit um you know it helps like i said i got the best management uh out there ca sports actually they helped if you had just seen this morning the breaking news with with, with chatry and amazon and all that ca actually helped negotiate that deal wow so um they're they're also clients so that that's uh you know that helps we're all one team um and you know, it, it was something that, hey, they're going to do what they what they need for the promotion. We're trying to do what we need uh, for, for ourselves um, and the promotion. And we came, you know, uh, with a landmark kind of deal. Um, and I'm very happy with, with, with the deal that we've come up with. Like I said, I can fight multiple times a year. No questions asked. I'm going into pro wrestling and, and do what I have to do there. And that's really, truly um, what I always wanted was to stay busy and and, and you know, that's what Chaudhry's uh, now allowing it. And, 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 and I really want to give them props. I want to give CAA props um, for pushing for their fighters. One, one, one uh, props for allowing their fighters to do more and, and, and spread their wings and, and their brand and all that. It wasn't easy. Um, honestly, it was actually a very, it's, it's mentally very tough. Come sitting at home and you don't know what's coming next. You're yeah. a, like, a, there's no end. Like this can go on for years and, and forever. <laughs> and wow. You want to get busy and, and you want to compete. And like you said, prime years of your life. So, um, but I'm happy we are where we are. I, I'm sure, correct me if I'm wrong, that big one X show, which I thought they did a great job production wise. It felt like a big deal. The fights were fun. You're probably watching that and feeling a little left out a couple of weeks ago, right? Oh man, absolutely. You know, you first Indian world champ, uh, and got a big TV deal in India on star sports. Um, you know, I, I felt uh, I should have been out there. I, absolutely. I should have been out there even before that. Like, we can continue the momentum. Yeah. We just got the title. Let, let's get going. And the only way you have momentum is, is in my opinion, multiple times you got to get out there a year. Um, so, and then now in between fights, I can continue that momentum with, with the pro wrestling. So, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to get real, real busy moving forward. Okay. So right now you mentioned, uh, DC, like he, is, is he still a mentor? What, what, what is he, how, how, because you, you, okay. I, I'm assuming you can't go to AK these days, right? Or maybe now you can finally, are you, are you in AK right now? You're not in San Jose right now, right? No, I'm in okay. Vancouver. I want to get this thing booked. I want a date and, and then I'll get, uh, get my camp going. Um, DT, DC will always be a mentor. Absolutely. Um, you're the Canadian you know, Indian DC. You even speak like him for God's sake. <laughs> 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 easy man easy. um I, i'll take that as a compliment it is a you know, compliment uh, it is a compliment yeah he's done great things and, and um absolutely that is a compliment but I, I i reached out to him um and and i was picking his brain through all this because it gets very um mentally draining and, and the best way to move forward and, and how do you go about this and that type of thing and i will say another thing um and I want to say, I want to make sure I, I cover this the right way. So there was also another opportunity that, that, that came towards us through all this. And that was, um, Henry Cejudo wanting to come to one on a what? trade. Come on. And absolutely. And, um, cause he couldn't get his stuff worked out on his end. Um, and that went to the, uh, that went high up in the UFC. And that was being explored. Um, and so, it, you know, it was, it was brought to my, hey, what would you guys, what do you think? And that's something I lean on DC for. That's where I bring up the DC name and, 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 and that type of thing. I, I got to thinking. And a few things on me personally, you know, I, I, I've been a part of DC's training camps all the way through since Jones won. He's been in there with Jones. He's been in there, Steve Pace, been in there, Black Beast. Um, I'm familiar with Ty. He's come through AK. I, I've felt him. He's felt me. I know what he brings to the table 
what, and he knows vice versa. Tom Aspinall, we were booked before. Uh, he pulled out. We're familiar with each other. These are all sort of the top guys. And, and I sort of picked his brain on some of that. Um, and it's private conversations, but um, I liked what he said. And, 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 um, and he, he was giving me some good food for thought. And, you know, then I got to thinking, like, this would be a huge thing. Because I know, I know Chaudhry, and I know one, and I know Dana and the UFC, I feel. Askren wasn't a good representation of one, how one athletes can compete. I don't feel that. He was two years retired, bad hip, sitting. Um, but you make that deal because you're getting DJ and you get, you know, a goat and, and you make that happen. Chaudhry's very, very competitive. I know that. He won't, and we have great champions. Do we, will that ever happen moving forward? I don't know. Would I ever entertain it? Absolutely. First, my pro wrestling thing would have to be sorted out. On a competitive standpoint, I want to fight the best in the world. I uh, uh, pick my, my my guy DC's brain on that competitive aspect. Um, and you know, if if that ever got pulled off again, I think one is better than what Askren showed. We can compete at a higher level. DJ came over, he lost. Eddie came over, he lost. Sage came over, he got his face broken. There are killers in one. I think Chaudhry would want to show that still in a better way than Askren did. I can pass USADA. I've done it my whole life. Um, I can compete. We're talking International Fight Week in July for the UFC. It's about time India gets a seat at the table. No one else is going to ever do that. Um, wait a second. Well, wait a second. Something that works. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait, wait. Frank, we get that. Well, my head is about to explode here. Frank, we got the music. I mean, what is? What are you saying here, Arjun? What was uh, <laughs> All I'm saying was. There was talks there a lot of, of you versus Henry, a trade, you going from one to UFC, Henry going from UFC to one. There was talks was rumbling. A, th there was, this was a, something that came our way that was, pro, that was presented. What if, and, and, and conversations. Um, and as you can see now, Henry's been. Yeah. 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 Supposedly back in USADA. Let's see how it goes for yeah. him. I've got a deal that I'm happy with. Wow. That's a groundbreaking, legendary deal, all of that. One of a kind deal, I'm very happy with. I'm talking out loud of what my thought process was. You asked me about DC and, yeah, and yeah, all yeah. that. That's where he, uh, I had some conversations in the middle of all of this. And, and I always have conversations, even on the back end. Hey, this is sort of my deal. And, and he knows how much I love pro wrestling. Um, and, and all of that. But didn't so, you sort of leave like with some hard feet? Like, didn't you feel, you know, the turban, the, they didn't push you? Like, why would you even consider it? Um, why would I consider that? It, I'm, I'm talking to you uh, like uh, this is before we got a deal done, number one. Yeah, okay. All right, fair enough. Number one. Yeah. Number two, um, as a com I'm telling you what my thought process was. Yeah, yeah. Could this work as a competitor? What draws me to it? Mm. Um, I always want to fight the best in the world, whether they come this way, whether we go that they'll never co-promote, um, with anybody. I do feel that if they co-promote with one, that would be phenomenal. Um, we just signed that Amazon deal. We're in the U S we're in Canada, big time deal, groundbreaking, uh, you know, breaking news of today. We're going to have a U.S. event. Yeah. So we're making moves coming this way. Um, and if that ever happens, awesome. But like I said, when this was presented, this was um, the thought process and the pattern. I thought Henry would be phenomenal for one in terms of um, Mighty Mouse, Adrian Marias, John oh, yeah. Lineker, uh, combat, you know, sports legend. They'll let him box. They'll let him kickbox, grappling if he wants. One allows all of those things. Um, I don't know if he'd be a luchador. I don't know if he wants to do that. Um, but one allows all of those things. They, they, they do what's right for the athletes and their brand. Um, and, I, and, I, and again, for me, before I got this deal done, and now I'm going to move forward with pro wrestling and, and we're going to go that route. If I ever went that way or if that was ever going to be considered uh, and, and, and for real, um, the pro wrestling would be uh, something that would have to factor in for me. You know, uh, like I said, Kane's done it, Ronda's done it, they did it after. Yeah. Um, so that would be something on, on my end. But as a competitor, man, those names, man, that's, that, that, that's something that really I, I like to compete. Like this Russian I got. Yeah, he's a knockout artist. He was he medaled at Russian Nationals for wrestling. Um, 
crazy boxer. He's a very tough, tough test, very tough opponent, but it excites me. That, that's what I'm looking for. And, and to be honest with one also, their light heavy belt's only 225. It's not that low in terms of weight class. So that's something I've got on my radar beyond this one fight. I, I want to get two belts. You're calling me DC. He had two belts. Harry. He did. He did. So yeah, uh, I intend on uh, making that a, a serious thought beyond this. Um, these are the things that are swirling in my head moving forward. Very excited. This is great. I, I could see the the wheels turning. I could see the fire burning. So when are you going to fight again? Do you have any idea? Like to, I know you have, you said the, the, the issue with Russia and Singapore. They do shows outside of Singapore as well. Um, I was actually talking to some people at one. So the, the news that you mentioned, I referenced it at the top of the show, but I'll, I'll repeat it since you referenced it a couple of times, signed a five-year deal with Amazon Prime. One championship did announce this morning uh, for the U.S. and Canada. Not If you're already a subscriber, you don't have to pay more now. It's just going to be on 12 events in prime time in the United States, which is massive in Canada as well. And the plan is what I was told, maybe you know more, they're hoping by Q1 2023 to actually hold an event here in North America, which I think is massive. They've been talking about this for a long time. So with all that said, Correct. when do you think you'll return? Correct. And I think uh, Rich Franklin was kind of heading that in terms of the U.S. and and, and seeing where the interest was in terms of – because the rule set's a little different. You have to mm -hmm. run it through the commissions. Mm -hmm. Global rule set um, is different than, than we currently run in, in the States. So I know he was pushing on that stuff. Uh, and they are definitely looking at that uh, live event. Um, for me, like I said, uh, I've been competing, man. I want a ASAP. Let's go. We signed a deal. I'd love to announce at the same time I've signed a deal, and this is my opponent. This is the date. This is the location. So I can get ready for camp. Got a tough opponent in front of me. Um, you know, go take care of that. Start the discussions with pro wrestling. Um and, and hopefully get that signed and sealed and delivered. So right on the back end of a win, we keep that hot. And, and I can, you know, I'm interested to see how this uh, UFC high heavyweight division unfolds and, and Henry's potential comeback unfolds. Is it, is it real or is it just talk? Um, all of that, uh, all of that stuff interests me moving forward. And if you could look into a crystal ball, when do you think your wrestling career gets going? It's a big deal for you, right? I mean, you fought for this. So it's not just something you fought to have on a contract. You actually want to pursue it. What's your hope? My hope is as soon as I'm booked, um, we, we engage them right away and we get going like a couple of weeks after my first fight. As, as soon as we fight, um, we have a date set out for them where I come in and we raise some hell and um, we let them know that we've arrived and, and we get going right away. Well, this is exciting. It's a lot of exciting things. Absolutely. You have other Absolutely. I, I love I, hey, I'm loving your stuff through BT Sport with with oh, Heyman and God, all these you. guys, man. Oh, he he cut a good one with you, man. He did cut. It, you know, he, sometimes you got to let the phenomenal. guy do his thing. He's a magician. I mean, he's a he's an absolute genius. And you know, yeah. I don't have the ego. I can I can let someone get over on me. I'm okay with that. You know, we all win. Absolutely. Rising tide lifts Absolutely. all boats. You can't try to outwit someone like that. You got to let him do his thing. Absolutely, that man is is is. Uh, they don't make them like that. I don't see anyone else coming up like that. Um, what he did with ECW and and what he's doing now, the whole Brock angle and then the Roman angle. And oh man, I feel like you like wrestling yeah. more than MMA. Honestly, I, I I'm a big big. I'm telling you, I like MMA because my competitive spirit. Right. I'm telling you that that's what it is. I don't like the bullshit drama, like the history. I don't like Kobe. I don't like this. All these that, that stuff pisses me off. I'll be, it's a competitive spirit that drives me for MMA. The day I, I, I lose that, where I don't have a goal I'm shooting towards and, and, and a bigger competitive thing to shoot for, I'm out. And, and that, that's, my, that's what drives me in that respect. But seeing Paul Heyman with a beard when Brock dropped him and he's sitting there, oh, what, what, that was class. Yeah. What a touch that was. Um, and where do I go from here? And uh, my tribal team, and oh, he's 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 phenomenal. He's the best. Well, I'm loving what he's doing. I'm loving, um, you know, what Cody's done. I mean, they turned this business upside down. It's it's the best time to get into in, into wrestling right now. It's like the old '90s, man, with WCW and WWE. Yeah. It's the best time for talent to to get in. Um, and I'm loving it, man. Either you, you can't go wrong either side. With him coming to WWE, it shows you. And AEW taking WWE talent, as long as your, sh your, your star shines bright, 
you can go either way, you know, and, and it's it's phenomenal for talent. Competition is good for everyone. This is actually why I'm so into boxing these days because there isn't one like NFL and then a bunch of other promotions. Sort of like in you know in MMA, let's be honest, there's a big gap between the UFC and everyone else because they have a 30 year head start, and I feel like that gap allows for some complacency. In boxing, you have, you know, Matchroom doing their thing and PBC's doing their thing and Topra. And it feels like every week everyone's jockeying for position in wrestling. Obviously, WWE has that thing. But let's be honest, AEW has picked up some ground. They've picked up some seat. And now it feels like it raises WWE's game. They're not going after a Cody if Cody's just sort of like toiling in the indies doing his thing. No, they went after him because of what he did in AEW. And now you have other guys coming. So, like, this is – and so I hope MMA gets to that point, too – and deals like this Amazon deal for one, PFL being on ESPN, that's great. Bellator hopefully getting more of a push from Showtime. This is good for everyone. This is good for you guys. It's good for the fighters. I agree. It's, 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 fighters have to help fighters. The reason Francis is in the position he's at, previous fighters took action and they, you know, inadvertently helped his position. Absolutely. You have to be able to help each other to, to get, to, you know, get some type of, of, of rights and say, and, I don't know if that's Ali Act. I don't know if that's unionization. I don't know if that's, you hear rumblings of the uh, National Labor Relations Board head, the appointee changing. I don't know if that's what it's going to be. Um, but I agree, man. It, you know, right now, it, it's something that, that will benefit the fighters. Like you're talking, you're talking Cyborg and Kayla Harrison now, you know. If they can get together and get that thing done, that's a big fight. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of people tune in, you know. I think that's a big, big, big time fight. Um, you need stuff like that to happen. I think the fans will benefit. Uh, I think the companies, will, the promotions would benefit. Athletes would definitely benefit. It improves the product. I mean, you know, look what they're doing. Well, yeah, what you're saying in terms of boxing, you know, it's, it's unless you, unless you force that hand sort of or, or, or are able to come together and make that happen for yourselves, no one's just going to give it to you. Right. Um, you know, they don't have to. They don't have to unless you make them. So, uh, and, and in terms of, like, pro wrestling, look, they got Cody Rhodes that booked him in Mania. He went over in Mania. Yeah. It's not like they tried to bury him and, and that yeah. type of thing, which I was interested to see. Um, so, you know, it, it improves the product. It gets everyone excited. Um, and, you know, I, I'm hopeful. Look, I, I'm hopeful for the future of our sport. Um, a deal like mine proves that, you're able to make things happen if you get if you work with the right people and, and there's will on both sides. Chatri sees benefit with with the, with pro wrestling. How that that will rub give a good rub to to one, um, and it allows me to fight. And and I'm hoping I can find we can find a partner on the other end, be it WWE, AEW, that sees the benefit of of the MMA and the and the one and, and the Indian market rub into into pro wrestling. And that's what it's all about. If we can all get something from the deal and, and, and we all go home happy and have a lot of fun, um, you know, I think I think that's the best thing that can happen. Arjun, congratulations, my friend. Well done. Well done to you and the team. I look forward to your return. I look forward to seeing what you do in the world of pro wrestling. Thank you very much for coming on and talking about all this. Great stuff. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. It's been a long year. I appreciate you having me on and and I love the content you're pushing out. Thanks. Um once the fight gets uh, booked, I'll let you know, and, and then we'll have the documentary fight finished up by then, too. That's right. So I'll keep you posted. All right. Thank you very much, Arjun. All the best to you, my friend. There he is, Arjun Bowler, the one championship heavyweight champion. Fascinating stuff there regarding Henry Cejudo. You know, I was actually thinking about this. Cejudo versus, uh, excuse me, not versus, Cejudo and AJ McKee. I think that would be, I was, I was thinking about it recently. Cejudo versus AJ McKee, not versus, Cejudo for AJ McKee in a trade was something I was thinking about because obviously, you know, they were a little unhappy with what AJ McKee had to say when he was on this show talking about UFC and the contract and this and that. And Cejudo's having his issues, although I saw a picture recently with him and Sean Shelby and uh, Hunter Campbell. Um, so it seems like everyone's back on the same page. But before all of that, I was thinking that would be an interesting trade. I want more trades in MMA. We had the one back in 2018 with uh, Askren and Demetrius Johnson. But let's get more of that. Arjun and, and Cejudo, I think, would get a good push, obviously, in uh, one championship. And he's been flirting with everyone on social media.
I was actually looking at an old clip. I forgot about this. I was looking at an old clip that uh, Jedi posted two years ago of DC and I, and I forgot that I was the one that came up with the triple C moniker. Totally forgot about that. I remember him and Captain Eric telling me that they wanted to go with Champ Champ Champ, which is a horrible name. Champ 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 is one of the all-time worst names. And I said, no, guys, go with Triple C. Like Triple H, go with Triple C or Triple G, Triple C. Not Champ Champ Champ. Totally forgot about that. I mentioned it in the clip. Um, so again, as I said a couple of weeks ago on the show, he needs to consult, but you know, all kinds of issues, playing hard to get, this and that. Anyway, in a matter of moments... Uh, we're going to be joined in studio by the head man over at Matchroom Boxing. Everyone loved the last time he was here in studio. Do we have an update on uh, Mr. Edward Hearn? Just a couple of minutes. Is he in the building? Yes. That wasn't very convincing, Frank. Now, they told me hard out 245. Because they're late, does that mean I get to add whatever amount? That's not normally how that works, but... Well, can we ask that question? We'll I mean, definitely I feel, ask, for sure. I feel like I'm being shortchanged Let's here. go back to that triple C thing. You were so no, happy. No, no, like, this is, uh, this, this is the show right here. I mean, I'm told 2 o'clock to 2.45. I'm staring at the clock right now, 2.06, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Um, I just want to know if I'm getting my 45 or uh, am I SOL, as they say. I think these are the good questions to ask, yeah. Uh, so I don't know if, if Connor or Joe or someone wants to ask that. Just let me know. Um, but that was great stuff there from Margin Buller. And uh, later in the program, we're going to be joined by Yancy Medeiros, who uh, also announced today has signed a new multi-fight deal with Bellator. Very interesting. He took the chance, signed the one-fight deal, got on the Hawaii fight card this past Saturday, had a tremendous... performance against Emmanuel Sanchez and it paid off this press uh, press release here yes prime video that's exciting right prime video are you a prime subscriber Frank I am are you gonna watch one championship on prime you know it <laughs> yes uh, prime video and one championship have announced a multi-year agreement for prime video to broadcast 12 live one championship martial arts events annually <laughs> The full live events will be available exclusively on Prime Video in the United States and Canada. The first event will be announced later this year. One is the world's largest, basically five-year deal, U.S.-Canada, minimum 12 events live in U.S. prime time. So they're going to have more than 12, but there'll be a minimum of 12 live in the U.S. in prime time. Very significant because a lot of their great events are happening at 6, 7, 8 a.m. on a Friday or Saturday, not exactly prime time, you know? So if they're going to do prime time, 12 events, that that's huge. And they were telling me that they're looking uh, to do an event here in the United States, Q1 2023. I remember they did a press conference maybe four or so years ago. Um, it was like a press event at Extreme Couture in Las Vegas. Rich Franklin was there. Misha Tate was there when she was working for them. Who else was there? DJ, I think, was there as well. And then the pandemic screwed everything. Pandemic screwed everything up. So that's good. Anytime someone signs these uh, these big deals, TV deals, streaming deals, all this stuff, fantastic. And uh, so I, I mean, I know, I know, Frank, you're a big Prime guy. I mean, it's a big deal, right? I mean, you get to go on the app, you get to watch your events. This is beautiful stuff. Oh, yes, Vitor Belfort was there. Thank you, New York Rick. Um, all right, so in a matter of moments, I'm told he's in the building. Now, let me know if I get... Now it's 208. Now it's 209. The, it just went to 209. So do I get to add or am I just... You get to ask. So who do I ask? Do I ask? Because if I ask him, you have to ask the PR guy because if you ask the guest, he's just going to be like, hey, you know, I don't know. And then he's put in an awkward spot. But Eddie Hearn, in my opinion is the best promoter in combat sports right now. And I'm not just saying it because he's here and, you know, I did the face-to-face. -face. I did the face-to-face -face yesterday with uh, Katie and Amanda. That was very exciting. I got to meet Katie for the first time. Uh, I think it's coming out today. And I'm doing another one with Jake Paul and Eddie tomorrow. Uh, but I just think, you know, one of the underrated things that he does 
is when he does these interviews, he does, you know, I watch all of these boxing, social IFL. I love the stuff. It's great stuff. The business of boxing is fascinating to me. And he doesn't just give you like the general, you know, spiel on the fights and the main events. He's running down the whole card. He's telling you about the first fight. That's four rounds up until the last fight. And so there's a real passion and interest there that gets you emotionally invested and excited for these fights. That's what it means to be a great promoter, to get you excited. Um, and a lot of what he's taken is, is from Dana White, and he has said that himself. In fact, he was sitting cage side. They're friends. They're pals. He was sitting cage side. I don't know why my voice went so high there, but you get the point. They are pals sitting cage side, 2 back in March when the UFC was there. And he has said that he's taken, and by the way, it's about time that someone admits that because the UFC put out the blueprint over the last decade plus as to how to put on these events in a fun, exciting, and energetic way. And the old boxing guard didn't want to adapt to the times. Matchroom has adapted, um, and others are as well. And you're seeing that. And what's so special about this fight isn't even necessarily the fact that it's the first female fight at Madison Square Garden in 143 year history. And I understand that there are people in the Midwest, overseas, that don't care about MSG and are like, what the hell is the big deal? I get that. Isn't even necessarily the fact that it's one versus two, which to me is most significant. It's the fact that it's a co-promotion. Amanda Serrano isn't a matchroom fighter. So there's like three massive things here. Now, I know the third aspect isn't necessarily massive news in the world of boxing, but for us here, like there's a lot to learn about all of this. There's a lot to appreciate about all of this. Amanda Serrano is an MVP fighter. She's with Most Valuable Promotions, the Jake Paul promotion with his uh, business partner, Nikisa Badarian. That's big in its own right. And part of the reason why this fight didn't happen in the past is because they are not under the same umbrella and they couldn't come to a deal. Now, of course, COVID delayed things and the money delayed things and all this stuff. But that was one of the many roadblocks. And so that is significant in its own right as well. And I was thinking when Liz Carmouche won the Bellator 125-pound title um, over the weekend on Friday. <laughs> Controversial or not, who cares? It was a great moment. She deserves it. An OG. They're probably going to run it back with Juliana Velasquez. So it's all good in the hood. But I was thinking back to that first fight with Ronda Rousey. And of course, that wasn't the first women's MMA fight of all time. And this isn't the first women's boxing event of all time. But it was super significant because it was the first UFC women's MMA fight of all time, and it just so happened to headline a pay-per-view as well. So it was a double whammy. It was at the Pond in Anaheim, the Honda Center. And this feels a lot like it. It feels historic. It feels significant. It feels like barriers are being broken. Um, and for whatever reason, and I'd love to talk to Eddie about this if he happens to show up today. Um, for whatever reason, like it, it, it feels like boxing... <laughs> has always been slow, slower to adapt to women's fighting as opposed to in MMA, where for the longest time, even before the UFC, you had people like Gina Carano and you had other promotions that were, you know, it was Elite XC and it was um it was it was Strike Force, then came the UFC and Bellator, of course, as well. Uh, PFL, every major promote one. You you can't ha you can't have a promotion right now without women's fighters on it. I think it would be very much looked down upon. For whatever reason, it, it, it took the boxing side of things, again, the old guard, slow to adapt, longer to uh, to welcome the women's fighters, to, to put on a card with 10 fights and nine of them featuring men in the main event being two women. This is long overdue. Now we can have the argument, we can have the debate whether or not there were the stars, the people, the attractions... And, and maybe these were the two perfect ones. You have someone from Ireland, huge audience here, huge fan base here. Anytime an Irish fighter fights here, whether it's, uh, you know, wh wh whether it's Katie Taylor or Mick Conlon or many others before, anytime someone is fighting here of Irish descent, it's a big deal. And then you have a Puerto Rican fighter. Anytime a Puerto Rican fighter has fought in this city, it's a massive deal. You put those two fan bases in the same arena, it's going to be incredible. Please do me a favor. If you are not a fan of boxing, if you are not a fan of these fighters, if you're not interested, just do me a favor. By the time Cheeto Vera and Rob Fawn, a tremendous 135-pound fight, ends on Saturday night, this fight 
will just about be ready to start. The plan is, and everyone's working together, ESPN and DAZN, another pretty damn cool thing, if I may say so myself, are working together to not overlap. So UFC main card is going to be 7 to 10 on Saturday, Eastern time. And then at around 10.15 or so, the ring walks will go down with Taylor and Tarno. So when that is over, switch over. Get on it. And just watch how special this is going to be. Now, there are certain things that I don't love about it. The 10 two-minute rounds don't love. I think they should be doing three-minute rounds. I think a title fight should be 12 rounds as well. But whatever. That time will come, just like it took a little while in MMA as well. And oh, by the way, there's another great boxing match on uh, Saturday. Shakur Stevenson and Oscar uh, Valdez. Fred says out at 245. So, we're, so we're, we're, we're SOL here. I mean, this is crazy. This is absolute crazy. I'm not going to complain. I mean, it's still a solid 30, but it's like... It feels like you know, we're on the short end of the stick here. <laughs> it's a big deal. And then after Eddie will be joined by uh, Joe Markowski, who's the EVP of DAZN, to talk a little more about this, the business of combat sports. And I'm really interested. This kind of just like came and went. What happened to DAZN and... Uh, <laughs> And MMA. What happened to, you know, Frank gave me this thing. I haven't been really using it. Actually, it's kind of hanging on for dear life, Frank. If I'm... See that? I got a little cough thing. D does it work? Is it working well? Yeah, it's good. Just want to test it out. Have to stick it on here a little tighter. All right, so I'm ready to go. I'm going to move my belt here. Oh, is, is, uh, is Ed here? Yes. Eddie in the house. Oh, there he is. Edward, how are you, sir? I'm very well, I'm going to stand up. It's nice to have you here. I mean, certainly not on time, but it's okay. Uh, well, you know, you what know can you do? Traffic. Uh, I'll tell you what, if it wasn't you, I wouldn't have even come. You, you wouldn't even be bothered. No, I'm going to move so, this well, uh, belt. Okay. This is my belt here for the All best right. broadcaster in combat sports. Well, con no congratulations. Thank you. Thank I'm, you. Now com I'm, a, I'm now a combat sports expert after going to UFC London. We have a lot to so talk about. Go. I mean, we were supposed to have 45, but I was just told by Fred that we're only getting 30, despite the fact that you are tardy, but that that's okay. A long time. I see you giving IFL 30 every freaking true, week. That is true. Every and week. Much bigger numbers, and it's so. the same old questions every week. We won't get into all of that. You look fantastic, by the way. Right. Down a few pounds, yes? Yeah, I was trying to, I was 118 kilograms, and I kept. What is that? That's like. Uh, like 200 and. Uh, 50 odd pounds like and I, I kept seeing these heavyweights weigh in and i'd look at them and i would think wow you're in tremendous shape and then i'd go i'm 20 pounds heavier than you yeah, so yeah, yeah. i'm trying to get to 105 i'm okay. two key two kgs away and what are you All, doing training eating well no alcohol oh wow feeling great okay something i you know this is not your typical question but i think about this as i get older we're around the same age you're 42 so, yeah turning 40 this year uh you have two kids yeah how many days a week do you think that you are away from home? In, excuse me, days out of the year do you think you're away from home? And how does that affect you as a father? Because I, I wonder about, I worry about these things a lot, especially weekends, right? They're playing sports, they have activities. Mm. You're never there on the weekend, right? You're either in mm. Spain or New mm. York or Vegas. Mm. How do you do this? So you have to, if you want to excel at what you do, you have to make terrible sacrifices in your life. Now, life is about balance. And life is about understanding what's important and what's not. So unfortunately, people with incredible drive and people who love to win are also very selfish. Hmm. So the answer is, unfortunately, that you have to make sacrifices that will affect your ability to be, in that instance, a good father. But I grew up that way. So my dad was away all the time. And the only thing my dad cared about, well, not say cared about, he cared about me, but the drive that he had was to be successful. And everything else was secondary. So the reality is that it's only actually as you get older, you start to think, well, you know, what is success? I'm going a bit deep here, Ariel. I like what, this. what is success to you? And, and how do you determine success? When I was younger, the way I determined success was very different to how I determine it now. It used to be, can I hit those numbers? You know, can I beat the opposition? You know, can I do the biggest show? How many tickets can I sell? Now success is more about feeling. You know, it's about feeling good. Mm. And it, many different things can give you that. It's fulfillment. But fulfillment comes in many different ways. For some people, fulfillment comes in staying at home and being a stay-at-home dad and just being around your kids. So some people, fulfillment comes from winning 
and excelling at what you do. So the mix is right. I haven't really answered your question, mm. but what I will say is it is impossible to be a standout father when you're so driven in your chosen industry. And you see it with sports people all the time. You have to make horrible sacrifices. But you also, when you're there, you have to try and be present, which is very hard because the phone's going off and you're trying to do that deal and you're thinking about that event and you've just read someone on social media call you something and now you're a bit angry. Mm -hmm. So never take yourself too seriously. Do you feel guilty? Uh... I, I'm sure you miss things, yeah, right? I miss, yeah, I do. And I, I, when I'm there, I'm like super dad, mm. right? So I'm doing, I'm 10 times more effort than I would if I was there every day. So, but it can't, you know, I, I'd hope that, and I hope my children have the same passion for what, they find a passion and a love for what they do and they chase their dreams. They, they have that feeling of fulfillment. And to do that, you have to make sacrifices. It's not for everybody. You know, being the top and the best at what you do is not for everybody. Making those sacrifices is not for everybody. You know, people say, oh, wow, you're living the life. Wow, you've got New York this week. You've got Vegas next week for Canelo. Then you're in Italy. Then you're in Spain. Then you're back at the O2. It's like, yeah, but it, it's tiring, mm -hmm. you know, and it comes with, with sacrifices. But how bad do you want it? That's what life comes down to. How bad do you want it? How big do you want to make this show? How successful? Do you want to make the show? Are you willing to make sacrifices that will affect your life to be the very best at what you do? And if you're not, no problem. It's not for you. But I want to win. I want to be the best at what I want to do. I want to take over the sport globally. That's the drive that I have, and I understand the sacrifices that come with it. Uh, before you came in, as I was trying to waste time, you know, because <laughs> traffic and everything, uh, I called you the best promoter in combat sports. You believe this, right? Combat sport. I'm not talking boxing. Yeah, I mean, you are the best right now. I don't know. I mean, I, I I sometimes read that you don't have a great relationship with Dana White. I don't really know the. I'm background. not trying to take a shot. No, I'm no, just no being but, honest. But what I'm saying is, is I'm not in awe of Dana White, but I have huge respect for him as a promoter. So if you say to me, "Are you the best promoter in boxing?" It's not even close. Genuinely, not even close. But Dana White. I see as a trailblazer in terms of promotion, not just as a promoter, but in terms of the business, the brand, the way that that sport or that, that brand has penetrated the global combat market. So, and, and for me to not answer that question with I absolutely I am, is quite, you know, it's a massive credit to Dana White because my ego is out of control. So... I, I can't. I, I can't sit here and say I'm a better promoter than Dana White. Like I, I just. I don't know because the proof is in the pudding in terms of the growth that that business has had. Whether that's down to him, but the model is quite similar. You know, I recognise that if I could build my platform and my brand, you're not solely dependent on talent in terms of your commercial deals and your broadcast deals. You know, so Dana White and the UFC have built a product where they can go into new territories. They can sell out arenas without you actually knowing who's fighting. You know, I mean, I was at the London event. People knew that Molly was on and people knew that Paddy was on, but UFC were coming to London. Yeah. Get your tickets. And that that's, you know. Sort of so, like WWE, right? Same. And we, we, that's the same as what we're trying to do. You know, you have your own production values. The production is in-house. You control your own narrative. You control your own shoulder programming, digital content. You know, you, you build your social media team. We're, we're only following in suit of UFC. And I always say that we copy a lot of what they do. I have no problem saying it, but you know we're, we're, we're the closest thing to UFC in boxing. And of course, we're going to talk about Taylor Serrano. I have a lot of strong feelings about this. In fact, when I was on the DAZN Boxing Show in December, they asked me, what's the fight you're most looking forward to in 2022? Before this was even done, I said this one. They were all like, ah. I'm like, of course it's this one. <laughs> so I've been driving this train for quite some time. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. But we did see you in March at the O2 mm. next to Dana. And there was one time when they cut to you guys and you were like talking. In his oh, ear. that was a mistake. What bro. happened? What happened? Because what were you telling them? They came to me. So the, the whole situation is people were saying to me all week, are you going to the, like he said to me, you've got to come to London to UFC. But, and then people were asking me if I was going. And I was like, I don't really want to call Dana and ask him for a ticket. Like, yeah, you don't so, so I just thought, oh, I'm not going to go. Anyway, about six o'clock, literally on the night, Wow. Dana said, messaged me and said, are you coming? I was like, well, no one's really said anything. I was at <laughs> home, I was having a bit of dinner. I was like, do you know, he said, you've got to come. So I was like, 
straight in the car, drove down there. These people met me at the back gate of the O2. Next thing, I'm sitting next to him. So it's got Dana White on the thing and Eddie Hearn. I'm like, blimey. So, and they like, AJ, yeah. and like, they were behind me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were going, how's he sitting there? So, um, and again, like, I can only take people off face value. Dana has been incredibly hospitable to me. You know, the hospitality he showed me that night, he talked me through everything, you know, explained the fighters, the yeah. techniques, everything. And I was, I was fascinated by it because it's only when you become educated about sport, you start to actually understand the beauty of it. To me, as an outsider, as a casual, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a tear up and it's violent and you don't necessarily understand the different disciplines and skills involved. So I became a fan. The energy was great. Different kind of audience, you know, just in the respect of, you know, that they knew who I was, but it wasn't like being at a boxing match where I, you know, and, and even AJ and other, other people that were there. Um, just interesting watching the ring walks, the time between fights, you know, the trust, the lighting, the screens. What was you know, your biggest takeaway? What did you like the most from what you saw? I liked the consistency in terms of the speed of fights coming in. Sometimes across our production, we'll feel too much. Mm. And sometimes you can lose the flow. I don't know if that's generic across all UFC events, but it was, you know, fight's over, quick interview, two minutes, little bit of music, ring walk. Yep. Right? And, and that's, that's a nice flow. Surprising that the fighters don't get introed before the ring walk, very different to boxing. Mm -hmm. You just hear some music and what's going on? I, I, yeah. I didn't really get it. And then he's by the cage or she's by the cage and right. then they get introed in the ring. Um, just a good energy, you know, good energy, good product. Um, so yeah, I, I sat there, I watched the whole thing. Like I'm a big Molly McCann fan. She's, you know, she does work with us and I love Molly and Paddy, I don't really know, but I love his energy and, you know, and Aspinall and all these guys. and. You know, it's, I think it's made Dana, I think he was saying, you know, during the night, I think I have to come back here. You know, all the UK guys have won. So, you know, I guess they'll be back in the summer or whatever. And um, I really enjoyed it. It's just nice to see something different and always learning, always talking, always learning, always thinking. And, um, you know, you, you can learn a lot from, from those events. When you were watching, were you like, hmm, MMA, I like this? I don't know. I mean, pe people always say to me, and we've had loads of approaches from investment company, we'd like you, you know, could you back an MMA project? And it's like, people talk about Dana in boxing and you have to have a passion. Like for, personally, I love boxing. I've been around boxing since I was eight years old, right? And I have such a huge passion for the sport that I can sit at ringside, scream and shout and just be totally engrossed in what I'm watching. And I see that in him. Mm. You know, oh, oh, you know, still, you can, as many fights as you watch, to still have that passion and energy, and that's the love for what you do. So I, I find it difficult to get involved with something that I don't have the same passion for, and I don't yet have that passion for MMA. I, I'm a fan now, I think, sort of borderline, but who knows in time? But, you know, I don't think Dana could have that same passion and energy in boxing, to be honest with you. And I don't think I could have it in he's MMA. He's tried to get into boxing. Yeah, he's done a few bits and pieces. But yeah. again, like the model's different. Yeah, Obviously, the, totally you know, the, 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 the balance sheet is different. Everything's different. And the control is different. And I go back to the building of the brand. What they've done so well, Dana and the UFC, is create a model that's not totally reliant on talent. You know, in boxing, you kind of rely on talent, really, whether it's Canelo or AJ or Fury. like you, And... But I, I kind of get the feeling with UFC, they want to create stars, but they want to just, you know, and like once you get someone who's outspoken and powerful, like Connor, mm -hmm. it becomes a nightmare for them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's day to day in our world because we're dealing with egos, personalities, agents, managers, and, and everything. And, and we probably, we don't, we let them get out of that, that box where I feel like the UFC do a great job to almost like the brand is bigger than the fighter. 100%. Would you ever want to institute a uniform? Have all the fighters like wear the a, same like thing? Like a universal contract on fighters and stuff? No, no, like no, that. like literally wear the same thing. Oh, right. Uh, no. You noticed that, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I like f fighters to create their own personality and individuality, and I feel a lot of that can come within their fight kit, mm. you know, and, and their ring walk music and, and the way they express themselves. Um, we're involved with 10 other sports. You know, we're, we're governing bodies in many of those sports, and, you know, I understand the, I understand the system. Um, I don't think it hurts what they're doing. You know, that, that's the UFC model. But for me, I like to see the individuality of, 
know, whether it's Katie Taylor, you know the kit that Katie Taylor wears. That's her colours. Mm -hmm. You know, that's her ring walk. That that's her, uh, you know, her training kit at, at media day and stuff like that. And it's a good way for a fighter to express their own personality. So I was talking about Taylor Serrano, and there's three things that I love so much about this, and and I know you've echoed some of this. Obviously, Madison Square Garden, 143 year history. Two women have never headlined in boxing or MMA. Obviously, MMA is newer, but still significant. Now, there might be some person in Liverpool who doesn't care about MSG, and that doesn't mean anything to them. Well, how about the fact that it's number one versus number two? Mm. That never happens. 2008 was the last time in boxing that it happens. It never happens in MMA either. Maybe one time in 2014 with Daniel Cormier and John Jones. I'm trying to explain to mm. this audience mm. why this is a big deal. Mm. And then, oh, by the way, if this audience doesn't care about any of that, it's a co-promotion. And that mm. never happens in, mm. in our sport as well. It's MVP and it's Matchroom. And I know you guys are pushing it, you know, mm. doing all the, but you know, it's significant that she's a Jake Paul fighter mm. and Nikisa involved. Amanda, I'm talking about mm. all these things make for this to be such a historic, massive moment. I feel it in this city. Like, mm. I, I mm. are you now? You've been here a couple of days. Yeah. Are you surprised? I can't believe it. You can't believe no. it. No. I mean, yesterday we went to the Empire State Building. Um, I'm being explained what's happening. They're going to light up this model and they're going to put the Irish colours around this just this model Empire State Building model and Puerto Rico at the top. And I said, oh, that's nice. And they said, yeah, on Saturday, we'll, we will light up this building with Ireland and Puerto Rico colours. I'm like, can I pretend that's my idea? Yeah. You know, and, and it was just, like that just, that shows you in itself. The Today Show, those, yeah. those got, the, the, the girls were on yesterday. I can't get fighters on the Today Show, you know, in a standard event. The, the media that are here this week, the different kind of media, like it is incredible how big this fight has become. And you know, when we talk about women's sport, there is a real consistency among broadcasters and, and commercial organizations to think let's support women's sport because it's a good look yeah. it's a box ticked this breaks through the barriers of that and katie taylor has taught me that you know that that mindset of it's a good look that's not equality that's disrespectful to women's sport women's sport and women's boxing needs to maintain its position through quality through demand through viewership, through ticket sales. That's how you create a sustainable product and longevity in a sport. And that's the most pleasing thing about this. We won't sell out Madison Square Garden because all those people are going, oh, I'm gonna buy a ticket to support women's boxing. They're buying a ticket to watch a great fight. This is Mayweather against Pacquiao of women's boxing. Undisputed champion against seven division world champion. It can only be a thriller, but you couple that with the history of Madison Square Garden never having a female boxer headline, the biggest female fight of all time, Puerto Rico, Ireland, you know, Brooklyn, Amanda Serrano, Jake Paul, me, the zone, you getting involved. And for the first time in a mega fight, I've never felt so much goodwill, mm. even in the boxing community, but particularly outside of that community, in sport, in entertainment, we've seen the WWE mm. really get behind this event as well. You, yourself, MMA, everybody. There's never a feeling of goodwill in a, in a boxing fight. Everyone hopes that it, someone pulls out or it rains in an outdoor show or that's the world that we live in. But this is very different and it feels great to be a small part of that. But also, you know, you want to get deeper and you talk about inspiring the next generation, inspiring athletes, young people. I have two daughters. I, I want to talk to them about this fight and show them two great athletes that had a dream, worked so hard and was told this wasn't possible. Watch them shine on Saturday night, you know, and, and even beyond young women, young girls, anyone who has a dream, anyone who's told it's not possible, anyone who works hard enough to achieve what they, what no one ever thought could be done on Saturday night, you're going to see it. And I always said to Katie, one day, one day you're going to headline the Madison Square Garden. You know, you're going to make seven figures and we're going to, but it's just something that I say, you know, I, I was part of her dream. I'll be very proud on Saturday night. You know, it's, it's, it's turning into, and I said to Bob Aram, and I said to ESPN, whatever you do, do not do a show on this night. You will get crushed. And we're seeing it before our eyes. Stevenson against Valdez, I'll give him some promotion now. Great fight. No one's talking about it outside of boxing. This is the moment, Saturday night, the world will stop to watch this fight. Luckily, they're not going head to head. It seems like there's some. But but still, why go on the same night? No, no, the I fight agree was that. already announced. We were on sale. Yeah. Now I agree with everything you said, and I share your enthusiasm. I have one gripe, mm. if I can, 
I don't like the two minute rounds. Yeah. This was the fight to make it. And Amanda threw down the challenge. Katie, I spoke to her yesterday, the face to face. Uh, she said it was a money thing. That was mm. her response. I want to get paid for three minute rounds. Mm. So it sounds like. No, I think, to be honest with you, women's boxing should be you, three you minute know, rounds. You know what? No? I'll tell you one thing about the pay in women's boxing the duration of the rounds has absolutely no regard for the amount of money these fighters get paid. I'm just saying, the perception is it does. But that's what no, she said, by yeah, the way. Yeah, but there's actually no. Mm -hmm commercial benefit, other than it's a nice story, you know, will a broadcaster pay more for three minute rounds? No. Will more people buy tickets for three minute rounds? Not really. So right now, if it's not broke, don't fix it, okay? In time, I agree with you. I think we need to evolve and make sure that the very elite end of the sport is three minute rounds. But I will also say this, when you're introducing something into a market, Fast-paced content is always good. Mm -hmm. Now, we've seen it with prize fighters, something we used to do when we were trying to grow boxing back to where it should be. You've seen it in cricket with 2020, other sports that are adopting that. Two-minute rounds is great action, right? Because you've got two minutes. You know, you've got to win the round. And they come out, the pace is much faster, but you will see more stoppages across three-minute rounds. I didn't feel that now was the time we needed to introduce that. There'd be a lot more talk about it being a three-minute round than actually focusing on what this is which is a huge, huge fight. So I agree with you in time. Now that the audience for women's boxing is becoming more educated, more invested, I think we can definitely look at that. I have to say I'm a little blown away by the fact that Katie is the underdog as of right Slight now. Slight underdog, yeah. How do you feel about that? I like it. It's great being the underdog, isn't it? I mean, I've never seen her more focused for a fight. This is, you know, this is her garden. This is her house. This is what she's all about. And the last two fights, I think people look at her last two fights and say, hmm. maybe slight decline? Motivation for me, you know, I think she would always say she's motivated, but this is what she's all about. You know, I just watched them down at the media workout. Serrano looks so strong, you know, huge puncher. Katie looks so fast, so determined. I'm going for a Katie Taylor stoppage in this fight. I think she's going to stop Amanda Serrano late in a thriller, but it will be a thriller, you know, only that. And that's been part of this whole journey with Katie where proving the naysayers wrong, <sighs> women's boxing. Oh, you know, my dad is a Hall of Fame promoter. If he's honest, when I started with Katie Taylor, he, he felt, felt as many bobs the same, women shouldn't box, you know? No, it's not, not for me. He watched Katie Taylor, he was a fan from day one. Mm. So it's been easy for me to roll her out and give her the platform and say to people, just watch. And what I'm saying to you about Saturday night is just watch and you'll be a fan for life. Is there an immediate rematch clause? If There's the, if a fight is commercially viable. So it's not immediate. You know, the fight has to warrant paying, you know, the numbers that need to be paid for the rematch. Personally, you may see this two or three times. It'll be that good. Um, but we want to win. And that's, that's always what it comes down to, winning. You know, taking part's beautiful. I mean, we should always advise our children and all those wonderful people that it's great to take part, better to win. That's how, that's how I was brought up. And that's all that matters on Saturday night. Oh, it's amazing. Biggest fight in women's box history. What a moment for boxing. Win. Go out there and win. And she will do everything she can to win on Saturday. Uh, just a few more minutes left with you. I appreciate the time very much, despite the, the tardy jokes. Um, I do want to ask you about Tyson. Tyson Fury mm -hmm. won last weekend. You were not there. Oh. He did call you the next day, yeah. rubbing it in and whatnot. You don't believe him that he's retiring, correct? And we're not just talking about retiring from, you know, he's saying I'm retired from the actual official bouts, but I'll do a Francis and Gandhi. You just don't believe him he's retiring, right? I don't really believe anything he says, but <laughs> he's, he also is capable of doing anything. Right. And ultimately, it's on him. If he wants to walk away from boxing now, good on him. It's a very tough sport. You know, he's made a lot of money, he's won the World Heavyweight Championship, and if he's happy doing that, good luck to him. I just feel that his biggest fights are in front of him. You know, like the, the, the real career-defining, legacy-defining stuff. Because there's a lot of talk at the moment about, you know, him being a generational great and better than Lennox Lewis and, you know, these fighters of the past. He may be, but he ain't got the resume to prove it yet. He could do. If he beats... AJ, if he beats Usyk, or certainly the winner of that fight, he goes down as an undisputed champion, a Lennox Lewis style, 
you know, legacy, generational great. But he's a really good fighter. Like sometimes people get it confused with, hey, I just feel that when you look at resumes, AJ's got a great resume. Is he a generational great heavyweight? No. But if he can beat Usyk and if he can beat Fury, he goes down as an all-time great. That's what he's chasing. But it comes back to our earlier conversation. What do you want? How bad do you want it? Maybe he don't want it anymore. But I would love to see Fury, who may well be in his prime, fight AJ, fight Usyk. You know, he's great for boxing. But, you know, he's, he's had his, a great run and maybe he's had enough. But I don't believe him. I, you know, the Nganu fight. So what do you think? I was just about to ask you about that. What do you think the chances are of that happening? It's a big fight. You know, I mean... You think it happens or do you think I, it's I just I actually talking? don't, know. You I, don't think I, it happens? I don't. But Why? I, I don't know... The contractual situation. I think Tyson Fury's up with ESPN or about to be, and, yep. and Garnu's up with the UFC. Maybe Dana comes in and does it himself. You know, maybe I do it with Dana, or maybe I don't, I don't know. Are you interested? Yeah, I'm interested in any big fight that does that does big numbers. I'm not really interested as a boxing purist because it's a. Do you think it's a mismatch? Yeah, yeah. No chance, Francis has. I mean, they're big boys. One punch can change everything. I actually prefer I prefer Dillian White against Ngannou. Mm. Maybe with a little bit of mixed mixed hybrid rules, you know, because Dillian White is a kickboxer, he can he can grapple as well, and you know, I don't know, but any, anything like that, it's exciting. I mean, Fury against Ngannou, Dillian White. Who's the against baddest Ngannou. man on the planet? Yeah, truly, oh, yeah, once big, and for big, all. Yeah. I mean, this this sells itself, yeah, right? It does. Big fight, big fight. But it's the contracts. It's you know, I mean, can't imagine Dana doing a fight with Bob Aaron. Mm. You know, um, don't know how long the contracts are. Is Ngannou going to resign? You know, you follow all these things, not only in boxing, but you know the Ngannou situation. I would be very surprised if Dana, if if Ngannou left the UFC without Dana White having some kind of involvement or control. Mm. Now you mentioned AJ. Is 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 July twenty third a done deal? Him and Usyk. That's probably the the favorite date at the moment. Um, UFC planning on doing a show in yeah, London on yes. that day. I spoke to Dana. I wasn't going to say anything because I didn't know that was common knowledge. But well, I, spoke, I, reported, I, spoke, yeah, yeah. I spoke to Dana about it. What, how do you feel about this? Um, we're just talking about um, time zones, really. You know, and he was. He said, look, I'm looking at that. Is that your date? And I said, it's not really done yet, but it could be a date. So we'll work around that. You know, if, if that, that date is actually a date that it would take place in the Middle East, so the main event would probably be closer to 9 p.m., so, you know, they could go Meaning later. yours? Yeah. Yeah. yeah which, Saudi? Possibly. Mm. Um, quite a few offers come in from there. And, you know, it's a split, this fight, financial split between the two. We, I'd love the fight in London. So would AJ, because we feel like it's a nice advantage as well. Yeah. But there's twice as much money, maybe three times as much really? money to do it elsewhere. And obviously, when Usyk's on a financial split of the deal, they're not going to just take it in London because AJ would prefer it there. So those negotiations are ongoing. You will see the fight in July, 100%, and, and AJ's pumped for it. You know, he's he's ready. He watched the fight last weekend. He wants to get in there. So you guys won't be head-to-head, -head, basically, is, is I think I think the relationship, I mean, it's a different audience anyway, Ariel, to be yeah. honest with you. And but I feel like... like the, the, it's the, a the... massive... AJ Usyk is a huge fight for the UK. The whole UK will watch that fight. So whether BT or whoever's airing that fight in the UK says, or oh, it's not a great day, I don't know. But, you know, I just said to Dana... Let's have some dinner next week and um, we'll talk through it. The great thing about it is the relationship that we have mm. is a sensible one. So it's not like, right, oh, I'm, I'm not talking to him. We're going anyway. No, we're going anyway. And next thing, it's like, you know, so we'll, we'll work together to find a solution. And, of course, you'll be in Vegas next week mm -hmm. for Canelo Bivol. Yes. And UFC has a huge pay-per-view next weekend as well. Are you going to be looking at, you know, we joked about the time that he had to sit it. in yeah, the back. Yeah. But still, I mean... Will you even be aware of what's going on? I think they're conversations that, that you know, they're, they're sensible conversations that should take place. And again, when you've got that kind of relationship, it's very easy for me to say to Dana, look, I don't know what time, you know, what time are you going? Maybe we could just, you know, and we can help each other. You know, I mean, there's crossover to these things. They are different audiences, but ultimately there are crossover between UFC and, and fight fans. Um, of course. And it doesn't benefit anyone going head to head. But also we live in a world where there are so many shows. So much, I mean, how many UFC shows are there? It's like every week, there seems to be a big pay-per-view that's conflicting with a boxing event. Every time Canelo fights, we, we, we see this. So Canelo is a beast in the ring and commercially. And it's almost one of them where you don't really have any fear against about what you're up against because that audience is incredibly passionate 
and you know, it's, we obviously know it's a huge Hispanic audience as well. So, but we'll we'll, we'll talk. But I think probably it's a bit late in the day now to start looking at next week. And um, you know, sometimes the, that noise across social actually impacts and benefits the two shows. Oh, who's going to go first? Or what's he's waiting for him? Oh, the UFC waiting for Canelo. Oh, Canelo's going to ring. Well, oh, the UFC's holding their main event. Oh, Dana's watching the Canelo fight on laptop. You know, these these are this is noise that that reverberates around the world. So you know. Um, I think uh, it's always always smart to have a sensible conversation. One last thing before I let you go. I'm just curious, you know, that Mick Conlon fight a couple of mm. weeks ago, I mean, one of the best fights that mm. I've ever seen. I was I was glued. I even brought my boys to come watch with me. I was like, just mm. watch, please mm. watch this. They're not big fight fans. They're young, 10 and 8. But when you see the way it ends, is there any part of you, I know you love boxing. Mm. And, you know, as we talk about you, the dad and whatnot, is there any part of you that's like you get a feeling in your stomach I don't know if I could stomach this. Thankfully, it all worked because out. Because of its brutality. Just the way it, it was scary there yeah, for a minute, I've, right? I've, I've um, you know, I remember when I was about 10 or 11, there was a fight called Jim McDonald, and he was like one of my heroes. I used to go around his house, watch him train, like, you know, train with him in the gym and mess around. And he boxed a guy called Kenny Vice at Royal Albert Hall. And he got hit by a left hook, and he got knocked unconscious from the left hook, and he, his head hit the rope which was where I was sitting. And he was unconscious. Back then, you know, in terms of the, the care for fighters from the governing body was really poor. Mm -hmm. He got carried out of the ring unconscious on a table and then went back to his change room, which I followed him in. And he was unconscious on the table for minutes with his eyes open. And I, I, was, I was here, I was 11. Wow. Now I felt that he, he was dead. And Michael Watson's injury. I mean, you, you see it time and time again. And Unfortunately, the passing of Patrick Day, you know, a, a few years ago in Chicago was, was on my show and I witnessed, you know, all these things unfold. It's something that's very hard to explain to people. You know, when, when you talk about mixed martial arts or boxing, how do you convince someone that it's, you know, <laughs> that, that boxing, where the art of a fight is to render your, your opponent unconscious ultimately, or the same with MMA, or to, you know, to put him in a position where physically he can't breathe or he can't take any more. How do you explain that as, as a norm or something that should be allowed? But it's, it's, a, it's an unwritten code for people that take part in, in the sport where they understand the risks of the sport. Nothing ever makes it easier. Nothing ever takes away the pain of seeing someone getting injured in the sport. But brutally, it's something that is accepted when I went to the UFC London, I couldn't believe that people were celebrating teams when an opponent, I mean, when Molly McCann, yeah. you know, knocked that girl out, yeah. she was out. Mm. And Molly, you know, no, no disrespect to Molly, was running around the ring. Every, you know, whenever I get, Mick Conlon was a good example, got in the ring, I said to the guys, stop, calm, you know, and everyone stopped immediately. We waited for them to get medical care. But it seems to almost be more widely accepted in MMA because no one was bothered. No one was, like in boxing, there's a real feel in the community where the, the whole arena went hush yeah. for Mick Conlon, praying for Mick Conlon, and thank the Lord he was, he was okay. But in this environment, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Everyone was going on like, and, and a minute later, she's still unconscious on the floor, you know? So no answer to your question how do i feel about it you know when when patrick day passed away it took me a, a, quite a long time i didn't know the young man i've met him at a press conference a couple of days before Be beautiful young man but if that happened to someone who was a friend of mine or i was closely associated with it would be very very difficult to take but you know every show you know we we have to thank these fighters and these warriors and we pray for them that whatever happens, and same with Taylor Serrano on Saturday night, we pray that both fighters leave the ring unscathed in what is a very brutal sport. We must keep evolving, keep doing everything we can to make the sport safer. You know, I talk about fighters getting carried out on tables. Now, you know, the medical care from the British Boxing Board of Control is outstanding. What they gave to Mick Conlon, straight in, oxygen. Still today, sometimes I go to commissions in America where they don't administer oxygen in the ring from, from when a fighter's in trouble. I can't believe it. The first thing a fighter needs in that situation is oxygen to the brain. Mm. You know, we have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing for the safety of fighters. And, and luckily, particularly in the UK, that is, that is you know, we're, we're really at, at, at in a good place in terms of safety for fighters. 
It's always an honor when you stop by. Press conference tomorrow at the yeah. Hulu Theater. Can't believe it's only Wednesday. I mean, and, and you got you you know you did the face to face. Face to face. I think it's coming out tonight. I was yeah. told. I'm very excited about that. I'm also excited. Just a little teaser. I believe a face to face with Jake Paul and Eddie Hearn. And I'm I, you know I'm not going to go there right now. I'm going to save it for tomorrow. I feel like there's some underlying tension there between you guys. Really? I feel I like know. there's, I saw the real sports segment. I saw what you yeah. said. I've heard he's not too happy. I, I, I feel, really? I yes. I didn't know that, yeah. I, yeah, well, I feel I said, like there's something there. I promoted his debut. Yeah, I know, so I know. I started this mess. Yeah, but yeah. I don't, it was very, it was very cordial leading up. I feel like it's not really? going to be, yeah, what do you think? I know That's you were with him yesterday. We'll do, we'll you were, do it for fun. He I said know. yesterday he wanted to smash, you know, you guys were smashing oh, yeah, the yeah, cake. Yeah, yeah. He made a joke. I don't know if it went over. Oh, really? He said, well, smash me. Yeah. Well, look, I'm 105 kgs. If I can lose another 10, yeah. I'll give him a fight in September. There you go. All you right. Know, maybe people will tune in. Thank you so much. Cheers, See you tomorrow. Thank, Thank you for doing you. this. Thank really appreciate it. There he is, Eddie Hearn, the head man over at Matchroom Boxing. We'll keep this uh, train rolling along here because now we've got the EVP of DAZN, Mr. Joe Markowski. Good Hello, morning. Joe. How are, How are you? Good, this is great. Us. Thank you, Eddie, for stopping by. And now we've got the big uh, the big boss man here. Thank you for doing this. Well, I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Thanks for having us. And we're delighted to be working with you this week. Yes. I should say, in the interest of full transparency, mm. doing a little stuff for DAZN. So I want everyone to know that we did the face-to-face -face yesterday with Katie and Amanda, which was fun. Different dynamic. Obviously, it's not uh, Jake Paul and Tyron Woodley who hate yeah. each other. But I think the the Jake and Eddie one tomorrow is going to be very spicy. Well, yeah, I heard that conversation. Yes. I think um, I think Jake's probably got tougher work somewhere else, uh, oh. in either a, in a ring or an MMA octagon yeah. uh, than Eddie Hearn. I saw Eddie go with uh, Frank Smith. I thought, uh, you know. Yeah, different weight categories, those two, true, for true. sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, the Eddie and, and Frank are doing a great job. Jake's, I mean, the addition of Jake and MVP to this promotion has been fantastic for us. It's one of the ingredients that makes this fight truly quite special, um, as is your involvement this week. So we're, uh, we're very excited going to Saturday. Pretty historic moment for women's sport more broadly. Yes, and I want to talk about that. But first, you know, for the audience that may not be so familiar with you, mm. you are under 35, 34, 33? I'm 34, yeah. 34. Yeah. You're the executive vice president of DAZN. Yeah. Uh, I believe SBJ named you top 40 under 40. Yeah, you're embarrassing me now. I mean, it's pretty yeah. damn impressive. No, it's good. I'm, I'm very lucky to have been uh, right place, right time with DAZN at a young age. Um, DAZN, How long have you been with DAZN? Well, DAZN originally came out of a company called Perform Group. I was with them for, I've been there 10, 12 years now. 11, yeah, 11, 12 years. Um, and a group of us split off and, and started DAZN. Um, in 2015 prior to a launch in 2016. So it's grown from there. I've been lucky. I've been around the world. I lived in Japan for two years launching our business there. Um, and a lot of people, I think, in the States, for obvious reasons, sort of think DAZN is just a boxing business or a fight sports business. We're, we're a lot more than that in other parts of the world. In, in different countries, we have a much broader uh, set of content. So Canada, where you mm -hmm. hail from, we're a leading NFL broadcaster, a bunch of European soccer content as well. So uh, fight sports is central to our business, but it's not everything we do. When, when the pandemic hit, mm. how worried were you about the state of the business? Uh, pretty worried because the state of the industry was, was pretty treacherous there for a while. Um, many industries around the world obviously got hit pretty, pretty significantly by COVID. Sport, I think, more than most. Um, we had to navigate it. We actually, I think, ended up using it to our benefit. We reset a few things. We've uh, reworked relationships, people like Eddie. We had tough but important conversations with. Uh, for our boxing business, I think it was, we got it back on our feet quite quickly. It was only like two or three months, I think, without any content. Um, but we, we were at a point where it could have gone one or two ways for a couple of months. Um, I'm proud we sort of stepped through it. And it's testament to the efforts of everyone involved, media, journalists, fighters in particular, commissions, promoters. Um, it was a group effort to get back on uh, get back online, really, and, and get back to producing content and, and delivering for, for fight fans. And that's what we've done, I think, pretty consistently at a high level since since we got back in sort of summer of 2020. So, I recognize this is a tough question. And, and you know, you're, you're obviously coming from a place where you're working for the company, so you're somewhat mm. biased. But if you could tell me, like, your feelings on the state of the business right now, the state of the business that you are in, the OTT business, the boxing business, which is such a big part of at least the zone in mm. North America and in the US in particular. How do you feel about how healthy it is right now? Well, I think it's interesting. Streaming beyond sport more broadly has obviously become the preferred consumption method um, for most people in developed media countries like the US or Canada or the UK. Uh, apart from maybe the older generation is still on linear television. Um, if you look at Wall Street stuff and valuations, that's been flying for a while. 
um, there's now a challenge to that saying, okay, how, how can you develop your relationships with consumers? How can you find ways to engage them in different ways? So uh, we announced a, a betting uh, opportunity yes. and a, a partnership last week. That will be a major part of our business going forward. Now, will that just be in Canada to start? No, it will be in, um, it will be led out of our major markets, Germany, um, the UK, uh, Spain, Germany, Italy. US? And, well, the US is different, obviously, it's state by state regulation. Mm-hmm. So we need to tread state by state okay. there. It's pretty easier to roll out in different parts of the world where betting's more evolved. But even with Netflix, so they're looking at advertising. So I think those businesses, ourselves being one, are looking for new ways to develop relationships with consumers and, and find ways to um, make our products more sticky, i.e. you want to spend more time on them with different services. So I think that's the next phase of OTT. How can we how can we make the experience of watching on a streaming platform significantly better and different to watching on a traditional linear television? The criticism I would make of our business and the industry of sports streaming more broadly is what have we actually done fundamentally to change the consumer experience? 10 years ago, if you were watching um, any sports broadcast on ESPN or Sky Sports in the UK or BT Sport, uh, you would have done so just leaning back in your television watch, watching a linear channel. That's what most people still do now. There's not a significant change in terms of user experience. What we have the opportunity to do now with new technologies and uh, the reduction of latency is to make that experience significantly better than watching on a on a linear platform. Um, betting, communication with friends, alternative broadcast streams, what we're doing with Canelo and uh, Barstool Sports next week, which we should talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a number of things we can layer into the broadcast that, that traditional linear television could not do. And I think that is where you significantly enhance the, the quality of the user experience. And that's where the user, the consumer, the fan, ultimately gets more value out of a product like ours versus a traditional linear television network. Um, so that's where I think streaming is going. And I think that's the sort of state of the industry right now. There's a lot of exciting things going on. Obviously, there's this weekend's fight. There's next weekend, Canelo. Mm. It seems like every, I love the UK cards in particular because it's a Saturday afternoon. Yeah. And, uh, you still get to bed early. Oh, it's tremendous. And yeah. it doesn't usually coincide with the UFC stuff yeah. going on Saturday. Yeah. It, it feels like every weekend there's a big fight on zone. So as far as boxing is concerned, it feels like you guys are firing on all cylinders. But as you know, we are an MMA show. Yeah. And so I'm really curious about, I was at that first press conference. I remember when you guys made the announcement, June of 2018 with yeah. Bellator. Yeah. And I believe it was a five-year deal yeah, it was. with Bellator. And then it just kind of like slowly fizzled away over the last, you know, year or so. Well, what happened with Bellator? Well, look, we had a great relationship. I think Scott Coke is one of the best promoters in that we've worked with in, in any fight sport. We have a great relationship with him personally. Um, look, without wanting to go into any like specific contractual stuff, um, it was a it was a consequence of COVID that that, that came to an end. Um, uh, we we're disappointed it did, um, but it ultimately was was agreed between us and Bellator that we'd step away from that. We're playing a very niche game now in the US. Like I mentioned Japan and Germany and Italy. We're playing multi-sport broadcast games. We're buying rights to various sports. Our strategy with good reason in the US is to focus specifically on one significant carved out niche, which is boxing. Um, and that's what we've chosen to do. Uh, I think Bellator are in great hands. They've obviously got a, a parent company that could give them a, a great distribution on broadcast and give them space to grow in a way that maybe we were not going to give them. Um, so I think for for both sides it was it was the right deal and we've we've agreed that and sort of shook hands and, and wished each other well. Um, yeah, that's that's where we're at and I think our, our, we're very happy in the US for the next sort of medium term, call it three or four years, to focus on boxing. You're right to say our, our boxing business is strong. I mean, Eddie wants to do a show a week. Yeah, it's almost like reining him in because he's rabid on that stuff. Um, with the U- UK, our Spanish and Italian deals are match room, our relationship with Golden Boy, which gives us a lot of sort of West Coast. Mexican American and Hispanic focused shows. Um, yeah, we're, we're 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 doing great things, and I think we're serving boxing fans in particular with a very strong regular output of, of content, which makes us pretty confident we're the, the best value play in, in fight sports for those fans. And again, you know, obviously the the natural follow up is because it wasn't just Bellator; there was KSW on there for mm. a bit as well. Mm. Any chance of MMA returning to the zone or yeah, for the foreseeable I mean, the, future? The, the, the door is open, but I think sometimes, and you're probably better placed than most to, to point to this, I think the crossover between MMA fans and boxing fans sometimes gets slightly exaggerated. Mm. I think they're slightly, they're, they're separate audiences. There is, of course, like a, a crossover. I'm um, trying my best to bridge the gap, but you're, you're you know, doing a great I'll job. have Canelo on the show and people are like, who's that? I'm like, yeah. what? Yeah, you don't exactly. know. Um, no, I think there's, the crossover gets exaggerated. We're, look, we, we are, we've still got work to do to, to, 
reach out to, make ourselves known to boxing fans in the US. We're only four or five years old. This takes a long time in this country. It's a big old country with a lot going on. So we're going to focus on on continuing to do that. Um, and look, the door's always open for new content opportunities, but uh, we're going to put the majority of our resources towards boxing in, in, in the medium term because we think there's a good business opportunity there. Now, this is very uh, inside baseball, so to speak, but I love this stuff when it comes to journalism. Mm. One thing that I really like about what you guys do and, I'm, and I would say this even if you weren't sitting here, and in particular from you know your website perspective and your social media perspective is, like I've seen you guys this week tweet about Stevenson Valdez. Yeah. I've seen you guys talk about Fury. I've seen you guys talk about other things that have mm. nothing to do with zone. Mm. Without getting too far into it, I just came from a network that wouldn't do that. No. You know what I mean? They wouldn't talk about the other things, the comp, you know, competition, the 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 counter programming, if you will. Why does the zone feel like it's important to do that sort of thing, even if it's something that's not on your network or on your platform? Because we're serving consumers, fans who don't care about politics of broadcasters and promoters. They are boxing fans, right? And they want to know what's going on in boxing. Um, it would be strange for us not to talk. I think I, I look at it completely the other way. It'd be strange for us not to talk about it. If if our goal is to serve boxing fans. Um, with as much content to keep them interested in our social channels, our platform, our subscription prices. Um, why would you not give them what they want to what they want to eat? And they want to eat boxing and drink. You realise that's not the norm. I, I get it, and yeah. I, I, I'm surprised the opportunity for us to sort of fill that market gap exists. Um, it, it is strange. Um, it's definitely not something done elsewhere. Um, for us, it's great because we we, we fill a we fill a void and. Um, you know, our teams occasionally like what you know. People ask why are we promoting this fight. It's like, well, we're doing it for indirect reasons. If you want to talk about the business reasons for it, ultimately it's to maintain a relationship with the consumer. But really, we want to be a destination for the sports we cover in any in any way we can be. Um, so we want the zone, under the zone banner a boxing fan to feel like he or she is being served with everything boxing. So we're going to continue to invest in it. We'll be at fight weeks. We're not broadcasting live. We'll carry content internationally that we don't have in the US from US fight, if we, if we can, if it makes business sense. Um, our journalists, we have a DAZN news outlet, that they'll be covering everything. Um, yeah, it's a full service offer for boxing fans. It's a similar thing with uh, soccer fans in Germany or soccer fans in Japan. We're covering soccer for those guys. So it's a business-wide sort of strategy. Um, I'm surprised that people are surprised by it in the US on boxing because it makes common sense for me. Um, yeah, I don't know why others don't do it. Do you pay attention, you know, I, I, we remember that famous scene, I was talking about it with Eddie last time he was on, uh, UFC's at Madison Square Garden, Canelo's in the locker room, mm. and I think DAZN took a little bit of heat for making we him did, wait. Yeah, yeah. that was you, a stressful couple of hours for me personally. Yeah, yeah. How, how, do you regret that? Um, yeah, I, th I think we're, we're pretty honest about, you know, we can talk about other things, we're not going to shy away from but we've learned. Boxing's a very different proposition to other content. We're sports broadcast, sports media people, Five years ago, we didn't have many major operations in boxing. I think our first sort of foray into boxing was, if you, you know, McGregor Mayweather was probably the biggest boxing event. And even some hardcore boxing fans would say that was a, a circus, right? That was our first experience of boxing. We sort of whet our appetite to think this could be actually impactful for our business. Um, so we've made some mistakes and I think we've owned them. We've held our hands up. Um, I think fight sports as a whole gets in its own way a little bit. Should a Canelo fight clash with a major UFC card? Uh, no, because of that, there is a crossover audience there, not as big as perhaps it's made out to be, and maybe that's one of the things we learned in that process. We, we pissed off more people than we pleased, I think, in doing that, and we apologised for it pretty pretty immediately. Um, yeah, I just chalk it up to one of the things we learn. I don't think we do it again. We try and avoid clashing. I think this weekend's a good example. I saw Eddie try and take credit for it, but it was a zone conversation with ESPN to, oh, tell us. to avoid the clash. And look, shout out to our friends at ESPN. Um, when we became aware there was going to be a, a clash, obviously they're West Coast, they're in Vegas, we're on the East Coast. We, yeah. had, we had a very simple, very quick conversation that resulted in us agreeing. How does that work? Like clash. you actually get on the phone with yeah. them? And really? They, these are people who speak the same language as us, run a very similar business. Were they open to, to it? Yeah, 100%. And, and They'd be silly not to it. For this particular fight, well, you're the A-side. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't even know even looking like that. It wasn't even a conversation about who's got more leverage. It was more like this is sensible to serve both our audiences and to your point earlier about us covering the full sport. We're doing our bit, not that we're as big as ESPN in driving audiences, but we're, we're, we're doing a good job to, to push our audience to watch that if they want to after, after our broadcast and our social channels will promote it. Um, 
as will our, our journalistic output. So um, again, another thing that makes sense to me. I just want clearly whether we can to help boxing get out of its own way mm-hmm. um, and I think that's a small way that we can do it avoid clashes wherever possible so when it comes to a Katie Taylor and Amanda Serrano mm-hmm. fight is it Eddie coming to you guys and saying like I can make this deal with MVP or are you guys saying to him how involved are you in the making we're of this we're pretty involved fight? I mean obviously they're the experts in matchmaking and they have the relationships with the fighters most of the time um, well, they, lead, they, they lead all the relationships with the fighters but there's, there's an ongoing dialogue about you know who we'd want to see fight there's a you know game of chess we play about making sure we're uh, lining people up for the fights that matter. There's a sequencing argument: what, what makes most sense from a design perspective? Where are we going to drive value from? Um, we're increasingly sophisticated in understanding how boxing drives our business and what not to do and what to do. And we're obviously educating our promotional partners about that as we go. A lot of that is listening to fans. So um, we will, you'll see us regularly on social media as will Eddie, to be fair, proactively asking for feedback. We did that, particularly the UK. I'm sure you've noticed UK fight fans are mm-hmm. particularly vocal and they're not shy of an opinion on Twitter. We'll go out looking for that because we, we literally screenshot those tweets or those Instagram comments and the ones that have 150 likes or get retweeted or are consistent, we will go and drive a conversation about that and we, we use that data to educate Eddie, to educate Golden Boy about what we want to see and what we need to do better and different. So... Um, it's a proactive listening exercise for us that we use pretty, pretty regularly and pretty consistently to to help educate us and our, our partners. Are you surprised at how big this has become? This particular fight? No, um, I'm not because I think it's it represents more than the boxing fight. I think it's reflective of a broader and growing interest in women's sport more generally. Um, we've been investing in women's sport for a long time. Uh, before the zone, we had a 10-year deal with the WTA for tennis globally. That's halfway through its first term, um, that deal. Um, women's sport, when you give women's sport the the platform that this fight has got, interviews of people like yourself talking about it, the New York Times coming to the press conference, the WWE doing what they're doing this week to help promote the fight, um, Barstool Sports throwing the, the kitchen sink at it from their perspective. When you give it that PR and marketing polish, people are just made aware of it in a way they weren't before. And they, that brings eyeballs. And when you bring eyeballs, people realise, <clears throat> a bit like Serena Williams, a bit like the top soccer players in women's properties around the world, um, they think, bloody hell, these, these girls can fight and they want to come back and, and watch more of it. It's literally an awareness problem and a visibility problem. So if we can use our platform, our growing platform, and that, that of our partners to elevate and put light onto women's boxing, we're confident that business-wise it makes sense. Uh, I think we get accused a lot of um, so it being a CSR project, like, oh, it's the right thing to do. You're trying to like look woke or whatever in, in the eyes of the media. Um, it isn't that. We, we are not in the business of investing in things because it's, you know, the left wing think it's a good thing to do. We are, we're in the business of growing our business and this will help grow our business. It will get different groups of fans. It will bring um, a different audience to a Canelo event, slightly different audience, but it will also attract the same audience that will watch Canelo next week, the hardcore fight fan the Hispanic fight fan in this country, the Mexican-American fight fan, the British fight fan, they'll come and watch. It's not just the parents of young girls looking for role models. So it's it's, it's a way, a bit like celebrity or crossover fighting, um, if you're investing in this stuff, to, to bring more eyeballs, but it also is, it gives the, these women a platform to show that they are high-quality athletes in their own right um, who deserve the same treatment as their male counterparts. Um, perhaps you can't tell me the actual number, but could you share what is the most watched fight in the zone history um we don't uh, give out that information I think we've announced previously like uh aj ruiz 2 mm-hmm. i think was our biggest uh that we've announced we've had bigger fights than that since all canelo events are right up there um basically is it possible this one breaks those it's definitely are we trending in that direction possible. i mean the the, the, the most watched we, we have an eye on i think nine hundred thousand was the most watched wow women's boxing event of all time okay. it was on a linear network Got in it. the u.s a couple of years ago we have eyes on that. So um, I think globally, the fact that- You think that's attainable? I think it's, yeah, it's not, not outrageous to think that. Um, we, we've got these rights globally. We've got them in every market of the world. The promotion's been, I think, the biggest we've been involved in in terms of, you know, there's, there's anecdotal stuff, the number of media, the type of media, the interviews that we're being asked to do, the social media numbers, the early subscription buys, all that stuff is like a general direction of travel for us. And I think we're, we're trending very, very strong there. Um, so we're excited about it. And I think um, I'm not surprised because, one, it's the pound for pound, number one, number two, going at it. MSG is an iconic arena. They've been fantastic partners. 
You've got the added ingredient of Jake Paul, who, like him or loathe him, brings eyeballs and attention. Eddie obviously has uh, a leading promotional platform into like hardcore traditional boxing on, on both sides of the pond. Um, and it's cutting through, it's working. Um, there's a bunch of partners working with us who, who, who have seen what we're doing and sort of see it align with their values, the WWE being a great example. So yeah, I'm not surprised at all. We knew this would be a, a major part of a broader campaign that obviously includes Canelo next week, um, who we're very confident will, will drive significant numbers. But this is, um, this is, this is, this is big. Uh, no secret that Jake, as a fighter, Jake Paul, mm. is a free agent. Mm. Are you interested in uh, being we, back in the Jake Paul business? We, we, we love being in the Jake Paul business. It's been great to work with him and his manager, Nikisa, in the last few weeks on this project. Um, but we've had some success in uh, crossover boxing, for calling it that, celebrity fighting. I don't think Jake and Nikisa would refer to themselves as celebrity fighters anymore. They're, they've gone beyond that. Crossover, maybe, but they're beyond celebrity. He's a legitimate athlete in his own right now. Um, I was the one thing about COVID that, that in our business that really um, took the, the wind out of the sails was was celebrity fighting. We just had KSI Logan Paul too. We'd had our first Jake Paul event. We sort of gave birth to this wave of crossover fighting. We got our fair share of abuse for it, as did Eddie. Um, but it was starting to really pick up. Obviously, COVID, we had to make some financial decisions. We stepped back from that. Um, but yeah, I think we are interested in getting back into that business. Uh, obviously, you have to make deals that make sense. Um, but yeah, we're, 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 we're looking at any type of boxing that will drive audience and keep our, keep our users engaged. So why not? So you announced the big Canelo deal. And again, you know, with every big announcement comes a little bit of heat as well. Mm. Can you explain the rationale behind going back on pay-per-view after the big, you know, hoopla pay-per-view yeah. dead and whatnot? You knew that was coming, right? You knew people would bring that back up. Why did you guys decide that in order to bring Canelo, we had to go the pay-per-view route as well? It's pretty simple. We believe we are the best value offer in boxing. And we've clearly given significant cost reduction for major pay-per-view level events over the last four years in the US and in the UK more recently. We want to continue being the best value play in boxing. Canelo's star and his associated commercial deal-making sort of ability has, has risen in the last four years. Um, all credit to him. So the cost of doing business with Canelo have gone up. Mm -hmm. The cost of doing business in boxing with the top, top guys have gone up. Um, there's more competition, there's more broadcasters playing in that space. Um, and so for us to make, a, uh, to make a deal work that allows us to continue including Canelo in that, that value offer, uh, we needed to charge a higher price point. Um, we are, of course, always wanting to give as consumer friendly an offer as possible. It's better for our business to do that. Uh, we think we are doing that despite the addition of pay-per-view. And we're confident that um, in doing so, yeah, as I say, we'll continue to give fans the best value that they can expect in market. Um, we knew it was coming. One of the things I think we learned, uh, you know, you talked about the Canelo delay with the UFC clash. Another thing we learned, I think we were a bit too brash with the, with the original pay-per-view is dead sort of campaign. Looking back on it, do I regret that? Probably. Um, but ultimately, you know, I'm confident looking at how we're engaging with fans, the number of fans that are sticking around, the general sentiment around that is, what a great fight. There's a few vocal sort of um, opponents to it who are continuing to manage them on social media and they've got every right to do that. Um, but I th I, I'm confident that, 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 that they'll, they'll come in their, in, their, in their numbers and they'll stick around because of that value offer that we bring. And so for those that don't know, because I do believe it's actually quite similar to the ESPN UFC pay-per-view deal. If I'm a DAZN subscriber, mm. I have to, and, and what is it now? I, I've, I have like a, a one year thing, so I don't even remember what I paid for it. Yes, you pay an additional fifty nine ninety nine to buy the pay per view, and I can uh, still, but I can still watch it on the app and all that stuff, right? Yeah, it's, you watch it on the app, exactly yeah. the same. We'll also have it off platform on traditional linear pay per view because there is a, a portion of the audience who, who still want to sure. do that. Um, so that that's and is he the only one right now? That's the only pay per view that we've announced. Yeah, wow. I think and I'll, I think, I will think you do more? You think? I think we will, but I think we'll be sparing with it. I think I think we'll use it sparingly. I think we'll pick and choose when we when we use it. What I would ask is is patience. Give us a year and compare a year from May the seventh through to twenty twenty three and see comparing us to other broadcasters who's over the best value in boxing. And I I assure our consumers, I promise them it will be designed. We're not going to gouge them on pay per view every two or three weeks. Um, won't name names, but some broadcasters do do that because they don't want to take financial risk. We're willing to take financial risk where it makes sense. We are sophisticated in understanding what fights cut through. We'll use our funds to do that and we'll serve as many fights as possible, the vast, vast majority. 
um, as subscription fights in that annual or monthly subscription that, that people have. Uh, the occasional when we need to fight will be on pay-per-view and we'll always try and manage the cost of those as best we can. And I was talking to Eddie about uh, Joshua Usyk 2. Mm. Correct me if I'm wrong, Joshua has one fight left with Sky. No, Joshua's a free agent. He's a free agent. In the, in the UK, yeah. Interesting. He's an Eddie guy. He's an Eddie guy. He's an Eddie guy for life. He signed a, a lifelong promotional <laughs> commitment to what Eddie. Deal. Signing your life away to Eddie Hearn is a dangerous game. Tremendous. Uh, what um, are the chances that fight ends up on DAZN? Yeah, like, we're not quite in, in in that stage of the conversations yet. Eddie and Match, we've got to go and get a site deal sorted. They've got to agree terms between the fighters. There's obviously the additional complication of... Usyk and his sort of um, personal situation, having left the Ukraine recently, which obviously is tough for him. Um, so when that is all sorted, they'll come back to the broadcast market, to us and Sky Sports and the rest of the UK market and say, right, let's have bids for broadcast rights. We'll be involved in that conversation. I'd like to think we'll be competitive. Um, we're obviously going to do our do our homework and plan for that. But AJ, a bit like Canelo, is a transcendent star. He, he's a guy who, you know, my parents would want to watch who are not who are not traditional fight fans. He has that transcendent appeal. Canelo has that. It's very few who do. Katie Taylor has it in Ireland, um, and we want to be in business with those kind of people, obviously. So, uh, yeah, we'll be involved in those conversations when they happen. That's what I love so much about boxing that you know these fight. You know, like the Teofimo Lopez fight. It all of a sudden, you know, it's the purse bid, but it becomes a free agent. You guys pick it up. Mm. It works for you. It maybe works against you now because now Cambosis is fighting Haney and yeah. you know, but you know Take what I mean. Rough with the smooth, right? It, yeah, it, it, but I love that. I love that it, you know that that AJ now can go to the open market and if you want to be in business, yeah. you, know, you know, that's this is all good for the fighters. We often talk about this. Boxing as a whole is a soap opera. There there are very few sports where the deal making is as relevant to the fan base as it is in boxing. Boxing fans are really smart as to how the business of their sport works. Um, it means that they're very vocal against businesses in on Twitter and on social media more generally, but they understand it. They understand what moves the needle for broadcast. They care about how many pay-per-view buys we do next weekend versus mm -hmm. what Showtime have done previously. They, they love that, and it's part of the drama of all of it, um, which makes it very unique. I think UFC probably is the only other, or MMA is the only other sort of sport that has that. Soccer fans care about the ownership of their clubs, and sure. NFL fans are similar, but they're not that involved in the details of, of, of trade contract points and all that sure, stuff. ratings. No one's exactly. talking about the NBA no, ratings. No, no one's having a go at the, the owner of, a, of an NFL team because ESPN or Fox did a bad number on a, on a Monday night. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's part of boxing. It's unique, and I think, yeah, one of the things we've, we've learned in the last four or five years being as involved as we are in boxing. And so you referenced this, uh, what are you guys doing with Barstool next week? You, you, it's like a second stream? Yeah, so obviously we, we've worked with Barstool from a, from a marketing perspective for a while. Obviously they have a very passionate and loyal fan base. They have a relatively controversial sort of tone of voice and um, they love fight sports. They love, they, they love the UFC, they love boxing. Um, we've got an alternative broadcast again behind the pay-per-view paywall on DAZN. So if you want to watch traditional DAZN commentary in English or Spanish, that's there as two options. A third option will be an alternative broadcast led by Dave Portnoy and Big Cat. Mm. We'll be commentating on the fight in their own unique style. So you'll see a lot of basketball involvement in the fight week next week. A lot of content we've been producing with them um, <clears throat> alongside the Ryan Garcia fight, the Katie Taylor fight, Serrano fight this weekend, and going into Canelo Bivol fight week. They're covering it in full as a, as a key promotional partner for us. Um, and that's great because it's introducing these guys to the Barstool audience. Ryan Garcia, clearly age-wise, is probably similarly aged to most of the Barstool audience. Um, but it's key, it's key for us to use platforms like that and channels like that to take boxing to a younger generation, a different demographic of fans who might otherwise not be aware or not be interested. We're trying to educate them and introduce them to the sport. Um, and obviously, candidly, sell them pay-per-views and sell them subscriptions. So we're Delighted to be in business with Dave and, and his team. They're great partners, and we're going to hopefully see a lot of success with it next week. We'll end on this if we can. You know, I love the sport of boxing right now. I think it's on fire. I think it's fascinating. I love talking about it, watching it. I understand my audience is an MMA audience, mm -hmm. and I try not to disrespect them. You're the bridge, though. You're I'm, the tr bridge. I'm trying. <laughs> yes, I'm trying. Yes, yeah, that's exactly. good. I like that. Um, I love the fact, and we were sort of texting a little bit about this, I love the fact that at the end of the day, even Eddie alluded to this, like the fighters are number one. It's not so mm. much the brands. As big as top rank and matchroom is in boxing, it's always about mm. the fighters, the personalities. Mm. In the sport that I love so dearly, MMA, not necessarily the case. Mm. Things like uniform deals and all mm. that drive me nuts. Mm. I fell in love with combat sports because of guys like Arturo Gatti and Mike Tyson and whatnot. I love the unique characters. Mm. If there is one thing that you could take from MMA and apply it to the sport of boxing, 
Um, is there anything that comes to mind? Is Because let's be honest, I have said many times, I think MMA is actually a lot more like pro wrestling in the way it's mm. structured. There's one big organization, WWE. There's some smaller ones, AEW, if you're familiar with any, Bellator. It's not really like boxing. People want to try to compare the two, but it's actually not a fair comparison. Is there anything from MMA that you would love to see come to boxing? I think MMA does a better job, particularly the UFC, <clears throat> in matchmaking. Mm. We have to cut through a lot of politics to get even get into conversations. Um, and we, we're a part of this. We're part of the problem. We're also trying to be part of the solution. Uh, fighters and promoters having exclusive network deals meaning, means that extricating fighters from those to go and fight other guys who they should be fighting that fans want to see them fight who have exclusive deals with other promoters and other networks is very, very difficult. UFC, for obvious reasons, does not have that problem. Um, I think that helps the fans see the fight they want to see. Dana and his team can say, you're fighting him or she's fighting her. Mm -hmm. Get on with it. And it gets scheduled and it allows them to plan their schedule better. It allows them to invest more confidently. All of that makes the sport better. Mm -hmm. I would love to see boxing get out of its own way, cut through its own BS at times, frankly, um, and make that happen. We are trying to be very open door. Um, our the situation with Devin Hayne is a good example. Uh, we, we've we had a long-term relationship with him. We could have locked him into longer-term relationships. We chose not to do that, uh, in part because we, we think that there's a, there's a flexibility and a freedom to allowing him to fight off-platform. Um, I think boxing is very hard. The solution, the, the perfect solution probably doesn't exist. There's not a silver bullet to do it. But having um, the foliage of fight-making and matchmaking cleared so the best fights can happen more quickly would be, would be fantastic. There's not many pound-for-pound pound top fights that will get made as easily as Taylor Serrano. Mm. Men's boxing is harder than women's boxing. And I think, sorry, I think that is the, the fundamental problem in, in boxing today. Mm. And another reason why <clears throat> this fight is so special, right? It's number one versus number two. According to a stat that I read from ESPN, the last time this <clears throat> happened was 2008. Would you like some water? I love some water. Sorry. Yes, here you go. I know you got emotional talking oh, about yeah, that. Emotional. Uh, was 2008 when Marquez and Pacquiao fought for uh, the second time. So it's been, what, 14 years since number one versus number two in men's boxing. And of yeah. course, in women's boxing, it's never happened before. <clears throat> the EVP of DAZN, Mr. Joe Markowski. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, I appreciate it. Appreciate Congrats it. on all your success. Uh, dare I say the uh, the Markowski era of DAZN way better than the Skipper era of DAZN? That's here harsh. I, here I, I am to trying. To, he's a he's a he's, he's a, a good, good guy, friend of mine. Yeah, he's, he's a good guy. Is, yeah. We were talking last year a little bit when he went to Metal Arc. Didn't work out. I'm 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 a big fan of his as well. I wasn't there when he was at ESPN, but uh, I'm just trying to stir the pot yeah, a little bit. That's your job. Yeah, that's my job, and uh, it's great to be able to contribute just a tiny bit to the coverage this week. It's a huge honor for me, honestly. Um, I'm looking forward to the first face-to-face -face coming out, I think later today is what it they is, told yeah. me. And then the second one with Jake and Eddie, which yeah, I think will be, be very nice. That's tomorrow. Okay, uh, Taylor Serrano, Madison Square Garden, April 30th, this Saturday, first time ever, two women headlining the Mecca, the world's most famous arena. Going to take a quick break here, re-jigger the studio. In a moment, we'll be joined by Yancey Medeiros. While we take that break, speaking of MSG, back in 2017, a guy named George St. Pierre, remember him? He went to MSG, won his second title, beat Michael Bisping, and then came and joined me right here in, suit, in that very seat right over there. So take a look at that interview, a classic, if you will, and then we'll be right back right here on the program with Yancey Medeiros after his big win this past weekend. But let us not waste any time. Let us welcome in right now to the studio for the first time, the pride of St. Isodore, the pride of Montreal, the pride of Canada, the one and only George St. Pierre. Let me stand up for George. Yeah. Wow. Unbelievable, what an honor, George. Yeah, thank you for having, having me here. This is amazing. This is an unbelievable honor. Thank you so much for coming. You look fantastic. I'm trying. I, I, it's a PR day, so I had to dress up a little bit. You're doing a lot of PR today? Yeah, it's a lot of a lot of interviews and talk shows and stuff like that. You were in New York, obviously, for the fight. Then you went home to Montreal, and now you're back? Exactly. You didn't just stay? It's only an hour away, right. so uh, I felt the need to go back to, to my family, my friends, and... Uh, yeah, so I did it. This is amazing. I can't believe that. You know, I haven't talked to you face to face. We've spoken on the phone a lot, but face to face since 2013. So it's great to see you in the flesh. What True. do you think of my studio? You like it here? Fantastic. You, I like the decoration. <laughs> you recognize this guy over there? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You remember that picture? I remember it very well. It was not the same guy that you're that is standing in front of you right now. You hate. I mean, that it's picture? the same guy, but he's yes. not in the same state of exactly. mind. Exactly. Do you, do you not like that picture? Does it does it make you feel weird? Like does it bring back bad it, memories? It, it bring back bad bad memory because 
it's it was not an happy moment of my life. Right. Um, and uh, now things have changed a lot sure. since then, and I'm in a much happier place right now. You were coming off a win. That's the picture right after the Johnny Hendricks fight. It, it was a win, but uh, you know I, I was winning fights back in the day, like uh, Nick Diaz, uh, Hendricks. But but it was I was not happy. I was right. like, I, I, you know, it was not like it is right now. That guy right there in your mind. Did you think you were done? Did you think you would never fight again? I'm finished with this. I'm tired of this. It's I, over. I, di I didn't know okay. at the time, uh, but things has has changed, right? And because of the things has changed, uh, it made me want it to come back. Okay, like yeah. what? A lot of things. Uh, the, of course, uh, the problem with the performance and right. the drug and the sport. Uh, a lot of the stuff in my life, the infrastructure of my life was very complicated back then. Uh, what do you mean by that infrastructure? I, I, I built up a gym to okay. do my private training session. Okay. You know, I, I didn't have that before. I didn't have access to a private facility before. So I had to make my schedule around the gym. And it's normal because the gym is there to make money for right. the, the, you know, their, their members. And now I, I really organize it organize my my life in a way that it, it's so, we're very much well suited for me okay how many times have you watched the fight on uh, Saturday? with bisping uh, yeah. a few times and i'm gonna tell you why because i wanted to watch it for my personal sure. uh, critics but also because i get uh after the fight i went to the hospital yeah uh, people don't know that I, w I was not at the press conference and i'm gonna tell you why um i had a very very bad uh, uh uh, injury in, okay. in 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 the back of my head, oh. and I didn't know where it came from. Okay, and uh, while I rewatched the fight, and I think it's in the I'm not sure 100, percent but I think it happened in the first round when I had my first takedown. Okay, and I was holding Michael Bisping's legs. He he held elbow me, but uh, the elbow hit me right in the in a particular spot where it's the the basal uh, region of the back of the head. That's where there is a little bone that attached to the spinal core. And uh, that's why I, after the fight, I, could, I couldn't even tie up my shoes. You know, my neck could, couldn't even move. I had an incredible swelling in one of my muscles, in the muscle of the back of my neck. And during the fight, when I was on the ground, it was very hard for me to, to posture up, to, to strike, because I couldn't even do that. Wow. And even, even now, if you look at me, like my head goes good, good this way, but this, this way I'm, I'm, I'm restricted a little wow. bit. It's still, it's a lot, a lot better than it was, but it was very painful. It so that's painful. the reason why you went to the hospital? Yes, I went to the hospital because when he hit me, I kind of saw blurry a little oh, wow. bit. I don't know if I had a concussion or something, you know, it might, it might have been a concussion. And, and uh, when I keep, keep fighting, because when it happened, obviously the survival instincts uh, kicks in. But when you watch the fight and that particular uh, thing, it, do, it looked pretty insignificant. Mm. But when, it wasn't insignificant when, you, when I received the, the shot. It, it, it hurt me very bad. It's not the force of the blow. It's right. more the, the, the precision of it. It's not Michael's fault, fault. You know, you're in the, the heat of the moment. You fight. I would probably have done the same thing. It's, it's nothing wrong with that. It's just that it happened. And it, I wanted to know where it came from. You are very cerebral, like the way you break things down. I think that you are one of, if not the most, the smartest fighters in the history of the sport. You don't get enough credit for that, for your fight IQ. And so I'm wondering, when you watch that fight, when you watch yourself, the way that you break yourself down, are you happy with that GSP? Are you happy with that performance? I'm happy, but I could have done better. Really? You know, like, I could have done worse also. Sure. Um, yeah, so so the way I break that fight down, it's uh, we were expecting... Michael Bisping to try to bully me, to come hard straight from the beginning and use a sprawl and brawl uh, mm. tactic, so to speak. And he didn't do that. He, he used a lot of movement, that which cut me off guard. The first round I was feeling very good because he was holding more his ground, you know, like he was moving, but he was more old, holding more his ground. So I was able to exchange with him going in and out, but he made a very good adjustment in the second round. That's when people start saying I was getting tired and stuff. It, it's not because I was getting tired that much, it's because he, he was ma making me missed a lot. Mm -hmm. And he was countering me. Because in the first round, my overhand right was working very well because I was countering his jab with the overhand right. And he was holding his ground more, so the takedown came more came, came easier, you know, with, without as, spending as much energy. But in the second round, his coach probably said to him to move more. And I was not prepared for that kind of, of 
fighting style. I was, we didn't train for that. All my sparring partners, there were a guy that were trying to take me out, you know, when they were coming straight at me. And it, it caught me a little bit off guard. So going back and losing the second round, I, I came back in the corner and I had to readjust myself coming for the third round. So Freddie Roach told me, he says, now he's countering your overhand because he knows you're going over his jab. He's countering your overhand by going with a straight right hand. And, and I got clipped a couple of times. So he said, now what you're going to do is throw your right hand and come over the top with a left hook. And that's how I knock him down yeah. with uh, a counter to, to his right, right hand coming with the left hook. And that's how I got, I got him. And I know that once he, I got him down, I tried to finish him with strike, but at one point, I knew that if I would have only tried to finish him with strike, I would empty my gas tank. So I, I know by studying tape that Michael Bisping liked to stand up by going belly down on four point and stand up from there. So what I did is I gave him a little bit of space instead of trying to hold on to him like I did previously and wasting my energy because he's a bigger man. I give him a little bit of, I strike him and I see I couldn't take him out with a strike because he was recuperating very well and defending himself well. So I give him a little bit of space for him to turn belly down and tried to stand up. While he did that, he had a split second that he exposed his back. And I, and I... All right, so we're back. There's uh, George St. Pierre back in 2017. That was a great moment. Actually, it was a rare two shows in one week scenario for us because we did a Monday show and then they brought him in. The UFC actually brought him in, believe it or not. The UFC brought him in on a Thursday after he won the belt. I think he left and then he came back, something like that, if memory serves me correct. He won the belt against uh, one Michael Bisping, and then he joined us in studio. Could you believe that? Back in 2017, it was uh, a magical, magical moment. That was a lot of fun having both uh, Eddie and Joe in studio. I love talking about the business of combat sports. I know some of you may not share my enthusiasm. I think it's fascinating, just as fascinating at times as the actual fights themselves. Of course, we love the fights, but everything around it and uh, the differences between MMA and boxing and the way uh, technology is moving and media is moving and all that stuff is just, I mean, I can't get enough of it. I, I adore it. Um, and perhaps I'm one of the rare people who fits into that Venn diagram. Is it, is it called a Venn diagram? I always mess that up where there's like a circle here and a circle there. And if this is MMA and this is boxing and there's that middle part, maybe I'm one of the few. I understand that it's not uh, the norm, uh, but I love both of them and I am super psyched for Saturday. Now, one of the big stories this past weekend uh, happened in Hawaii. Bellator had two events in Hawaii, and they were great events. The second one, a little bigger than the first. And one of the stories that I really had my eye on and was really excited about was the return of Yancey Medeiros, the UFC veteran who uh, left the UFC last year and was kind of openly campaigning to be on this card. And to be honest, kind of like the sport of boxing you know, was down with a one fight deal. You never see this with the big promotions. Hey, we're going to this market. This guy makes a lot of sense for the market. Let's sign him. Let's bring him. Let's generate some buzz, ticket sales, whatever. And hey, if he wins, he'll stick around. If he doesn't, no skin off our back. All good in the hood. Uh, it was a nice one fight deal. Well, guess what? He signs the one fight deal. The fan, I mean, the, the 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 fans were going nuts. The atmosphere was incredible. People were buzzing in there, and it was a fantastic fight, dare I say, one of the best fights of the weekend, him and Emmanuel Sanchez, which he won. And as a result, we're told this morning, he signed a long-term deal. How about that? Betting on yourself, it sometimes works out. Without further ado, let's talk to Yancey Medeiros about all of this. My brada, there he is. Shoots, brah. What's going on, Yancey? How you feeling, brada? Everything good? Aloha. Full of aloha, man. Always. <laughs> well, congratulations, my friends. Wow. I mean, it's amazing, Thank amazing you. stuff. Okay, let's go back to the beginning. When you were let go from the UFC, how did we feel yeah. about the career? Did you want to keep going? Were you one of these guys who was like, I'm UFC or bust? Or did you know that you would keep fighting? Oh, I was going to keep fighting. I wanted to, you know, I, there's always doubters, but I was like, I felt, I felt like things happened for a reason. And I just kept going. It's like, for fights, I was like, bro, I, I, I did think about it. I'm like, do I really, like, is this really, like, you know, what what I really want to do right now? And I'm like, I'm still training every day. I'm like, hell yeah, nothing ever stops. So I just wanted to get better. I just went back to doing homework, bro. I really felt good, but I'm like, why am I not performing good? Why is it not, why is it not, um, you know, I guess, 
going, going, going with the flow. And then I realized I was like, ah, I train with the best. I train with Max. I train with Nate. Like nothing is, nothing is wrong. I just got to work on me, which was a lot of it was my injuries. I couldn't, like, everybody's got injuries, bro, but I really like worked around it. I'm the type of guy I'd be like, I meet you at the top of the mountain and I'll hop there. Uh, and I just kept going to every top of the mountain and, you know, just bad habits, bad, bad, um, bad habits, uh, working on injuries and leads to bad performance. So I really need to work on myself after I got let go. So is that why you took so much time off in between fights? Yeah. I mean, um, no, like I had, I, I guess, you know, like we got some problem. I had some stuff at home I had to take care of. And there was a lot of things I was settling for myself, but other than that, I was just always trying to work around, work around injuries, work through injuries. And th those are the things I think that was hindering my performance because all my coaches is always like, Yance, yeah, you got to be the Yancey in the gym, not the, the Yancey the, um, these last four fights. Because I think I was just overthinking and not being me. And this last fight, bro, I was happy. I had fun. And that's what my coach said. is like, Yance, you got to go back to having fun. You got to go back to dancing. You got to go back to being the happy-go-lucky guy. And I think, you know, having those losses, I was trying to like over like compensate or trying to get that win instead of just being me. And that was really the, that was really the being at home. And that fight week was unreal, bro. It was very foreign for me because I haven't felt that like it was the easiest fight week of my life, bro. Yeah. I was Thursday fight week. I was like going up and down, driving all over the island, taking care of Aaron. And this is me cutting weight. Like it was like, it was it was meant to be, bro. Everything that happened Saturday was meant to be, and I'm happy that Scott Coker and Bellator let me give back because that was the biggest thing. I took this one fight deal because I was like, bro, Hawaii, like, I like give back. All these people that gave to me, like, I honestly would have took any fight deal they gave me because I wanted to just fight in Hawaii and give back. I bought hella tickets for people just to come. Like, that's how much I wanted to give back to the people that all gave to me and still support me to this day. So how did it happen? Because like I said at the top there, it's very rare for something like this to happen. Like they don't do these sorts of yeah. things, especially with names like yourself. I mean, if it's a guy on the undercard who could sell tickets, fine, they'll sign up. But like an established name like you, they don't do this on the main card and all that. How did the deal actually get done? Um, I I honestly believe a lot of it was to do with um, um, Mike Colgan, Rich Chow, um, Zach. Zach Rosenfield. Um, there's a lot of guys on my management at all kind of just manifested together. But this dude, Nate, <laughs> um, I forget his last name, but he asked Scott Coker in a, in a, in a question, or he asked him in an interview and he was like, Oh yeah, Yancey's, you know, Yancey's, um, yeah, we'll think about it. And I seen him tweet that out and I, I posted it. I was like, bank. Like, I was like, Oh, you didn't say that. I'm right here, bro. I'm ready. And I think it kind of just all manifested from, from right there. Like, Actually, and it just kind of snowball effect. Wow! It was like, bro, it's undeniable. I am Hawaii. I am Aloha. There's no, there's no doubt about it. I was like, you gotta put me on this card. So, you know, it just, it was meant to happen. And by the way, to be clear, uh, that dude Nate isn't Nate Diaz, right? No, no, okay, no, okay. no. But I mean, um, I forget he was an interviewer. Um, yeah, yeah, I yeah. yeah. His, um, but I think Nate was Nate pushing for it too on on social media, wasn't he? I mean, I think that helped. Yeah, you know, Nate, 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 Nate's being Nate, but he was just giving me clout too at the same yeah, time. Yeah. He's being a genius and a gangster at the same time, you know, and being the homie. You know, Nate. That's right. You know, Nate just as well as I do, Ariel. And yeah, he was being a homie and just giving me some clout too. <laughs> and, and and for you, I mean, like this this. Uh, this couldn't have worked out better. The stars aligned. You were free. You were able to fight. And the one thing I couldn't help but feel as I'm watching this and the crowd was buzzing, I was like, man, we've been robbed of, of Yancey fighting Hawaii and I can't imagine what it would be like if Max gets to fight in Hawaii and BJ wanted to fight. Oh, bro. I feel like we've been robbed yes, of these yes. moments, right? Like, don't you feel oh, like man, man, this like, could have happened 10 other times in the past? Yes, yes. Like, it could have happened from the time I started fighting outside of Hawaii. I was like, me, Max, all the Hawaii boys always just wanted to give back to Hawaii. Like, we ain't making more money. Mm. You know, the, the venue's smaller. Like, we just wanted to give back to the people. And what was felt that weekend was, oh, man, that is the reason why I am the person I am because that was given to me all my life from the time I was born to now, man. And that's the reason why I perpetuate Aloha. And that's the reason why I am the person I am because it's not the fighting. It's it's the mana. It's that spirit that was that's always given to us. And, Fortunately, you know, I can fight and perpetuate my culture and entertain the crowd and my people. 
was there any part of you? I mean, it's a great story. You got all these people there. You're finally getting to fight back home. It's a lot of pressure. You don't want to lose that fight, right? Did you feel more nervous than usual? Nah, bro. I didn't. I didn't feel. I felt. I mean, if you feel nervous, it's because you just want. You just want to do your best. You know, if like, there's nervousness, but everything was. Like, I was going to have fun in there, win or lose. And when Emmanuel came too, bro, that guy got hell of a lot. I felt it in him. I was like, bro, this guy, I feel him. He's cultural, you know, and he even walked out to a He walked out to song. BJ's song. Bro, he walked out to BJ's song, but I get it. He's being cultural. So yeah. I, you know All what right. I mean? I, right. I, I was like, oh, I get it. But bro, you gave me two songs to walk out to. <laughs> so I was like singing that song because I was like, oh, I ain't going to, that's BJ's song. I ain't walking out to that. Then, so... But he walked out to that. I was like, bro, Emmanuel, you got two songs from me, bro. That's double loss. <laughs> and what were you feeling? Like to hear the crowd like that cheering for you? It's been a while, right? To have crowds and all oh, that. Oh, man, yeah. What I was that doing the, uh, for you? Top of my lungs. It did everything for me. It was, it was from like when Scott Coker hired me and it was my first fight in strike force. And I walked out. I walked out. And I was in the mainland of California. The cameras was on me. That's the exact sat. They sit on the same exact feeling I felt when when I was walking out in Hawaii. I was like, wow, Hawaii is here. I'm here to show up. I love you, Hawaii. Like I gonna do my best. And you know, like that's that's what I want to perpetuate. And that's exactly what I felt. Like that the kid feeling, you know, that that aloha. And I just Wanted to keep that full circle, and I will keep that full circle. I needed this fight, and I needed it to be at home because the kid is back, Ariel. <laughs> oh, look at that smile, man! You're on. I don't know if yeah. it's from you know just the good vibes, the ganja in the morning. I don't know what it's from. You know what I'm Always. talking? It's all of it, all of the above, bro. <laughs> uh, I love it. I love it. So, at what point yeah. do you realize that you've got a long term deal with them? Do they tell you that night? Um, cause I know they, they uh, this it, came out it, today, but when do you realize that like you actually got it done here? It's not just one and done for you. Um, right after the fight, there was already, oh yeah, so, you know, you, you want to, you want to talk, we'll give you some time we can, you know, Bellator already came to me and was asking me if you wanted to talk, you know, on Monday and Tuesday. And I was like, most definitely, I'm, you know, so they gave me some time to decompress and, you know, they, they sent their contract out, did my, did my reading on it. And yeah, I like it, man. And just, I'm here. I'm here to stand. I'm hoping that they do another Hawaii card at the end of this year because, you know, I'll definitely promote that. <laughs> oh, that's... Okay, so it's a done deal. Frank, we get the... Um... Breaking news. Done deal. You have signed a multi-fight deal with Bellator? Yes, sir. Nice. Yes, Congratulations. Sir. Does it feel like you... like? Is this a weight lifted off your shoulders after what happened last year with the UFC? Like, you have a home now. You don't have to wonder about when the next fight is coming, the pay... Like, you're, you're now established. You're with the, you know, the the number two promotion hey, in, the, in the U.S. Yes. I mean, I mean I'm, 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 I'm happy. I can take care of my responsibilities and pay the bills. But, you know, I'm here. I'm here to be the best and get to that title, right? And I'm not going to walk over anybody. I won't earn my stripes and, you know, give everyone a show and I'll get there, bro. No doubt. The Hawaiian wave continues. Did you feel like people <laughs> were writing you off after the end of your UFC run and you feel like you have something to prove? Oh, I mean, I, um, I'm pretty sure they were, but that's that's how they feel. I don't feel like that at all. I, if anybody going to write themselves off, it's me. So I didn't, and I didn't. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm still here. I'm still getting better. I definitely feel like I performed way better than my last four performances and it's only going to get better. I got, I got a lot to work on. I definitely wasn't, I'm happy with the win, but I'm definitely not happy with my performance. I took like over 20 leg kicks, bro. Right. <laughs> it's unnecessary, but at least it wasn't my face. Usually it's my face. So <laughs> how's your leg <laughs> feeling now? Good, bro? Oh, I'm good, bro. You want me to do the hula for you? No, no, no. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> no, I'm good, bro. It was, yeah, it's good. It's good. It's, uh, it's healthy. I'm ready to go again. And and so for you right now in, in the state of your career, like where where do you how many more years do you feel like you have left? You've been doing this for a bit. Do you feel like this is your last? How, how are you viewing this? I mean, well, I am thirty four, bro, but I'm I feel younger than when I was twenty four. Like wow. I, my, everything is the yeah, everything everything feels everything feels great for me. Like I don't have any I don't have anything stopping me from wanting to to stop fighting until I have to stop fighting. Well, you know, I'm going to keep doing it till I can. And then when I can, I can't, but fighting is, is still my path. And martial arts is always going to be a part of my life, bro. I've been fighting since I came out with my mom and I'm going to keep fighting. <laughs> Does anything piss you off, Yancy? You're always so smiley, happy. Does anything make you mad? Um, anything annoy you? Um, Yeah, bro. It's, but it's a practice to, 
keep a law, you know, a law is, and love is supposed to be unconditional and it's easy for people to, it's easy to give love when you, when, when you're happy, but you know, do it when people are negative to you and the world's in chaos and shit's not going your way. That's, that's to me, like, that's the real challenge of being human. Last year was a real challenge for me, bro. You know, I lost, I lost my contract. I lost a, I lost, I was, I lost a long-term relationship. I lost a lot of things. And I was like, Oh, bro, I guess when you hit rock bottom, the only way is up. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you look up, you just see the sun and everything's bright, bro. So, you know, if you're not ready to, feel, if you're not ready to feel the hate and the, and the darkness, bro, you're not going to be ready to feel the brightness and the love. So you got to take both. You got to take both. And I just choose to be optimistic about all my situations because there's worse in this world, bro. And, wow. you know, like, I'm just very, very fortunate. I wish more people, I wish I was like you. I wish I looked at the bright side. Everything is glass half empty. <laughs> hey, bro, I just, hey, I just keep trying to plant seeds. And when people want to water that seed for themselves, you know, I'll be here to keep, to keep, you know, talking, talking bright. Oh, shit. Oh, no, you probably got a call there, right? Or did he close? He jumped off. You know what happened? He probably got a call and, uh, and shut off his Zoom. There I am. Look at, look at me. See me there? Whoop, whoop. It's like the the many faces of oh and there we go. Um all right, well a couple more minutes with the anti what a what a happy go lucky guy. Golly. I wish I was here you know he actually reminds me a lot of he reminds me of Frank a lot, like just always in a good mood, just spreading sunshine. I think it really, it's really you, nice of you. Yeah, do you see the comparison? Absolutely. Yeah. What an unbelievable guy. Um Oh, I see this tweet here from Damon, uh, Henry Cejudo's manager, Ali Abdelaziz, denied that there was ever talks about sending Triple C to one championship in a trade for Arjun Buller. Uh, Ali's had a pretty good couple days on uh, Twitter, I would say. I mean, what, man, did you see uh, Canelo dunk on him? I don't know what was a better dunk. Canelo's dunk on Ali or uh, John Morant's dunk last night? I mean, both poster worthy. I would put both posters up on the studio here the actual poster of the dunk and then the tweet the quote retweet tremendous poster as well okay <laughs> is he there yep. yeah. oh yancy Sorry, what's up brother. hey what's right, happening man. coconut wireless that's some wind in the coconut wireless no i feel you reception. i feel you <laughs> we have yancy here or no oh there he is oh yeah. Okay. You're back. You're good. Um, okay. So yeah, you were saying always, I was just wondering, was that, would you say in retrospect, one of the toughest periods of your life going through all of that? Um, I think, I think emotionally. Yeah. You know, like I'm always a, a happy individual or a joyful individual. And there was a lot of things that, bro, I wake up, my, my goal is to just be a responsible kid, bro. What do kids, what do kids want in life? Bro? Well, you have kids right there, Ariel? I do. Yeah. I have three. Okay, and what do kids do when they wake up? What do they want? Uh, they want. I mean, I guess they want to play. They want happiness. They just right. Dang, right there, exactly. Kids want to be happy, bro. Talk to an adult. They talk about bills. They talk about problems. They talk about things that you know inevitable that they gotta take care of. What do kids talk about? Bro, they're always thinking about life and things they want to do and like. That's what I want, bro. I just want to wake up and be happy. Just take care of my responsibilities and pay my bills. You know, Ali. be a real chap on this path if I can, but you know, have that. Nobody messes with a responsible kid. They're like, oh, look at this kid over here doing his thing, making everything happy. He's happy. Nobody hates on that. Like, that's my goal, bro. Just wake up like a kid and be happy and talk about life, bro. Not talk about problems. That shit, you got to solve your problems. Everybody get problems, bro. Like, you know, every time I. Every time I hear complaints, especially if it's for myself, I'm always like, oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, right, everybody get problems. Everybody can complain. Uh, suck it up, bro. Monday's still going to come. I love it. <laughs> this is incredible. I feel yeah, so yeah. good about life right now. I remember when you fought uh, <laughs> Cowboy Cerrone and, and, and you yeah. remember you lost that one. You went to hug his grandmother. And people were like, oh, you know, you were being too nice and this and that. But this is really you. Yeah. This is who you are. This isn't a hey, front. Bro. When when you get when you get to the main event and when you in UFC and Bellator, talk, show me how it's done. Mm. Okay, I'm looking forward to your next UFC fight, your next main card. Like, you know, like bro, you get, everybody's got an opinion, bro, but you ain't there. And I operate out of love, bro. I don't operate out of fear. I don't need acts off. I can turn my switch on, on and off, bro. Like that's me. I ain't no punk, and I show people how I want to be treated. 
That's it. Mm. You know, I never had a street fight because I show people how I want to be treated and I operate all up. It's sim- that's that's simple. And if people think that's soft, cross this line and get your ass beat. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, you know, like I'm not, I'm not, I ain't no punk, but I'm not gonna get punked either. Like, and I will always be this way. If you got a problem with me, come up and solve it, bro. <laughs> I love it. I love okay. So um yeah. at, at at this point, here you are, you've got this deal with Beltor. Uh, it sounds like they might, are they going to go back to Hawaii? Have they told you? I mean, I don't, they haven't told me, but I heard talks of it. And usually oh, they usually have, they give Hawaii a card every December. Mm. They've been coming until COVID happened and the yeah, few yeah. years they didn't, but usually every December they give Hawaii a card. So come on, Rob Bellator, Scott, let's give Hawaii another great Christmas present. <laughs> and, and do you live in Hawaii or is, is Hawaii? Yes. Okay. Yes. And so when you go yes, train with yes. the, the Diaz bros and the team down there, you just go for a few, whatever it is. I just go cross train. Yeah. yeah. You know, check if everything at home is working. And you go pay my, you know, I got to go pay my dues or go, go over there and earn my stripes again. That's still Nate Diaz. I'm Nick Diaz Academy. It's still, it's still my family, bro. And I always going to be a part of them. I'm just the extension. But, you know, I, I train all at home. I'm homely in Hawaii. I'm glad Max and all of that. We all, we, we all can collaborate. And when I go to California, that's my brothers too. That's right. What's I mean, we got to figure out this Nate Diaz situation, right? Nathan Diaz. I mean, come on, yes. the guy can't yes. fight. What is going on? It's. I actually think it's 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 getting uncomfortable at this point. The guy's been healthy for a year. Well, he can't fight. What are we doing? Everybody's like, wow, like what is like the biggest thing for Nate that's going to happen? He should fight this guy. He should fight that. I'm like, honestly, I think the best thing for Nate's career that would happen right now is if he got released from the UFC. <laughs> Like, that would just blow him up. And you know what I mean? And like, I don't know. I think it always has to do with money. You know, you see Dustin wants to fight him. The Nate wants to fight Dustin and get get his fight out. So I just think, you know, I think you can connect the dots, bro. Yes. <laughs> and why UFC doesn't want to, you know, let him go. But I feel that the biggest thing for right now that Nate, that could ever happen for Nate is if he was released to UFC because that man knows his brand. He knows his work and... There's a lot of people that want to invest in him and make him rich, God. more rich. He would make so much money if he went on the open market and all these people can bid yes. on his services, whether it's Bellator, whether it's a Jake Paul fight, whether it's, this, I mean, like the possibility. And, and oh, oh, by the way, maybe it's go back to the UFC at some point as well. But can we let this guy fight for God's sakes? I mean, what is going on here? Yes. He's being held hostage. Yeah. Yes, uh, that's why you have to come away, decompress, watch me fight a little, you know, get back get back to, to Cali and go back and train. So... Honestly, when it comes to me, I don't really talk about the the, the fight business to him because that's my family. You know, yeah. there's all these people that always trying to get to know the info like that. So when I when I when I'm with him, like I just keep it as my I brother. I, he's well watched for his well being. Yeah. So, but he's moving and he's gonna be making moves because Nate can't Nate can't sit still. Right. He's been sitting still for a while, bro. How's Nick doing? Is he all right? Yes, he's doing good from what I see. You know, I try to call him and connect when we can, but he's doing he's been doing a lot of seminars. So okay. he's back to teaching he's back to teaching a lot of people and you know, I think he's in a great headspace and he's um he'll be back this year for sure. Well, I hear the birds chirping over there. It's paradise where you are. Uh, much love yes. to you, my friend. Mahalo, aloha, all those uh, things. You're the man, Yancey. Thank you, Ariel. Uh, much respect. Congratulations on the big win and congratulations on the contract as well. It was a beautiful scene. It was great to see you get that moment in Hawaii. And on top of all that, great to see you get the W and then the new con. I mean, what a weekend for you, my friend. Well-deserved. Well done. Enjoy uh, it. Hello, man. All right. Take care. There he is, Yancy Medeiros. Uh, one of the good guys in the game. I mean, how could you not like Yancy Medeiros? Always smiling. Always happy. Always in a good mood. Always just, I mean, that aloha spirit. Can I get some of that? I got to deal with all kinds of problems over here. Only one that has it on the show is Frank. Just spreading it. You walk in, he gives you the, the what is it, a lay? Yeah, the lay. And yeah. have you do the limbo into the studio. It's just great. It's just great. We can all need to be a little more like that. Yes? Can you move the mic? Well, there you go. I mean, Look what is you. going on with this mic? You, you can see it actually <clears throat> moving it, the yeah. entire time. I thought you were doing that. No, I'm not doing this. It's moving slowly the entire time. Slowly but surely. Well, here we are. Um, all right. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you very much to Yancey Medeiros. Much love to him. 
Congratulations on the new deal. A lot of news on today's program. Arjun Bowler with his new deal, Yancy Medeiros with his uh, deal as well. Uh, I do think it's time to get GC's picks for this weekend and also to answer some questions. Let's see how many questions we have here before we get to all of that. Oh, 106. Okay. Um, and, and if I haven't really looked at a lot of the questions, uh, but I, I, can I say something? Is it okay if I say something? Absolutely. I feel like... Is this like an insert your own question sort of thing? Yeah, yeah you know, I, I I feel like the questions, we need to step up our game with the questions. Like, I'm I, this is a challenge to everyone out there. You know, lately the questions have been, come see, come see. I, I, need, I need better questions. That's all I'm going to say. So, of course, I'm saying this after I already asked for the questions. Not fair to judge them, but I would like to see, uh, you know, the question askers. All great people. All very good people who I appreciate tremendously. Uh, you know, I just challenge me. That's all I'll say. Challenge me. I am ready and willing to be challenged. Now, we're going to get to GC in a second. First, a quick word from our good friends over at DraftKings Sportsbook. We love DraftKings over here. NBA playoffs on fire. Uh, GC in a bit of a mourning period right now. His beloved, and I and I stress beloved. Is it beloved? Is it beloved? Who knows? What do you guys think? Beloved? Beloved. Beloved. Beloved Atlanta Hawks. Uh, have been bounced by those dastardly Miami Heat, but uh, it's just amazing. The Timberwolves and the Grizzlies, the Phoenix. Anyway, uh, the NBA playoffs, as you all know, means next level basketball. It doesn't mean Brooklyn Nets basketball. <laughs> Get in on the first round action with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. This week, new customers can bet $5 on any team to win and get $150 in free bets instantly. You win no matter what. All DraftKings Sportsbook customers can also bet on NBA hoops with same game parlays. Combine multiple bets from the same game for a bigger payout. The more legs you add, the more money you can win. Plus, each day of the first round, get a risk-free bet up to $10 if your same game parlay doesn't hit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. I was actually about to read Call to Action on this page, which would have been very Do rich. It considering, you know, the joke of a couple of weeks ago, but I did not. Use the promo code DMAR, bet $5 on any NBA team to win their game during the first round of the NBA playoffs and get $150 in free bets instantly. That's promo code DMAR, a DraftKings Sportsbook on a fish. Sports betting part in the NBA. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. All right, let's get some picks going here, all right? Big weekend in the world of combat sports. We got a big UFC. We got PFL tomorrow. We've got the actual Taylor Sur What? Wow. 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 I mean, this is something. For those listening right now, GC wearing an Amanda The Real Deal Serrano t-shirt and sitting in front of a Puerto Rican flag on this year program. Where did you get to? By the way, I have to say, nice shirt. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it is a nice Where'd shirt. Where'd you get it? From the official store? Yep. One thing I really appreciate about you, you're big on the merch. Oh, God, I have the merch. I, lo I love getting into something like yeah. this fight Yeah. and getting the merch. And getting the now. merch. Now, how long ago did you buy that? Uh, like two, three weeks ago. I tried to get Frank to get one, but he didn't want one. Why did you want one, Wait, Frank? This is official merchandise. Yeah. Well, oh, or is this uh, Bumblefly or whatever? Bumblefly, you, red Bumble Bubble. Fly. Is it Red Bubble? Yeah, it's Red Bubble. Is it? They're quick with the shipping. But it's, the money sent me the link. I forwarded it to my wife. And the money doesn't go to her. Like, but that's yes, Red Bubble. What? Frank's wife is very anti Red Bubble. I guess because the money doesn't go to the actual person. No, it's because of the quality of the product. What is it like? One of those like Gildan shirts that feel like uh, yeah, it's cardboard. It's a T-shirt. It's a yeah. T-shirt. It's a yeah. one-off. You know, I'll wear it again on Monday. After but it's a cool went. logo. It's a really cool logo. She this this logo was not in the official store. I mean, it's a cool okay. logo. Uh, Puerto Rican flag, Amazon purchase. You know, some people might think this is like a Zoom background or something. This is the no, real this thing. is legit. No, I I'm not going to touch it because I'm scared it's going to come down, and that would be my worst nightmare. I can't disrespect the people of Puerto Rico like that. So you're all in. I mean, I'm all in. I'm doing it for Frank. Frank bought the Buffalo chicken dip to the UFC party. I said if he comes, you know, he's a diehard Amanda Serrano fan. I'd be on board with him. Are you I'm a diehard Amanda Serrano fan? Uh, diehard. You, you are diehard. Yeah. I was I'm, with her yesterday. You know this, right? I saw that. Those, those yeah. were, you didn't see me retweet them? No, I didn't. 
Are you are you uh, I'm just too little for that. Well are you verified? I only see verified retweets. It's actually on Instagram, yeah. just to um, be <laughs> <laughs> um Yeah, I don't know what Frank's gonna do if she loses on Saturday. And Frank's going. It'll be uh, yes. an empty spot in front of the console on Monday. Frank, you your first time going to MSG? Yeah, actually it is, yeah. Wow. This is no crazy too. <laughs> yes. In this control, I've lived here for eight months. I've been like half a dozen times. Corporate Alex, first time. First time. Sixteen years he's lived here. Mysterious Frank, first time. How long have you lived here? You don't have to discuss that. Why? Why are you so like? Why are you so it's guarded like about like, like what, what very bizarre details? Yeah, who cares? <laughs> what are you, are you on the run? Like, like, are you seeking asylum? Or what's happening? How many times do I have to blink? To <laughs> well, uh, this is a big deal. I feel. Yes. I mean, we got Eddie in studio. What a fantastically good-looking man, right? I, I mean, mean, he's got the tan. He's got the the stubble. Yes. He's, he's, tall. Yeah, he's, he's tall. tall. He's tall. Very tall too, which is tall, uh, you imposing. Can't really appreciate that. Yes, imposing for sure. I actually was with, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, I was with Katie and Amanda yesterday, and we were about oh, to start. I didn't, I didn't see that. <laughs> I was about to start the thing, and, uh, you know, there's a little tension in the room, to be fair. And yeah. uh, I was like, you know, thanks, guys. I appreciate you doing this. I know you don't love doing it. And Amanda was like this. And by the way, it's coming out later, and it's actually really good. But she's like, yeah, definitely don't like doing this. I was like, oh, gosh, this is going to be tough. But I warmed them up. This is this is Amanda said she doesn't. Amanda like said this. yes. Yeah. Ah, uh, uh, they Katie were pretty was good on the, Yeah, they were pretty good on the Today Show. Yeah, I tuned in. Short, but it yeah, was, it was like a four minute. What's yeah, it, it like pretty, getting punched in the face for a living? That type of stuff. But I feel the buzz. Do you feel the buzz or is is? is I it, mean, they're getting the Empire State Building colors. When yeah. I saw that, I was like, the buzz is on. Yeah. I wonder if they're gonna what they're gonna do around MSG if they're gonna do some custom lights for oh, that. Oh, they always do that. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty standard. They'll do the blue and orange, the red oh, yeah. and blue for the Rangers. Uh, I love it. I'm hyped. And so I guess uh, the cat is out of the bag. You're officially going with Amanda Serrano, who right now is the favorite. Yeah. I feel like that's been out of the bag for, for some time now. Yeah, I was referencing that. Yeah. I mean, now you're just going, you know, full bore. But uh, the question is, when you made the bet, was she the favorite or the underdog? She was, uh, she was a slight favorite. I tried to get her at the underdog. But uh, I did not get it in time. Okay. I mean, it opened at like minus one ten, minus one ten. I think you can get her as low as like, I think she's as low as like minus one fifty now. Listen, I'm unbiased, but I think this is crazy. I was next to both of them. First of all, Katie Taylor is a one thirty five pounder, legit. In fact, she could probably fight higher than that as well. Amanda Serrano has fought at thirty five, but she is not a natural thirty five. Or in fact, she has fought as low as one fifteen. Yeah. There's a bit of a size difference. And I think what Eddie said is 100% accurate. In fact, I referenced it yesterday as well. Katie's last two performances were a little lackluster. She was lacking motivation. She was not really into the opponents. There was nothing really getting her going. This is someone who, by the way, in case you don't know, won Olympic gold medal back in 2012. Yeah. Amanda Serrano was on both Jake Paul fights, uh, the cards on Showtime, August, December, got the rub from Jake. Everyone's, I think there's a lot of people who are falling victim to that. Maybe and also them, falling maybe. victim to the last two performances, Katie, and they're like, oh, this girl's going to whoop this girl. I'm, you know, I'm just... Yeah, I feel like a lot of people, you know, trains passing the night, you know, Amanda Serrano's going up, Katie Taylor might be going down. That is what some people believe. I'm just backing my friend. I just want to be on board with Mysterious Frank. So forward all your complaints if Amanda Serrano loses oh, to wow. Mysterious Frank for me. Are you Puerto Rican, Frank? No. Are you Hispanic? Yes. Okay. I was going to say, he does have that... You know, I, I have family know. in Puerto Rico. Yeah. Oh, is that why you like her so much? I mean, she's kind of a beast. I don't mm -hmm. know if you noticed that. Like, I'm kind she of fights while beast. wearing Jordans, which is sick. I mean, yeah. Katie Taylor with the black and gold KT, also pretty sick. Uh, Eddie Hearn's prediction: Katie Taylor inside the distance, plus seven hundred at DraftKings right wow. now. Wow, a seven to one. I should I don't, have told I don't, put the yeah. money where the mouth is. That'd be a big bet if it's coming from Eddie Hearn. I would assume. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I see that happening. I don't know if I see see uh, see her finishing Amanda Serrano. It's two minute rounds. It's tough. We can get into that later. Yeah, I got. All I right, got, let's go. I got a few bets. What do you got? What do you got? All right, let's start it off. I mean, it's uh, it's PFL week too. We're not going to miss out on that. I mean, what can go wrong with PFL? Let's let's uh, let's start it off with the singles. Adam Karish, money line, Israeli fighter, your boy. Uh, undefeated prospect. We've seen him in Bellator, PFL Challenger Series. Not on the infamous, uh, you know, pre-recorded card, though. Uh, undefeated. All five wins coming by KO. Four in the first round. Big power. Nasty ground and pound. Uh, he's going up against Clidson Abreu. Uh, he's lost four of his last five. KO'd 
Last two times out, both being in the first round, I just think Garrett's going to catch him and put him out. We should see a lot of finishes uh, tomorrow in PFL. I wonder how the pacing's going to go with that. I uh, I worry it it might get super slow with all the finishes. Okay. Yeah. No. No comment on that. No, nah, you know. Yeah. I'm kind of over the whole pacing thing in PFL. <laughs> I mean, it's just like one of those things that MMA fans like to uh, complain about. Like, guys, sometimes it gets slow, man. Sometimes, yeah, it, gets it slow. does. Uh, I, right. I, 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 here's the one thing that drives me nuts. It's like, and it, it, Bellator does it too. We're watching the event. I'm watching. Yes. I'm there. Oh, yeah. I'm already here. Yeah. I don't need a 10, 15 minute breakdown of uh, the Bellator Grand Prix. Give credit where it's due. Yeah, you hate the desk, huh? Oh, I fucking hate the desk. Excuse my French, but it is the worst. Like desk. Why? I'm just kidding. Oh my god. It I just the, know how strongly you feel. Oh, I hate it. Now the UFC used to do this all the time. Back in the early Fox days, they would go to the desk. It's like, yo, and and what is one of the first things that Eddie said when he said what he liked about the UFC production? It moves. You're already yes. there. You sold us already. There you go. Eddie agrees with me. Just keep it moving. I... Keep it moving. So yes, I agree, but it's like at this point, I don't know if they're trying to justify the talent. I don't know if they feel like, imagine, you know, I get what they're trying to do. It's like the halftime show, but guys, it's different. They're not, they're not throwing to the studio after every 10 minutes. They're not going to inside the NBA as great as that team is at the end of the first quarter. They're not. We're not right. getting a 10 minute breakdown on the first quarter. Enough. You shrugged off the pacing so much and now you're so... Oh, well, you got me off fire. I mean, come on. So yeah, heavyweights. I'm curious as how many finishes we're going to... With the pacing and everything. All right, two parlays. Uh, Renan Ferreira, Brennan Longnane, Bruno Capeloza. Pays minus 125. Add on Ante Delizia. A bunch of monster favorites, which will get good closing line value on PFL. What could go wrong? You know, the monster favorites never lose. It's a lot like Bellator, so it's risky. Not going super heavy on it, but uh, those are the PFL plays for this week. Hopefully we can uh, find some su- success. Uh, let's move on to UFC. And that's tomorrow night, by the way. Last week they were on a Wednesday. Now they're on a Thursday. Yep. I think they'll settle in on Thursday, Friday. Oh, yeah. Well, I think the next week with Kayla Harrison is on a Friday. Yeah, that one drives me nuts. Why are you doing Kayla Harrison fight the night before UFC? It's just going to get overshadowed. UFC pay-per-view, yeah. UFC, yeah, that's right. what I mean, UFC pay-per-view. Yeah, no, I think no, no, Rory's yeah. also on that card. That. Like, that's one of their better cards. Nah. I would I rather like that, that would on be a Thursday. Good, yeah, like a Thursday, Wednesday spot for that one. I think they're victims. Of, like, they go where the uh, where the network tells them to go, where ESPN tells them to go. Yes. Yeah. So if there's an opening on a Friday, they're going on a Friday. Wednesday. I think they are hurt by that because you want a consistent day, but what the hell do I know? Yeah. All right, let's get over to UFC. Daniel Lacerda, Daniel De Silva, do you have any report on what it officially is? UFC site says Lacerda. Typology says De Silva. I'm going with Lacerda. I like Lacerda, too, for this one. Uh, he's fighting Figgy's brother, Francisco. Um, it's a Figueredo. It's not Davison. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just really not that impressed with Francisco. He's been outstruck in both his UFC fights, even against Jerome Rivera when he had over seven minutes of control time. Uh, I mean, he just has so little output. Under two strikes landed per minute. Lacerda, De Silva, whatever we want to call him, he's pretty much the exact opposite of that. He's super aggressive. He's killer be killed. 11 wins, 11 finishes. KO potential. Can also get submissions. He's dangerous off the back. Numerous triangle chokes on his resume. Uh, So even if Francisco lends a takedown, which I'm assuming he's probably going to go in here and try to do, uh, I still don't think he's out of the out of the dark. And then in the striking, I think Lacerda is going to press forward, throw those huge shots, put the pressure on him, and just be able to outstrike him on the feet. Which brings me to my next point. I'll also be taking Daniel Lacerda inside the distance at plus 250 um, because I think if he's going to win, I think it's a much bigger chance that he's going to win by finish uh, rather than decision. I mean, this is a guy who's a slight favorite, and every single one of his wins has come by finish, but we're getting finished at plus 250. I think it's worth taking a shot on. Okay. So De Silva, Lacerda, that's who we're going with in that tomato, one. Tomato, tomato. Tomato, tomato. Next up. Christoph Jocko versus Gerald Mearshart. We're going to take the over one and a half in this one at minus 200. Jocko, he's just a decision machine. Five straight and 11 of his 15 UFC fights have gone to a decision. Only two finished under the one and a half. I think the only way this thing ends early if Gerald Mearshart uh, sinks in a submission, which obviously is possible. Ten of his last 11 wins are by submission. Quite a few didn't happen until late second round or early third round, though. Uh, I also just don't see Jocko finishing Mearshart in this one, especially not early. Jocko, he's got solid takedown defense, 83%. In his last four fights, opponents are 6 of 25 on takedown, so hopefully he'll be able to keep it on the feet rather than going into Mearshart's area and risking the submission. 
I think you can avoid it for at least the over one and a half. It's going to be sweaty anytime it hits the mat. Wouldn't love it at two and a half, but I think we can get to the over one and a half in this one. Mershard on a bit of a roll? Definitely. Yeah. Last Ten of his last 11 wins by submission. Last three. But uh, ever on since this the, uh, the Hamzat loss. You know, I know everyone says that changed everything. Could have bro- could have broken him. I mean, it could have been. I mean, we cashed on Mershard in his last fight. That submission right. was huge. Um, all right, next up. Let's keep it rolling. Grant Dawson. I'm going to take him over Flash Gordon. So last time out, we see Flash Gordon get taken down by Joe Selecki. He gets controlled for like the first half of the fight. We were on Selecki. Unfortunately, we don't cash it because Flash Gordon comes back in the second half, gets the split decision win. Last time out, Grant Dawson. We were on Grant Dawson there. I mean, this dude falls off a cliff like we've never seen against Ricky Glenn. Completely dominates the first two rounds, racks up like eight minutes of control time, comes out in the third. He's got nothing. Gets 10 aided ends up getting a draw. Uh, now, Dawson has said, which is a big concern of mine taking him here, but he has, has said that that's a one-off occasion. That's that's not something we need to worry about, and I'm going to believe him because we haven't seen him fail in the third round like that before. Now to this fight. Dawson, he's likely going to have a similar game plan Selecki had in the last fight, and I think he's just going to be able to implement it better. Uh, he's a decent striker, not great, pretty good defensively, but he just constantly goes for the takedowns. And when Dawson gets someone down, he holds them down. You're not getting back up. In his last 12 rounds in the octagon, he has six rounds of four minutes or more of control time. So in his last wow. four fights, half of the rounds have been spent him racking up control time for essentially the entire round. It's just him controlling. Uh, and I think that's what he's going to do here. We saw Gordon get taken down by Selecki. We saw him get controlled. I think Dawson's going to be able to do that better, rack up the control time. We're going to trust him that he's not going to fall off the cliff in the third round like last time. And I think he gets the decision one there. That's some great insight right there. I mean, it's not just picks we're getting here. You got to have a reasoning behind the pick. You got to have a research. You got to have be blindly yeah. throwing at it, man. I think you should have your own podcast where you just break down fights and make something like fight. that. You know, something like that. Stay tuned. All right. All right. Next up, we're getting to the end here. Arlovsky Collier. I'm going to take this one over two and a half. Andre Arlovsky from 2017 to 2022, 16 fights, 13 of them went to decision. The finishes, he got KO'd by Francis Ngannou. KO'd by Jarzinho Rosenstruck and choked out by Tom Aspinall. Is Jake Collier going to join this elite club this weekend and finish Andre Arlovsky? I do not think no, so. No, I don't think so. Thank you. Uh, he's only got two finishes in his 10-fight UFC career. I mean, this dude, three months ago, was a minus 130 against Chase Sherman, who's now the talk of the town for being plus 1,200 against Alexander Romanov. He's a decent heavyweight, but he's not a world beater by any means. We've seen what Arlovsky has done to these guys over the last few years. Uh, Arlovsky hasn't finished anyone since 2015. Don't think he's a real threat to finish Collier here. I think this one lasts a little bit longer, and we get the over two and a half. I like that one. Next up, this one is TBD, the first time in uh, our pick segment history. What do you I mean, wanna, TBD? Yeah, I want to do the card thing like I did with Colby Covington. I want to take Marlon Vera plus five and a half on the cards. They haven't dropped it yet, though. The, the books haven't dropped the line. Really? I think, I think they're worried. I think they got wind. You know, I'm looking to drop the hammer on this one, so they won't drop it. So if they do drop it, I'm going to take it to win one unit. If not, I'll figure out something else to, uh, to play on this fight. But I just love this bet of taking plus five and a half on the cards with this. I mean, Cheeto's just so tough. He's never been finished. I think the only way that we see it end early is if Cheeto is the one finishing, which that would still cash this ticket in this situation. Then if it goes the distance, I think it's going to be a razor thin fight. Sure, Rob's got the better boxing, but I think Cheeto, the way he mixes in the leg kicks, he gets uh, better as the fight goes along. Usually a slow starter in the first round. Uh, he can use his grappling, keeps it super close. Uh, he's just a dog, man. I just don't see him going out there and getting 50, 45 or something. Now, what's the five and a half mean again? So it's like when it goes to the point spread. So when they go, like, so say it's uh, 48, 47, yes. 48, 47, 49, 46. That's technically, Rob Font wins by five. We cover with that one. Yeah, I, I mean, love that one. I mean, I'm a big, like, I am a big fan of this one. I'm really hoping that the odds get dropped. I would take it minus 175 or better. I would, I would take this one maybe even more to win one unit. I mean, his six decision UFC losses... Uh, four of them have been 29-28. So, I mean, he keeps these things close. I think this one's going to be a razor-thin close fight, and I think the only way a finish comes is if it's by Marlon Chito Vera. So I really do like this pick, so hopefully we can get the odds on it. I love it. Now, what about... Dog of the week? I want a dog what, about, week. what about Cheeto Moneyline? I don't hate that. If I don't if I don't get odds on this, I'm going to do the Cheeto Moneyline. Is that the age, Dow? <laughs> what did you call it? The H-Dow, Hawani Dog of the Week. Oh, I love that. Jeez. The rarest breed. Um, 
I've also made up a graphic, so if we get an official one, you know. What do you mean? I, I mean, but I have. I've. Uh, what about my other ones? I didn't get a graphic for those. Now it's a thing. What do you? What is the? What is the graphic department? Just you know, no. just whips there's a, up. I'll tell you. A I'll tell you. There's a couple. There's a. By the way, Romanov Sherman. What Look is going line. on over there? Look at that line. <laughs> what is going? On? People are saying this is the biggest favorite in UFC history. I don't know if that's Minus confirmed or not. Twenty two hundred versus plus eleven hundred. What the hell is going on there? That's what I mentioned earlier. Jake Collier was minus one thirty against Chase Sherman three months ago, and now Chase Sherman's plus twelve hundred, plus eleven hundred at some of these books. Chase, Chase Sherman, by the way, former in studio guest on this program. He was once known as the Gift King. Uh, I don't know what the hell is going on over there, but I'll tell you. As far there's there's three that I'm looking at right now. Dogs of the week. Yeah, let's Number hear. one, Gerald Merchart, plus 145. Number two, Marlon Vera, plus 115. And number three, my good friend, Katie Taylor. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's just... I, like, I knew about the Taylor. I mean, uh, yeah. so these official plays. Well, uh, let me just look at Katie here. What is she as of this moment? Uh, where is it? I'm looking at that website. DraftKings Sportsbook, plus 110 right now for Katie Taylor. For some reason, on your favorite proboxingodds.com, they have it under May 1st. That's a weird... Okay, yes. So as of right now, plus 110. Might have multiple. Might have multiple dogs of the week. All right, so these aren't official. I mean, the people come... No, 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 no. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. People come hunting for these things. I have two official dogs of the week for you. Marlon Vera, Katie Taylor. All right, those are the... These are official. The dogs yeah. are barking, baby. Yeah, these are official, and we're, pu we're listen, putting five straight on the line. Can I tell you my 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 hesitancy? Can I tell you my hesitancy? My hesitancy is that there are two main events. To me, the Ooh. magic, the beauty of the uh, dog of the week is finding the diamonds yes. in the rough, the yep. Mark Madsons of the world, the Sarah yes. McMahons of the world. Oh, yeah, you yeah, know what I mean. Like this is almost too easy. <laughs> it's like free money. I mean, wow. uh, come on. Wow. I mean, it's like too easy. Wow. That is, is, uh, I mean, this man is jinxing himself right now, live on the air. I wish I could say more, perhaps later in the week. You know, I am going to the press conference, doing the face, face but I will, I will just leave it at that. I, I just, I really think what I said earlier about the Taylor Serrano fight is legitimate. And I think that, uh, look, Rob Fawn is great. And I think that it's good that people aren't overvaluing his loss if I could say that, or overrating his loss to Jose Aldo, because Aldo is just so damn good. But I feel like we're not giving Cheeto the respect that he deserves here. Yeah. Very high on Cheeto. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's going to be a fantastic fight. Dude. In I'm fact, I once said that Cheeto Vera is going to fight asshole. for a UFC title at some point. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I think it's going to be a great fight. I mean, Marlon Vera, he seems to come on in the later rounds, and we've never seen him go five rounds. So what if he just keeps getting better as the fight goes on? I mean, he's a dog. Uh, so I'm I'm with you on Marlon Vera. So uh, hopefully I get the point spread. If not, I'm going to be riding the money line with you. All right. Well, here we go. Uh, all right. One more uh, one more single here for you. Oh, okay. It's uh, Katie Taylor, Amanda Serrano goes the distance. distance. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I took this one at minus 205. This is the best of the best going up against each other. Neither of them have obviously ever been finished. Uh, the biggest thing, you mentioned it earlier. Eddie Hearn mentioned it as well. There's less finishes. Ten two-minute rounds. I just think you have less time to get going. I know you're probably going to be more aggressive because you need to steal the round, but less time to like wear and get the TKOs. Um, I know what Eddie said. I just don't really see Katie finishing her. I think the only way we see a finish is if it's by Serrano. Uh, but if you look at Amanda Serrano's 30 KOs, this is really getting deep here. On the KOs, the opponent has an average amount of losses, 7.4 losses on the record. When she goes to decision... Average amount of losses, 4.6 losses. So she's KOing these lesser opponents. I think I think the quality of the competition is lower when she's getting these knockouts. Also, of the 30 KOs, TKOs, only four of them are actual KOs. 26 of them are TKOs. Is she going to TKO Katie Taylor? Is she going to make one of the best women in the world quit? Olympic champion, you mentioned it earlier, undefeated, mm -hmm. untied as a professional. Is she going to make her quit? I don't think so. So I think this fight is going to go to the distance. Yeah, and then you know, strong bet. you know, Amanda Serrano, just for Frank, you know, have a rooting interest. Shout out to the real deal, Amanda Serrano. She, you know, she's got a song. She does? Yeah, a rap song. It's a great song. Um, and then I got a multi week boxing parlay that I'm hopefully uh, will finish off on Amanda, on, on Amanda Serrano as well. Oh, yeah. You have the Errol Spence and Tyson Fury that you won. Yeah, so hopefully it finishes off, you know. 
I, you know what I think would be a great prop bet that they haven't released yet? The winner wins by split decision. <laughs> you give me plus money on that, I'm taking Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do they ever do that? Oh, yeah, yeah. You can do it on, uh, you can get it on like the UFC main event. I'm hoping they'll, the boxing props are a little bit slower to release. Um, like they just released the other fights on this card this morning. So I'm going to have like a, a boxing parlay for this card. Sky Nicholson, big favorite. Oh, yeah. uh, also, you know, another Olympian. Yes. Yeah, are we yeah. just going to like, are we just trending towards Mondays being the MMA hour and Wednesdays being the boxing hour? Is that what we're moving towards here? <laughs> Frank, I mean, it's, it's like, should we just take over that sport too? I mean, no one else is doing this. God knows. Should we just take over that sport too? He's not even getting close to his microphone. I mean, we could add a third day. He has no interest in this. Someone call third day. Uh, third day, the boxing hour. Yeah. Someone call I mean, over now. Just a little like bit. slammed his desk shut and it's like not what? having it. Who doesn't want to work more? I sure do. I've been thinking about the boxing hour. Wow. Yeah. I thought that was gonna be uh, Frank. New York Rick and Jose Youngs. Yeah, I was thinking about the boxing hour. New York Rick and Jose Youngs. Get out of here. <laughs> I mean, what? Uh, what? Yeah. The social media hour? I thought that was the boxing hour. I thought that's what we were going to get. What are they going to talk about? Likes and retweets? <laughs> <laughs> wow, really really dumbing down their profession there. Uh, so yeah, those are the picks. I'll have a prop parlay as well as soon as I can get the lines on them. It's going to be a PFL uh, UFC crosser. That Romanoff Sherman not to go the distance. Vera Font over one and a half. And then uh, Capaloza doesn't go the distance. Ferrer doesn't go the distance. Just need to get the lines on him. All right. Great stuff. Uh, I'll actually see you later in the week. Yes, you will. Are you going and to any our, of the... Uh, and our boy TST. TST here, in the like, house? It reeks of coffee in here. It smells oh like coffee my beans God. in here. Where's TST? He's sitting right next to me. Here, let's put, let's put up Rick's camera. Let's go. Wow. Minimalist tip of the week? First time ever? I don't know. We're working on it. Oh, Stand by. No, not, not his actual... There he is. There wow. He is. TST in the house. Can you take off the hat, TST? I mean, come on. Take off a little, a little decorum, like please. Uh, TST, my old producer from ESPN here, visiting. Just visiting? Just in town? I can't hear you until he gets that back on. Just there visiting? Your microphone's the wrong way? I mean, it's a mess of a situation. Everything good over there? I haven't been in an actual studio in over two years. This is uh, wild to me. It's kind of actually surreal to listen to your voice on this program. I was actually with TST last time he was in a studio. Those wow. Guys. Oh, look Game at this. Night. Wow, this is so weird right now. By the way, it, this is like the... Uh, do we have uh, the curmudgeon, the social media curmudgeon? Yeah, I think he's on the air. Not, doesn't even bother getting on the camera. I just see his name. Unbelievable. Yeah. Does he ever work? <laughs> I'm here. Wow. What are we on? A Nokia? Yeah. Over here? Wow. Jesus. This is what I walk into. I'm getting stabbed in the back by, by everybody. I mean, not even a microphone. Are you going straight into the mean? speaker? Like, it's What's like the word. Like, it sounded better earlier. It, sound, it sounds horrible. <laughs> no, it's, it's AirPods. Oh, the AirPods uh, yeah. is the worst. I mean, it's, what a rookie move that is. The fighter's going to be in their car and have better quality. The one is kryptonite. The this is one of the worst. All right, I'll see you guys later. Bye. I mean, no, all we're, all we're missing is corporate Jake here, and I have like every single producer that I've ever worked on. It's great. We worked with, I should say, actually Alex back in the old MMA hour days. This was nice. Uh, TSC, nice to see you. Glad to be here. So, yeah. Uh, GC in the flesh, do his thing. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, I'm telling you, the whole co the whole control room reeks of like coffee beans. Yeah, that's what I do. How many sit ups have you done today? Yeah, uh, zero sit ups today. But I was walking up and down the train. I mean, I cannot sit still for four <laughs> hours. So I was walking over to the food cart, which was a couple carts down, just going back and forth, taking laps. Do you have a, a quick minimalist tip of the week for us? Oh, man. Good minimal tip. As you guys were talking about the boxing hour being the Wednesday show, I was kind of hoping that you can make it the minimalist show. So let's see. Quick minimalist tip of the week. I gave you guys the 90-90 rule a couple weeks ago, so I won't do that. But so I will give you a minimalist workout routine. Okay. 18 minutes. Put 18 minutes on the clock. Nonstop. 30, you do three stations. One is an upper body. I like push-ups or pull-ups. The next is a lower body. I like squats or lunges. Then the third one, I like doing sit-ups, crunches, planks. So you just go 20, 25 reps of each or in a plank, like, you know, 30 seconds. You just go around and around and around for 18 minutes. One, two, three. 
20 second rest go again until the 18 minutes is up minimum wow. workout routine there you go not Can only you imagine this step. guy pacing the train as you're like i would be nervous yeah i would be nervous yes I would and i'm always the last guy to board an airplane i don't know what the rush yeah, is the to rush? get on the airplane i'm the last guy because i will take as many laps around that airport as i can before i'm forced to sit in that tube of death for three hours yeah i also believe in airport calories not counting mm. so like i'll go to cinnabon at the airport but not you know in my day-to-day -day life i would like more salad bars in airports okay why can't right. we get them <laughs> what's the deal with ovaltine <laughs> Um, TST, thank you very much. GC, thank you very much as well. And now we're going to go to everyone's favorite segment of the week. It is time. It's yeah. time for a good old fashioned Q and A, MMA fans. Now the thing is, people are wondering, Ladies why is New York Rick here? He only works on Mondays. Hear from the man himself. Well, Ariel a lot of people have been taking shots at him, Live and I figured it was only fair that he's City. at least on it's to on defend himself. Nose. Now, if necessary. I don't know if anyone's questions. taking shots today, but I feel like, you know, that's the proper thing to do. Here he is, Ariel Helmarty. Yeah, I'd argue you're the first. Wow, 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 well, listen. You, I'm going to Rick take over. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you speak when spoken to. I mean, them's the rules. Around. I'd argue you're the first, then GC, then Troy. I mean, if anybody's taking shots, it's, it's, you, it's the entire crew over there. What uh, by the way, power, as if you know anything about boxing. Wow, you you hit us with the you, you hit us with the what do you know about boxing? Huh? How many how many boxing events have you worked on? I've been in the ring. A lot more than you. What are you talking about? I've actually been in the ring. I've been I've worked more boxing events than MMA events at this point. Yeah, how many boxing events have I worked? You ever hear of something a little something called top rank that I did for years? Never heard of it. Uh, great promotion. Just. <laughs> Anyway, uh, El Cubano is first, Frank. El Cubano is first. Actually, he wasn't first chronologically, but he did get the most votes, so he's first. Quick question wait this week. Wait a minute. Like, is that really breaking no, news? No, that's breaking news. That's this breaking. is like putting multiple Surgeon General's warnings on a pack of cigarettes. Like no, I think it qualifies. Bread. I think All it right. qualifies. Uh, who's closer to signing a new contract with UFC, Francis or Nathan Diaz? Hmm. Uh, golly. Neither? I mean, the the... I almost lost it a day or two ago, if I'm being honest. Another tweet from Nathan, let me go, let me get this fight, let me do... I, I, I honestly almost lost it. And I, in fact, voiced this to his team. I'm tired of this story. I am legit tired of this story. And I can't believe that it's just being accepted. I can't believe that this story is just being accepted. This is a guy, one more time, who hasn't fought since June of last year. Hasn't been hurt, hasn't been suspended, hasn't been sidelined for any reason, and has actively been campaigning for multiple fights. There is records of this. There are records, there are tweets, there are posts of him actively campaigning for multiple fights. In that period of time, the UFC has offered him one fight. It was against Hamza Chemaya back in October. One fight. And yet... The next time we're at a press conference and you hear Dana White say, well, we got to offer this guy three fights a year. The next time, because he is going to say it because he has said it many times before and no one has challenged him on it. Remember this moment. Where are the three fights? Where are the offers? What is being done right now is a travesty. This guy is in his prime. He's at the end of his, 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 his run with UFC. They are icing him because they want him to fight Conor McGregor. As plain as as possible. That's what's happening. And if you don't want to accept that, I'm sorry, but that's what's happening. He is being iced. Get this guy a fight. And there are other fights out there. Give him Poirier. Hell, revisit the Hamzat fight. I bet he would take it at this point. Do anything. Can we just stop with the tweets and stop with the drama? Like at this point, I just want to see the guy fight and move on and see where he's at. So frustrating. Anyway, they're not really talking about a new deal with Francis, and they're not really talking about a new deal right now with Nathan. Ice, ice, baby. Also, tell GC I will stop bothering him on Twitter now that the series is over and my heat definitively beat down his Hawks. If it makes GC feel any better, I would have given Yurik Rick the same treatment. Viva Hiawani. Was he... Uh... Was he attacking you? Yeah, I understand it. I mean, it is what it is, but it's an, it's a one seed beating an eight seed. Congratulations, yeah. you should have swept us. Like, we also they weren't they weren't even a real eight seed, right? Weren't they like a nine or something? Yeah, I think yeah, nine, ten. I mean, 
You should have swept us. So technically, you know, you're coming, you look bad here. You're not too bothered about all of this. The Hawks aren't up on your, like your, your power rankings of favorite teams. I mean, I like the Hawks, but I knew they weren't going to win a championship. No. Can't believe the Knicks lost to them last year. Uh, Lewis, my man, good afternoon, Ariel. Many of the items on the MMA Hour set have been present for years, surviving numerous set design changes, accurate, employment changes, accurate, and some even featured in lockdown Zoom backgrounds, accurate. My question is, which items on the set mean the most to you? What are the ones you're grabbing if the building was ablaze? When it's all said and done, I want to visit the MMA Hall of Fame and see a recreation of the MMA Hour set. Empty butternut squash soup included. There it is. Much love, Lewis. Wow, what a great question. Lewis always comes with the thoughtful questions. And it's true. Like, there are some things, like, this this stuff right here, this is back from the AOL days. This is Brian Stan right here. There are some things that have gone from the AOL days to the SB Nation days to the ESPN days, back to the Vox days. Um, what is, I mean, this belt has to be up there with one of the first things that I'm grabbing. Let me see what else. I love this Roy McDonald one right here. Let's go to this, go to this camera right here. Show the people the Roy McDonald. Yeah. I mean, look at that. Look at that Roy McDonald. That is amazing. The detail is great. There's so many great things here. Um, that luchador mask in the corner there from Jessica Aguilar. Amazing. Got to get Verna. I mean, the picture of Verna, but th th I mean, that's just a thing that we blew up. We didn't actually, wow. I mean, it's like, uh, oh, the Verna hat. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Tucker. The hat is fantastic. This is a custom made hat for me, for my good friend, Verna Uh The, uh, the happy warrior rocks at Montefiore signed fan is a big one for me. The, uh, the haggis toy given to me by Robert Whiteford is a really fun one. Uh, the signed Art Jimerson glove right up top over there. I don't know if you can see it's right up top over there. Signed Art Jimerson glove from UFC 1. That's a pretty damn big deal. I mean, there's a lot of great stuff here. But I, I mean, I think the belt probably comes with me first, even though it's one of the newer things. Got the Sugar Sean O'Malley gloves over there from my good friends at Sanibel. Um, we've got the Combate Americas gloves over there, courtesy of my good friend Campbell McLaren. A lot of great stuff. AJ, Ahoy Ariel. I, oh, this is a long one. I have a massive confession to make. I've been trying to figure out how to break this news for almost two months, but I've been too ashamed to ask. How about that? The last time you had Dan Hooker on, you guys chatted about Dan's very affordable cameo appearances. It got me thinking, wow, I'd love to surprise a friend with a very price-conscious video from The Hangman. I gladly signed up for cameo and requested the $20 video from The Hangman. Since it was fight week, I figured I'd receive it sometime after his fight. But no, to my surprise, Dan submitted the video the night before the fight. Wow, I was speechless and super happy at the same time. But after seeing his fight and how it went, I now can't help but think that I might have been responsible for his performance. If Dan was hanging in his room on fight night eve, making videos for me for $20 and not focusing on his opponent, is there a chance that I took his head out of the game and perhaps influenced the result of the fight all for $20? Better yet, do you also share this guilt with me? Being that the price point was promoted on your show, that we somehow had a role to play in his TKO loss. What do we do? Do we make a pact to never speak about our accidental influence over the hangman getting TKO'd? Or is this one of those situations where it's better to air it out and heal out loud together? Ariel, please help. I mean, this is one of the all-time great questions on the program because as someone who is riddled with guilt constantly on a day-to-day -day basis, almost 24 hours a day when I'm actually awake, I feel this pain right here. I will just say, though, that no, I don't feel like you should feel guilty because let's be honest, he probably was doing a lot more videos than just yours. And this is on him. He didn't have to. There's, 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 there's like a day, like if you, if you ask for a video, there's like a seven day window. He didn't have to do it the night before. I mean, pretty crazy. Maybe he was just doing it to, you know, pass the time. He didn't lose because of your video. Rest assured. But great question. Adrian, dear Ariel, Greetings once again from London, Ontario, Canada. My question today is a straightforward one. Do you think someone can have more than one best friend? 
<laughs> These are actually great this week. I take back everything I said. In my opinion, the answer is obviously no, because I believe that any question involving the world best should receive a singular response. My girlfriend is insistent, however, that she has three to five quote unquote best friends on any given day. English is her second language. And so I am unsure if she's misunderstanding the word best as a non-native speaker, or if she's being intentionally difficult to clarify the situation I thought I would ask your opinion on the matter. What do you think, GC? Can you have more than one best friend? Absolutely. Frank? I think you, have, you have different friend groups. Right. You certainly can have more than one best friend. Hmm. And she probably has more than one best boyfriend at this point. Like, is she just being difficult is what he asked? Like, that's a lot. Eric, can you have more than one best friend? Of course not. The word <laughs> best signifies you can have one. What kind of, <laughs> I mean, this is the dumbest question ever. Yeah, of course. You can, of course, you cannot have more than one best friend. You best could, audio goes to yeah you could say one of my best friends you could say one of my best friends but if you're saying sure a good friend one of my best friends you cannot have more than one best friend i agree with that i kind of agree with that if you're going to say someone is the best he's the best uh or she adrian continues oh yeah i'd even read this part and i did it already i would appreciate if gc would weigh in on this as well given his social nature hmm what do you make of that is that a compliment or not? I'd like to hear the question first. No, that was the question. He wanted to know if you can have more than one best friend. This is oh. part of the same question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He All seems right. to oh, think that you're a very you. social yeah. person. I got thrown off by very Rick coming well. through a walkie-talkie. <laughs> Speaking of Rick, there's more. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow, this is great. This is so great. I didn't even plan this. You could also ask New York Rick on Monday. He didn't know about this new edition of having Rick as part of the segment. But I doubt he has to concern himself with this issue since it requires having multiple <laughs> friends. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have to say about that? It's the schlub who's, who's commenting onto the show to ask about his personal relationship. Wow. I mean, these guys, these people. M Mr. Helwani, uh, is Nate Diaz ever going to fight again? Who's next for Conor McGregor? I mean, these guys wow. are so pathetic. And Why are you so upset? Why are you so upset? I, I guess I don't have enough friends. I'm so mad. Wow. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Newman, I have become very... Dis oh, hello, Ariel. Hello, Newman. By the way, string of deaths recently to the Seinfeld cast. Have you guys seen that? Yeah, it's really sad. Mrs. Seinfeld, Mrs. Costanza. Was there another one recently? This is Frank Costanza. We're moving in lock, stock, and barrel. We're going to be in the pool. We're going to be in the clubhouse. We're going to be all over that shuffleboard court. Finish it. Finish it, Frank. I actually can't. And I dare you to keep me out. After UFC 274, oh, he said, I've become a very disgruntled UFC fan recently, and I feel like the greed of the UFC is the sole reason behind my grievance. Wow. After 274 on May 7th, they have three consecutive events scheduled at the Apex, which would make it six out of seven events at the Apex. The only reason they're continuing to use the Apex is because it's cheaper than going on the road, and it sucks for the fans and the fighters. I mean, look, I've been, isn't it ironic? They're saying, oh, we got to go back. we got to go back. May of 2020. They're the last ones in empty arenas. What's going on? Oh, I mean, it's great. It's convenient. It's it's very cost effective. This would be like WWE still doing events at the Thunderdome. I mean, it can't continue. You sign with the UFC and you're staying at the Renaissance and you're fighting in front of four people. It doesn't make sense. My other issue is they aren't scheduled. You, you go and you watch Fury White, 94,000. I know that's an anomaly. Then you go to the Bellator event in Hawaii and they're screaming Hawaiians there going crazy. They're like, and, then you're, and then I'm watching Dean Barry and Mike Jackson at the Apex. My other issue is they aren't scheduling any big fights, most likely because they're too cheap to pay the fighters what they're worth. It's almost made. Some of the biggest stars in the sport don't even have a fight scheduled yet. My theory is that the UFC brass believes that they could keep putting on shitty events, no disrespect to the fighters that keep costs low because they're already being paid by ESPN and there's no real competition to the UFC, so the fans will watch no matter what. Am I overreacting here? No, I mean, look, there is no pressure. The, the events are bought and paid for, and I believe part of the reason why 
Dana has come out and said recently, oh, our summer slate is going to be great and we're going to have John Jones and this and that, is to let people know like, hey, we are trying to make big fights. But if you actually look at the summer slate, at least what's been announced so far, I mean, it's good fights, but is it anything that we haven't seen year after year? No, it's just fights. It's fight. I mean, it's it's fights. It's Cannoneer, Izzy. It's great. Wow, wow, wonderful. But it's something that's going to like do any seismic business for anyone involved. Like I said, the revenue is fixed. They've never been more comfortable and they've never been making more money. And so there isn't that pressure to make these big time deals. Henry Cejudo, you want to rock the boat? God bless you. John Jones, you want to rock the boat? God bless you. Nate Diaz, you want to rock the boat? God bless you. Francis Gunner, you want to rock the boat? God bless you. <laughs> Trug Walker. Ariel, greetings from Ottawa, Ontario. My question is about recency bias among the MMA community. Do you think that as the sport continues to grow, as does the talent pool, that fighters across every division are simply facing far tougher competition than in years past? Maybe recency bias makes sense in combat sports. Do you think Ronda would have gone to be champ if she were in her prime today? Shout out to GC for cutting the best babyface promos in MMA hour control room history. Wow, how about that? He likes her promos. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't Control think they were promos. Specific, yeah. Uh, you know, recency bias is a thing in all sports, I feel like, right? Oh, LeBron's better than MJ. Tyson Fury's better than Muhammad Ali. It's a, it's, it's a thing in every sport. No, Tyson Fury isn't better than Muhammad Ali. No, LeBron James isn't better than Michael Jordan. No, uh, Kamar Usman isn't better than George St. Pierre. Yet. I mean, it could change, but not quite yet. So yes, recency bias is a thing, but not just in MMA, in all communities. Lior, hey Ariel, hope Passover was good. Before I ask my question, I must say GC and New York Rick together in one segment is much better. And when you have all three have it, when all three of you have a discussion, it feels like I'm in the living room talking with MMA, talking MMA with friends. And this is the biggest compliment I can give. That's very nice of you, Lior. I like that a lot. And uh, those are some of my favorite segments. That's why I want to have everyone involved. Everyone can chime in. My question is, if the UFC... Don't let DS fight, as he keeps on saying. What would you do if you were him? Besides Twitter, does he have anything to do about it? Look, I've said this to the team. You guys need to take another avenue other than Twitter. Now, I've, I've, I've volunteered to have him on the program. I've volunteered to have his team on the program. I've even said, put, do a press conference. Show the facts. Explain your situation. But the every three, four day tweet, like I want out or I'm retired and this, I don't think it's helping anyone. But I don't know about all of you. I, I'm just getting tired. It, it's, it's hard to watch. Could you imagine, let's just say, who, who's the equivalent of Nathan Diaz in terms of popularity in boxing? I don't know. Who, who, who's as big as, uh, do you want to say Errol Spence? I think Nathan Diaz is a bigger star than Errol Spence. Terrence Crawford? I don't know. G name one of those dudes, right? Ryan Garcia? I don't know. Someone like that. Could you imagine this guy's being like, yeah, I'm trying to fight, but uh, you know, my promoter, Bob Arum or uh, Oscar De La Hoya or Eddie Hearn or uh, name a guy, whatever. Leonard Ellerby, Al Heyman. Yeah, they just won't get me a fight. What? What do you mean they won't get you a fight? What do you mean they're not going to get you a fight? Now, sometimes it's not the fight that we want. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, Spence versus Ugas instead of Spence versus Crawford, even though Spence versus Ugas was great. Point is, it may not be the fight that we want. That's always played boxing. But imagine that guy not getting a fight. What do you mean you can't get him a fight? What do you mean he's not fighting in July? How is that possible? What do you mean you have extended his contract? And how long does this extension last? A year? Sweaty Spaghetti said, uh, Rick is that weird workmate that eats all of the dip and otherwise adds nothing beneficial to the conversation. I think that's not fair. I mean, do I even need to talk about this guy? Also, can we go back to the guy? His name was Trug Walker. I mean, you're just going to gloss over that one? <laughs> So sometimes you, you just have to pretend like that. that's the name. Sometimes you just have to let it be. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, Eric says, Eric with a K. Hi, Ariel. NBA question for you today. The Miami Heat just beat the Hawks. Sorry, GC, without Jimmy Butler or Kyle Lowry. 
I'm as biased as any MMA, or excuse me, Miami sports fan. But I think the Heat are the deepest team in the league. They keep finding ways to win without generational talent. Do you agree? They're a great organization. Great coaching staff. Great front office. Beautiful locker rooms. I got to go in their locker room when I was doing Heat Clippers back in 2020. I mean, it's, it's literally a red carpet. The whole freaking back is red carpet. Eric Spolstra, brilliant office. How do you fancy their odds to win the chip? I have to say right now, I think the Celtics are the favorite in the East. I think it's coming down to the Celtics or the Bucks in the East. And quite frankly, I think the winner of that could actually win the NBA title, which is amazing because I think when, when, when RJ Barrett hit the buzzer beater against the Celtics in January, I think there were three games under 500. I mean, what Ime Odoka has done in the last few months, incredible. They were talking about trading Brown and Tatum. And I still maintain that Tatum is a top five star in this league. He signs off with this. I mean, this is crazy. The New York Rick of shooting contested mid-range bricks. Eric. So he's the GOAT of it. Well, I hope I, I mean, what, what? What's with all the backlash? No, I mean, he's saying that he's the GOAT of shooting contested mid-range bricks. Okay. All right. And I can appreciate that. Keep, keep, keep getting them up. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take, Eric. David, Ariel, you previously mentioned that Nate had a knee injury versus Masvidal. Would you say the result would have been different if that wasn't the case? Hard to say. Masvidal was on fire that year. Would a rematch be more competitive? Right now, yeah. I think so. Also, not saying Nate would have beaten Leon, but he has also stated that he had an injury before that fight that made him lose motivation a month before. Did he say that? I don't remember that one. Nico, Sava Ariel. Sorry, I was MIA last week. I had a job interview. Hope it went well. Two questions this week. Can you provide some clarity around which team Darren Benedict Arnold Till belongs to now after his loyalty is everything post? I think he's still with the guys in uh, Liverpool. And maybe that was in response to what uh, Andreas Michael said on the program on Monday, but I wouldn't look too into it. Which non-sports journalist do you look up to the most? Wow, that is a great question. Um, well, the name that came to mind was a sports journalist that I really look up to. It's uh, Stephen Brunt. I love Stephen Brunt out of Canada. One of my favorites, if not my favorite. I just love the way he conducts himself and the class, the ethics, all that. As far as, I mean, these are all sports guys, I guess. I guess I'm not very cultured. I have to say, I think political media sucks. Like, if you want me to say a political guy, I think they all suck. I'm not a fan of any of them. Right, left, middle, they all suck. They're all biased. N not a fan. I love Lebetard. Yeah, I mean, there's certain guys that you just want to go hear what they have to say when there's a big thing. Um, I, I like Ryan Rossillo a lot, but these are sports guys, so... I don't know if I'm giving you the answer that you're looking forward to, but, um, or looking for non-sport. I mean, I, I really used to like the Charlie Rose show, but then, you know, he got canceled and I don't know anything about that stuff. But as far as like the interviews, I thought his interviews were really good. <laughs> Gomi is the goat. Nothing against Stipe, but why is he considered the heavyweight goat when he only defended the belt only three times? Because no one defended it as much as him. Well, they say, okay, so he says, considering Fedor has done it a million times, they say he's the UFC heavyweight GOAT. I think he's in the conversation for greatest heavyweights, but I think most people would say Fedor is still, at least I think, the greatest heavyweight, period, but he never fought in the UFC. Ariel, has anyone who's been close with both you and Dana, like DC, helped to try and facilitate a squashing of the beef between you two? Um... Like a serious effort? I don't think so. I think most people think it's too toxic and would come back to bite them so they stay away from it. But on, honestly, I, 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 like, I, it, I don't lose any sleep over it. It does not affect me whatsoever. We stay in our lanes. Um, you know, he, he has, I think, minimized the amount of uh, pot shots. And the frustrating thing was when I was with ESPN, you know, he would hit me below the belt and I was not allowed to respond. Now that I'm gone, he doesn't even hit me. And maybe because 
I don't know, maybe he thinks I'm irrelevant now or not worth his time. Maybe it bothered, I know it bothered him that I was at ESPN and maybe that's why I was top of mind. Who the hell knows? It would drive him nuts. He tried to end that before I even got there. But, you know, if he keeps my name out of his mouth, it doesn't make it personal. I mean, he can say whatever he wants, but just don't make it personal. Don't talk about my family. Don't talk about my kids. Um, and I've never done that. I have never made it personal. But I'm talking about the business, and he considers that personal. That's been always the crux of the issue. Me talking about the business and fighter pay, and like he views that as per I view that as just like fodder, transactional. They are they have so won this race, and have so won like. If you are not open to any kind of criticism when you are that successful and that far ahead of everyone else, then like, what are we doing here? But to answer the question, I don't think anyone has actually given it the old real call try. Maybe, I know the executives at ESPN tried to broach it, but to what extent, I have no idea. <laughs> What's up, Ariel? The post by press conference for May Mac, you asked Leonard Ellerby why a certain section was blocked off in the stands. I'm sure you remember. Oh, are you going to keep that same energy with your best friend, Jake Paul or Eddie Hearn? You once said that his rise reminded you a lot of Conor McGregor's, yet Jake Paul can't even give away tickets to the greatest women boxing match of all time. First of all, when did I compare Jake Paul's... Like, this is the thing about people who come at you and talk shit. They make up shit. I have never compared. I have once said that his rise reminded you a lot of Conor McGregor's. What the hell are you talking about? Now, I could talk about... The, the buzz, this and that, but like if we're talking about his actual fighting career, you're making crap up. And yeah, guess what? If there are actual blocks, like sections, Mayweather McGregor had sections wide open. If there are actual blocks open, absolutely. I'll ask that question. Why was that such a bad thing to ask? There were actual, se like, section 119 empty. There wasn't a single person in it. The vibe in that arena wasn't great. People showed up for the co-main. I think it was Tank Davis fighting the co-main. It might have even been Badu Jack in the co-main. Tank Davis might have been before him. By the time the co-main was about to start, there was like a thousand people in that arena. Don't talk to me about the, the crowd. I can guarantee you... The crowd, the vibe, the buzz will be infinitely better than that. Now, will it draw the same? No. Will the viewers be the same? No. But I don't know why you're so mad, Alex Alley 209 Amy Otis, old news, but whatever happened with Mike Goldberg? It always bothered me that the promotion let him leave without any fanfare whatsoever. I think they wanted to go with John Anik, and then he left Bellator. Yeah, I mean, Bellator has gone with uh, Morrow, and they've gone with Sean Grandy, who I think does a great job. Uh, he is doing some um, BYB, like some bare knuckle stuff. But I, th I think they just felt like Anik was the better broadcaster. Good day, Ariel. From Brain Dead Kira. First time posting here, you recently described the chat as a cesspit. I think I said cesspool, but same thing. Which I found amusing as it's one of the few places I have fun and knowledgeable exchanges about MMA and other hot topics after a long day of work. To be clear, I never called this chat a cesspool. I called the YouTube chat a cesspool. Um, but I love you guys on YouTube. Thank you. Could you find it within yourself to send salutations to Melissa Del Gadillo? She is the kindest. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. It might, it might be Del... Gadillo or Gel G Del Gadillo. She's the kindest, most positive chat member ever to exist. Please be clear. I love this chat here. I love the community here. I am not talking about you. I, I recognize the vast majority of you guys. And Melissa is an absolute saint and a beautiful human being inside and out. So I am not talking about any of you here. I was talking about like the, the faceless, fake name people that just spew nonsense. Eric Reyes, Ron Swanson, AIM661, who unbeknownst to them have all helped reduce the impact of my Alexia and agraphia and given me some really good laugh. Laughs. Is it agraphia? Yeah. As the great Max Holloway has been known to state, it is what it is. And our chat is the pound for pound champ of the YouTubes. Oh, on YouTube you're talking about? All right. Well, maybe I'm wrong about that. Wishing you and the rest of the crew, the chat and your respective loved ones the very best. Wow. Okay. 
Big money. Ariel, would you rather be a fly... Oh, wow, look at this. <laughs> this is a great question. Would you rather be a fly on the wall at an upcoming matchmaker meeting with Dana, Hunter, etc., or Frank and GC's next UFC viewing partner party? What do you guys think? Which is more interesting? It's a question for you. Well, which do you think would be more interesting? Being a fly on the wall at your party or with the UFC brass? As a fly on the wall, can you eat buffalo chicken dip? Probably not. I mean, like, you can like sit on it, but maybe like Will nip there at be it. ranch for the pizza? I'm going to go with Dana and Hunter and just see what they're talking wow. about. Wow. I'm also Here curious about what food drink item you typically bring as a guest at someone's gathering. Personally, I don't think one could go wrong with a classic bottle of wine. Great question. Uh, we like to bring a wine, uh, sometimes even a plant. Um, there's a place next to my house that makes tremendous banana bread. Always a crowd pleaser. People love the banana bread. Sometimes I'll bring, you know, like a six pack, this and that, but I don't like to partake in that sort of thing. I'm big into bringing the banana bread. Weird guys or not so weird? It really works with every occasion. Who doesn't get excited when you give them a loaf of banana bread? I love banana bread. Chocolate chips in there sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Bengal the Yeti. Shalom, Ariel. Dana tried to pressure Jones and Stipe last week by saying they should fight in July. I don't know if it was pressure. I think it was get the word out there, get people excited. It's not happening. Here, here's the situation. Good, uh, hot tag, hot tag. It ain't happening July 2nd. They've been talking about doing an event at MSG July 30th. That fight was brought up for MSG July 30th. Stipe, as Jones actually quote-unquote leaked yesterday, isn't ready for July 30th. Who knows when he'll be ready? No sooner than than um, than September. And so the question is, well, do you not go to MSG July 30th? Do you save Jones for another time? Do you save him for Stipe? And what do you do with the rest of the heavyweight division? What I would do is all right, July, September, it's all freaking the same. Wait for Stipe. If he's going to come back September, if he gives you his word, he's coming back. Book that fight. Do Tom Aspinall versus Curtis Blades, July 23rd in the UK. Go to France, August, September. Do uh, Sorel Gan versus Tai Tuivasa. That's how I would book the heavyweight division. And I feel like it's pretty easy. By the time all that plays out, you see what's going on with Francis. If Francis doesn't come out, I mean, you're going to have a top contender and, and two if not three out of that six fighter tr like trio of fights, blah, blah, blah. And you'll have an interim title fight. Or if you have to strip Francis, you'll have a vacant title fight. <laughs> Pretty easy. Do you think Dana thinks about how easy it is to pressure the fighters with these announcements before he gives them, or does he just shoot from the hip? I think it's a little bit of both. I think it's very calculated. I think it's A, to get people excited. I think it's B, to put some pressure. I think it's C, to get ESPN and the pay-per-view people excited. Hey, we're working on this. We've got this going. But it, 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 like I spoke to Richard Schaefer via text. He said they're working on it. Didn't divulge too much. Um, so it is sincere in that regard. But if you're banking on going to International Fight Week and seeing John Jones for Stipe Miocic, it ain't happening. Hello, Ariel. All I want to say is thanks for the great content you give us and thank you for making my Monday and Wednesday better. You help me a lot by listening to your stories. I hope one day I can have just five of your success doing this type of show. You are a person I look up to a lot. Greetings from Montenegro. Thank you. There is an event on the 29th of May in Poland. Vaso Psycho versus the Polish Zombie Pride Rules. No time limit, no way in. Hope you check it out. All right, I will. Hey, Ariel, with the recent astronomical purchase of Twitter by Elon Musk, I would love to get your thoughts on this entire saga. Oh, wow. We spoke about this. I'm still not sure. Is this a good thing or a bad thing for Twitter, New York Rick? Again, it remains to be seen. It will be, I will imagine that um, policing restrictions, um, content monitoring will be reduced. So if people are interested in that, um, it will be a good thing for them. If people are interested in um, things being curated and things being removed from the platform that are either offensive or not offensive, depending on uh, who's looking at them, then it will be bad because I think oversight is going to be reduced. So TBD and also like he hasn't even officially bought it yet. Like there's still, there's still a long ways to go here. Um, but it depends on where you side, wh where you fall on the, on the side of the fence in terms of freedom of platform and responsibility of platform. JD asks, what changes would you like to see? Just an edit button. That's pretty much it. I mean, I could say like less hate, less vitriol, 
less toxicity, but I don't know if that's even possible. I mean, I guess you can try to filter out the fake accounts, the bots, all that stuff. What is your favorite part about having GC and New York Rick on set now? Oh, wow. What a nice question from Matt in Montreal. Uh, I mean, I listen, I want, I get more excited uh, about, you know, I, about the chatter, the discussion, the, uh, the debates, the, all that stuff as I do the interviews. I mean, I love it. It's great. When you got great chemistry and great teammates and friends working with you, it makes it that much more fun. I never want this show to just be me talking the whole time. I mean, that's in large part why there's X amount of guests on the show, but even in these moments, in these segments, when we recap the weekend, um, all that stuff, it's, it's wonderful. And for the longest time, it was just New York Rick here. And then he left me. And, uh, you know, I had to just kind of do it by myself. But now we are stronger and healthier than ever. Uh, howdy, Ariel. Any news on Brian Ortega or Yair Rodriguez? Still heard that that's the plan, but no real news. Greetings, Ariel. In recent interviews, Dana White has been touting the upcoming UFC summer lineup. What's your most anticipated fight of the summer and why? Wow. Well, if they could get Jones and Stipe done for July 30th, that would be it. But I don't know if that's going to happen. Can we get Nate Diaz versus Dustin Poirier or no? No. No. Uh, how about Leon versus Kamar Usman? That's probably one that I'm really excited about. Whoop, 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 whoop. Um, Hamza versus Colby would be great, but I don't think it happens this summer. Hey, Ariel, with uh, John Jones not likely fighting on the 30th and it potentially being an MSG, do you think a Nate versus Dustin fight could be a possible headliner? Would be cool because they were supposed to fight there way back when but I don't know if they go to MSG if it's not John Jones. Patrick, favorite segment of the week. Two quick questions. Any update on Frankie Edgar's next fight? No. Someone ask Ali on Twitter. You might get him responding. You might get another account. You know, ask Frankie. You don't know who's going to, you know. Who knows? You could get dunked on. GC, what other fire throwbacks are you hiding from us? Also, you got to show us uh, the sneakers when wearing such throwbacks. What's your best throwback, GC? That Matumbo one's pretty good. I have a KD Supersonics jersey that I'm pretty fond wow. of. Uh, wow. Wow, that's a great one. The Denver like uh, rainbow one uh, is great. I got a Ken Griffey Mariners if we're getting into other sports. Thrashers, Ilya Kovalchuk. Wow. We go deep. I got a, I got a pretty big uh, jersey collection. The, uh, you know, the Darties back in college. The Darties? Uh, it really opened the can of worms here. Yeah, Darties. What Day is that? Day parties. What? Day parties. I don't know what you're talking about. It's. A, I mean, it's literally a party during the day. And you wear jerseys to these parties? Yeah, typically, yeah. Wow. Seems like a great time. Um... What the hell? Wait a second. Hey, does New York Rick, did you really say this, New York Rick? Does New York Rick really believe that Noah Eagle is the voice of our generation? Was this guy paying it? Was he like, did he, did someone? Not paying attention. I mean, I'm not surprised. These, these people who ask the, com the questions on, on this don't seem to be the. Wait, we were just right talking about Noah Eagle on Slack. Did this guy hack our Slack yeah. chat? Did you say this somewhere else? No, I did not. I've never talked about Noah <laughs> Eagle in my entire Wait, life. Crazy. Again. <laughs> Who is C Money? Is that you? Is that you, GC? I don't pay for that subscription. You you forced me to pay. I don't pay for that. Who? <laughs> is it Frank? No, oh, come on. We know it's serious. Stop it. Uh, Rick, dude, I would not do that to you. Tim. Yeah. Hey, Ariel, if you could set but, up any. Wait, wait, wait. No, before we move on, Iron <laughs> Eagle is. Uh, no. Uh, the question is Noah Eagle. No, I know. You were really taken less, that, like, Eagle. you were taken aback by that Iron Nickelodeon Eagle. NFL broadcast performance. My God. You liked it that much? I feel like Connor doesn't realize that, like, nobody knows who Noah Eagle is. He's, like, <laughs> trying to push this joke forward and doesn't Dude, realize it's not me, bro. It's not me. <laughs> oh, my God. This is great. Uh, but shout out to Iron Eagle. To go. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you could set up any cross-promotional fight between Bellator and the UFC, who would you want to see fight? Oh, God. I mean, as of two weeks ago, I would have said AJ versus Volkanovsky. Musasi versus Izzy? 
I feel like that's got to be the one, right? Musasi versus Izzy. Yeah, that's my pick. Musasi versus Izzy. <clears throat> Salut Ariel. Real quick question. Oh, real quick message to the CEO. Fighters always talk about wanting to bring their opponents into the deep waters. My question to you is, what waters? Name the waters, Papa. Name them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Amazing. Brandon, hello, Great Heel Wani. I'm curious, does anyone from the MMAR crew use Discord? And if so, are there any great MMA Discord communities you'd be able to suggest? Thanks from Illinois. I do not use Discord. Uh, I actually think TST is a big Discord guy. Uh, GC, do you use Discord? Uh, I've used it. Not, I'm not frequent on it, though. Frank, you big Discord guy? Yeah, I use it. For what? All sorts of different communities, yeah. I was expecting you to say, that's a little too personal. Well, I mean, it's not. it didn't come with your gaming chair, though? You didn't get like a subscription to wow. Discord Nitro? <laughs> Any MMA groups that you're a part of? You know what? I'm not, no. No. Uh, New York Rick? Use Discord, no MMA groups. Um, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, I saw that you reported UFC's coming to MSG or looking to come. Yes, looking. Not a done deal. Don't get crazy on me. But they have talked about it. Safe to say the main event will be Izzy versus Cannoneer July 2nd. Uh, I mean, there's a very good chance. Yes, that's the one. Do you think there's any credence to the John Jones is serving a two-year suspension conspiracy theory? No. What is that? Like the Michael Jordan was suspended one in 1993? I never even heard that. Reginald, uh, I don't think there's any credence to that. Who are Mrs. Hawani and your offspring's favorite fighters? Golly. Mrs. Hawani, I don't know if she has favorite. I mean, she she always liked DC. Uh, she likes Rose. She likes the women fight. She liked Gina Carano before Gina, you know, turned on me and blocked me on Twitter. That's the story. Um, my kids don't really have favorite fighters. I mean, they, I think the only fighter they know of is Connor. My son, my my middle son, Walter, likes Roman Reigns, and my older son likes Goldberg, but I don't think that counts. My mom, hardcore Carlos Condit and Uriah Faber fan. She's the real hardcore fan. Alajuan, afternoon. I was going to ask this last week, but there was no show. As a newer MMA fan, I just learned about the April 17, 2010 Strikeforce Nashville brawl. Wow. Just wondering what was the significance of that event at the time. I think I read something that MMA didn't return to national television for over a year after that. Wow. Uh, that was insane. That was uh, three shows in a row. We went from Abu Dhabi for UFC 112 to Nashville for the Strikeforce event on CBS with three title fights on it, one of which was a big one between Dan Henderson and Jake Shields. Uh, King Mo versus Musasi was also on it. And then we went to uh, Sacramento for the WC pay-per-view, the lone one, which was also a big deal. What was so big about this was it's on CBS, relatively new to CBS. The first national television show or broadcast television show was um, 2008. In Newark, Kimbo Slice versus James Thompson. So we're relatively new into this era of MMA on mainstream TV. And Jake Shields, Dan Henderson have their fight. And then Jake Shields is doing his post-fight interview. And Mayhem Miller shows up and asks him if he wears a mask or not. No, I'm just joking. Uh, he shows up and gets involved. And then the Diaz brothers, and there's a brawl and all this stuff. You know, you know what I remember most about that? So I'm there. And the brawl happens, and we go to the press conference, and um, I go to the press conference, and when I walk into the press conference room, Scott Coker is sitting at the dais. Like, how often does it happen where the guy, the promoter, is already in the room before the media gets there? Let me tell you, not that often. And I remember telling Scott, did you see what just happened? And he didn't know. He wasn't there. Scott was in the back. And then he left and went to, when the brawl happened, Scott wasn't there. He was in the back sitting at the dais. And I was one of the first people to get into the room. And I told him, did you see what just happened? He said, no, he left, came back, talked about it. Casey and I ended up interviewing Nick in the hallway. It was a crazy scene. And, you know, a lot of us thought that it might, you know, hurt MMA. On, and, and it may have. I hurt the sport. It didn't really affect the sport all that much. 
Because as the great Gus Johnson once said, these things happen in MMA. Do you think the next fight for both will be Cater versus Allen? No. I think they're going Cater versus Josh Emmett. Elizabeth, young Ariel. As you were perhaps a little hurried and were unable to read my previous submission, I will endeavor to keep it to the point this time. A. That Covington character will most certainly not be fighting with Mr. Shemaev. He will avoid it at all costs. <laughs> oh, God. Here come the allergies. The rise of Mr. Shemaev has diluted the return of Connor. That Irish boy with fair hair who increasingly resembles one of my corgis. Lots of bark, no bite. Wow, Elizabeth, coming out strong. I will leave you with the palace rankings for the top 10 lightweights in the world, which are based on fighting ability rather than popularity and notoriety and are voted on monthly by the royal household. Wow, okay, here we go. Issa Makhchev, Arman Sarukian, Charles Oliveira, Benil Dariush, Dustin Poirier, Justin Gaethje, Rafael Fiziev, Michael Chandler, Yoel Alvarez, Rafael Dos Anjos. Wow, bold, but I kind of like it. I wish you a safe passage to you as well. Good day, Ariel. My question to you is, would you rather have Drake's career or Tyson Fury's career? Wow. Taking into account your ability to make money long-term, overall fame and achievements, arguably the thrill of a sporting triumph is greater than the thrill of performing at a concert, but does it balance out against... I'd 1,000% take Drake's career. I don't get a punch in the face. Excuse me. 1,000%. Take Drake's career. Tyson's career is great. But I ain't getting punched in the face. Would you be interested in a Logan Paul versus Patrick McAfee WWE match? Sure. You could take one male fighter and one female fighter to make the ultimate fighting baby. Which two fighters would you choose? Golly, I don't know if I could go with that one. I hope you had an enjoyable and restful week off celebrating Passover. What are your thoughts on the Messianic Judaism and have you ever heard that Jesus fulfilled the spring feast? He died on Passover, was buried on the feast of unleavened bread, and rose again on the feast of first fruits. His death is also symbolized by matzah bread because he was pierced. Golly. I don't know about this one, JD. The UFC has done such a good job of building up Cheeto since the O'Malley fight. No matter the outcome of his fight on Saturday, do you think that he would still offer to fight Sugar later this year? Eh. I think they'll fight again, but I don't think it's happening this year. Good afternoon, Ariel. Normally don't like these types of questions, but when will you get Tan Lee on your show? The uh, manager's been asking. You know, the thing is, I I'd love to get all these people on the show, but you get these people on the show, and it's like, who's that? Who's that? Like, because sometimes I wonder if the fans of MMA are actual MMA fans or if they're just fans of five people in the sport. Who's that guy? Who's that? I've never heard of that guy before. Shout out from Delco. Delco is 20 minutes outside of Philly where my boy Andre Petrosky is from. What's the deal with Paulo Costa? I don't know, man. Him and Rockhold, I asked Rockhold about this recently. He said July 2nd. Let's see. Nick Diaz in his prime versus Brendan Schaub in a 12-round boxing match. Wow. Nick. Hey, Ariel, how long will it take for Suhudo to be a double champ again? Double champ? I don't know about that. Hey, Ariel, everyone has their Mount Rushmore of MMA fighters, but who are your Mount Rushmore of MMA fighters that you have interviewed? Golly. Good call from Sweaty Spaghetti. It's it's the same list. I've interviewed all of them. Um, I think he means like the best interviews. I don't like to pick the best. I mean, Connor was always great. DC was always great. <laughs> Nick and Nate are a different kind of great. I mean, it's just, it's the usual suspects. You know them. Okay. What's yours, G City, and Frank Mysterio's favorite fast food joint? Jack in the Box, Carl's Jr., In and Out, or Forever Go to Take It Easy? Frank? Out of that list, I guess. No, I think anything. Whataburger? 
Wow. Never even had that. Whataburger's great. Love Jack in the Box. Chick-fil-A for me, though. Chick-fil-A, huh? Oh, yeah. I had Chick-fil-A for the first time ever in the Dallas airport when I was coming back from Mania. Really? Yeah. Are you serious? First time you ever. Should've, you should have called me. I probably had it a thousand times. It was on my meal plan in college. Jeez, Louis. First time ever I had the breakfast like uh, basket thing. I have to say it was pretty damn amazing because there was like the chicken and the eggs in there, which I don't so know you, how I so feel So you about have that. breakfast. You haven't even had one of the chicken sandwiches. Never. Oh my God. All right. The day that I go and get matzo ball soup <laughs> with you, we'll knock Same out a time. chicken sandwich afterward. It's that good? I mean, dude, like it, the Popeye's mania, how how crazy everyone was going. The whole time I was just like, Chick-fil-A sandwich is better. Cool. Wow. Okay. Uh, fast food. I don't really have a lot of fast food favorites. I mean, I used does Domino's Pizza count as a kid? I love Domino's Pizza. Is that fast food? Not really. It's fast right? enough. All right. Under 30. Uh, what's the crack, Ariel? Uh, love the show. Great to have you back. It's been a long week without my fox of great content. I really admire how you handled the Bryce Mitchell interview from a wee while ago. Do you think you were able to deal with this so calmly due to years of having to put up with New York Rick's endlessly terrible takes? Wow. I mean, full force. What's this guy's name? Remind me of this guy's name. <laughs> Gigi Lopez. And Gigi Lopez, wipe the Cheetos dust off your hands <laughs> and close the app. Turn it off. Nobody wants you here. Get out of here. Wow. Why do you think his name is Gigi Lopez? Who knows? Who cares? He's a goober. <laughs> Get out. Also, are you ready to experience a solid 30 minutes of fury from the headliner coming out the 23rd of April, or is it the 28th? Can I get a shout out to my bud, MJ Crabtree, who recently asked me to be his best man. He is truly the biggest match I know. Keep up the great work. And then he says something that I can't pronounce. Hey, Ariel, not sure if you're into comedy, but there's an amazing special dropping this week. It's by John Africa's favorite comedian, so you know it's going to be good. It's not on Blockbuster or even Netflix, but it's on YouTube. Wow. Uh, I'd suggest getting some P.F. Changs and spending the night in and watching it. I, I would love to check that out. Are you, do you guys know about that? Anxiously anticipating. Been looking forward to it. Hey, I'm Ariel. That was great. I was the guy that met his girlfriend. I think it, is it, was it a comedy or horror it was a horror, I believe. I was the guy that met his girlfriend for the first time at Universal two weeks ago. Just wanted to say it went great. She and her family like me. Also, I will kick GC in the chest if he doesn't follow me on verdict. I'm a purple belt. Come at me, GC. Okay, my question is, has there been any update on Rafael Faziev? I would like to see him against Gamrod. Sorry for such a long message. Take care. Uh, nothing yet. I saw him chirping at uh, RDA. Let's see. Oh, I like this question. We're approaching the end here. Don't worry. Shalom, Ariel. Mani Shema. I read in an article about you that you put tefillin on every morning. Why do you do this? Keep up all the great work. So for those that don't know, uh, tefillin is something that you put on as a Jewish person. You wrap it around your arm seven times. You put a little thing here. You pray in the morning. Um, you do this once you become bar mitzvah. And yes, it is true. I don't talk about this stuff much, but I do it every morning. And I've done it every morning since uh, I became a man, quote unquote, when you're 13, you have your bar mitzvah, that's when you're supposed to do it. And the reason I did it early on, quite honestly, is because my father told me he wanted me to do it. And so I did it because he asked me to. And I usually listen to him. And over time, the reason why I did it, I'll never forget, my dad is a man of very few words. And he is very spiritual. And Judaism means a lot to him. And we were at our synagogue and he had donated some money for something called a Beit HaMidrash, which is basically a place where you go and learn. And uh, they were kind of honoring him there. And, and we all went to this breakfast and very rare to see him speak publicly. And he said something in his speech that really stuck with me that I never forgot and is sort of the reason why I keep doing it. Um, basically, he said that he put his tefillin on, this thing that you wrap around yourself. You may have seen people do this, even at airports sometimes in the morning, if you're traveling. Uh, he put it on every morning as an adult, and you put it on really tight. And when you put it on really tight around your arm, there are marks that show up on your arm. 
Uh, and they're there for like an hour and then they kind of go away. And he always would look down at those marks as he would begin his day and go off and do his work and be an adult as his armor as he would go off into the world after praying. And that always stuck with me. I thought it was really profound. And I remember him saying it, he got emotional when he was talking about it. And so when I started traveling and I was older and going to these events and I'm in Australia, I'm in Abu Dhabi, I'm in Ireland, I'm in England, I'm here, there, Brazil. Uh, I always found it very motivational, inspirational to have this armor as I'm in these places about to go cover these cage fighting events and whatnot. And it kind of reminded me of where I came from. It reminded me of my parents. It reminded me of who I am, of my background. And I felt like that was my armor for the day. Uh, no matter what, if it's a tense situation, if it's an uncomfortable situation, if it's an anxious situation, and it just felt like a really great way to start the day. So uh, that's the reason why I do it. You mentioned in your Two Cent Tuesday that 135 is the best weight in combat sports, which I agree with, but you said it was kind of wild. What exactly do you mean by wild? Well, what I mean by wild is like, literally in MMA and boxing, male, female, 135 is the best weight class. It's the best, most active and deep weight class in Bellator. It's arguably the best in the UFC. I know you could talk about 55 and whatnot, but it's a very strong case that you can make. It's by far the best weight class in men's boxing right now with guys like Haney and Cambosis and and uh, Ryan Garcia, um, Tank Davis, Teofimo Lopez, Lomachenko. And in women's boxing, it's the best. Katie Taylor, Amanda Serrano. I just think that's kind of wild. As you're well aware, you are a leading man of MMA lexicon. Your I Would Be Remiss can be heard on other MMA podcasts from Bisping to Zhang Wei Li. Really? Let's not forget the People's Main Event. Of course, that one was stolen from me. One major exception is the Come On. That one is lifted straight from Daniel Ryan Cormier, specifically on the DC and Helwani show, in particular when discussing his love for the Beverly Hillbillies. No, this is not DC writing you, but let him have the come on. Alternatively, give him his flowers. Respect and God bless. I've never, I've never said otherwise. That is my ode to him. It's a thousand percent from him. We even talked about the come on on the show. Any update on you appearing on Bilal's podcast? I think old Bilal meant to send that to... Uh, to Volkanovsky, but he tagged me. So, you know, I, I took I took the chance. I don't know. I don't understand all of that. It's crazy to me, but whatever. Uh, respect, Ariel. Listening to the Dan Hardy interview has me believing Tyson Fury could possibly cut through the top 10 of the UFC heavyweight rankings. Is that crazy? I mean, not right away, but over time, sure. Which current MMA promotion is either locking in that number two spot for the biggest MMA promotion of the world. I would still give it to Bellator right now. Who, what do you think could happen at UFC 274 to be the equivalent of John Moran's game-changing dunk? By the way, that dunk, I hate when people say posterized. You've been posterized, posterized, because no one buys posters. That's an actual poster. Like, that dunk is so amazing, and the photo of the dunk from the backboard was so amazing. Like, that could actually be a poster. I mean, a Gaethje knockout, a Rose knockout. Dear Ariel, Yoma Shoa. Yes. On Friday, April 23rd, Mikey Musumichi made his one championship debut against the legend Mazak Mazakazu Minari, finishing the leglock pioneer with intricately controlled rear naked choke, a thing of all beauty. I wonder who do you think currently has the best jiu-jitsu in MMA? Buchecha, Dern, Tonin, Burns, mm. Tough. Buchecha, maybe? Really missed all of you boys. And Yoon, thank you. Uh,
shocking take by Rick yesterday from someone in the UK. I could tell you Tommy Fury versus Jake Paul in the UK with Eddie Hearn promoting 100% sales big. Just imagining the buildup with Tyson Logan and crazy John Fury going at it in contrast and Anderson Silva versus Paul press conference would send me to sleep. I don't know if Eddie Hearn would be a part of that. Okay, just two more here. There's a lot. Golly, there's a lot. Um, AJ McKee's loss seemed a little suspicious to me. Do you think him openly talk about pay and wanted the UFC belt impacted the fight's decision? Hell no. <laughs> I thought about writing this for a few months, but felt bad. However, when Francis Ngannou told you to stick to journalism when you started humming singing to him, I thought it was the right time. I love your work, but singing isn't your strongest attribute. Wouldn't be at all upset if you gave it up for more Helwani sound bites. Got aside with the champs. All right. Thank you for all your hard work. Even if PFL signed Cyborg, how does that burnish Kayla standing? In my opinion, it's a lose-lose. She's supposed to beat a 36-year-old past her prime Cyborg. By the way, Cyborg past her prime, what are you talking about? Cyber's not past her prime. She's fine. It'll be the biggest win. What time frame do you think we'll see Volkanovski back? Third quarter. When does Connor come back? Late third or fourth, if not next year, but not before. If Tom Aspinall fights for an interim title, are you there? Ooh, Tommy Aspinall, Aspinall, Tommy Aspinall. Oh, da, 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 da. I'm not hearing uh, interim title. Blades, but not interim title. All right, we're done. I got to go. It's been a fun day. Oh, there's nice... By the way, uh, New York Rick, there's nice comments coming your way on Twitter from Lewis. I really adore New York Rick and everything he stands for and contributes to the show. See? We end on a positive note. He's gone anyway. Everyone's gone. I don't even think anyone's back there. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who watched. Thank you very much to all the questions and everyone who... Can I love the community. Please. Let's not confuse what I was saying. I was talking about the cesspool chat. But if the chat is better now, then God bless them as well. Uh, Frank, you can hit our music. Yes. Oh, it's a great time to be alive, my friends. Two in-studio guests. Massive event at Madison Square Garden. The last time I went to an event at Madison Square Garden, a fight event. Oh, my. Uh, I didn't go to the last one, so when was it? Was it was it Diaz versus Masvidal? I guess so. You know, for a second there, for just a brief second, I forgot that we were doing a show. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I'm not sure. But I actually forgot that we were on the air for just a brief second. You feeling all right? <laughs> oh, you got to be loving it. Thank you very much. You Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who tuned in. Thank you very much to everyone who tuned in. Thank you very much to all our guests. It was a fun day. And I appreciated the conversations very much. Charles Jordan was great. What a lovely man that Charles Jordan is. Really enjoyed that conversation. One of the rising stars in that weight class. And one of our best products out of Quebec. Thank you very much to him. Congratulations to Arjun Buller on his new deal. Thank you very much to him for stopping by and for breaking the news here. That Cejudo thing, spicy dicey, spicy little dicey. Eddie Hearn stopping by. Thank you very much to him and his team for bringing him by. That was great stuff. Appreciate Joe Markowski stopping by as well. That was really interesting stuff as well. And congrats to Yancy Medeiros, not only on the win, but also on the new contract as well. I'm off to MSG. If you're there, say hello. Back on Monday, same time and place. Until then, I say peace. I'm out of here.